Hello again, friends, and Happy New Year. And I know this sounds crazy. I think I hear a gardener in the background, but welcome to another edition of Jim Cornette's Drive Through, the first of 2024. Maybe the most daunting episode we've ever had to do. There is too much to talk about, and we will struggle our way through talking about all of it with this man, the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Vacation himself, Jim Cornette. Too much, bruh, too much time on my hands is a phrase that I have not uttered lately. For, for the past several years, as a matter of fact, I have not been sitting on a bar stool talking like a d fool. I do not have too much time on my hands ticking away at my sanity. What's ticking away at my sanity is these lunatics will not stop doing shit stupid that we have to talk about. And we could have come back Two days after the breaking news update, the day, what was that, the day after Christmas? Two days after, what? I, we recorded it the day after Christmas, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the point is, we could have come back, but we said, no, no, let's let the people listen to somebody else talk for another couple of days. It can't get any worse than that. And then it got worse <laughs> over the past, the pay-per-view and the... The injuries and the fiascos and the shenanigans and the accusations that have been running rampant and roughshod all across the world of, well, I can't say the world of professional wrestling. It's centered on one particular ground zero location. But uh, so we're going to, what we're going to do, because this is your show, Brian, and, and Far be it from me to lead you in any way on your program, but I just wanted, for the people who thought that we were going to be able to sit back and talk about our restful holidays and, and how many frolics and belly rubs Harley had and how many times you sent your children out to shovel snow, but instead we're, not, we're going to save that for the experience this coming weekend and we're going to talk about all the shit that's gone on since we last spoke to all of our many listeners out there, the cult of Cornette. There are so many things I want to talk to you about. So many things, the listener, so many things, so many things, the listeners, I can't even get going yet. So many things the listeners want to hear you comment on, but there's too much. I mean, I'm looking at my list here and as I'm doing that, I'm thinking of other things that I forgot to add to this. Yeah, it's too much. Thanks, okay, Tony. Well, all right, well, thank you very much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you on the experience so long for now. Well, hold on. Talk about the sponsors first. Promo code JCE. Yes, for everything. If it's a company that is doing business in the United States of America, at least the contiguous 48 states, we don't know about those rogues and scallywags in Alaska and Hawaii, just walk into a business and say the code is JCE, they'll give you 20% off. So... Where we last left everyone with the Christmas special, the Chris Jericho Christmas meltdown edition of the show, was Chris Jericho decided for whatever reason to, at four o'clock in the morning on Christmas, try to go after Stephen P. New. It didn't turn and out And don't well forget for Lucy. Don't forget Lucy. He slandered the good name. Of Lucy Guy, he he grouped her with a di with disgusting behavior, and ill intent. By like William Foley. Yes. Well, I guess that's where we'll begin, where we left off, Chris Jericho, because his Christmas meltdown was not the end of what was a, it's still ongoing, I guess, a disastrous week for Chris Jericho. We've all heard. And something for once we had nothing to do with. We, were, we, we weren't even there. We were at home, not, rec not broadcasting. I had some fun with it on Twitter, and to anyone who was offended about me having fun with it on Twitter, go fuck yourself. I don't give a shit what you think. It's funny, because Chris Jericho is a boob and a phony, and this is this idea that he's in the middle of drama that he caused by himself is not surprising. We've heard so many stories over the years about Chris Jericho's behavior. We've talked about some of them on the show. Usually it's about we assume drunken, we've been told and we've read loud, screaming matches, behavior, fights, music playing in hotels, getting kicked out of hotels. We've seen it. You, you know, you know that, that, that's, can I just make a comment here? Since it is a new year, even though it's your show, 
What about me? Everybody thinks I'm a raving lunatic. I'm a violent, psychopathic individual just having turmoil everywhere I go. And what if I if I have a yelling contest with somebody, I turn it into a halfway entertaining story on the podcast and tell it myself. Jericho ends up on TMZ. He's asked to leave by hotel staff, escorted out by gendarmes, um, <laughs> told by, you know, told by rental car agents. Well, I guess you're fucked. I mean, he's uh, hey, Derek. There's always some kind of goddamn, what the fuck? And that's just what's public. And even some of the stories we've talked about on the show, because we've heard more. We've heard dozens more. Not about women, I just want to clarify. Just about behavior. It just, just, it just about he appears to think that he is a member of Led Zeppelin in the early 70s. And he's also a, the toughest guy ever, because I heard a story. Man, there's a story I would love to tell, but someone would have to give me permission about him getting knocked out on his own cruise ship. By someone he mouthed <laughs> off to. It's the most incredible fucking story. But I can't talk about that today. But my point is, a lot, of the, the hotline. a lot of the stories we talked about, even the one I think it was Ireland or Scotland, I forget where, where he got kicked out of the hotel, got into a fight, he was walking the streets, whatever it was. We heard that when it happened. And we didn't talk about it because it was so outlandish. Then we started hearing about it from other people, from other perspectives. The same incident. So there's been all these things. Remember one of the friends of the cops that actually fucking showed the body camera. That's footage. right. And then I said, can you do that? And then we had a plethora of listeners write in to explain how easy it was for a cop to show somebody body camera footage if they want to. But again, these were all things about drunken behavior, losing the AEW championship as soon as he won it, going out to <laughs> drink and losing the, the belt right away. I mean, just all these things, everyone knows what's up. It took a turn when Jericho started arguing with Stephen P. New about the idea of an NDA, and he stated that he's never signed an NDA, he doesn't adhere to the handbook. Because he was there in the room, he placed himself in the room at Brawl Out, and nobody asked him to sign an NDA, and he wouldn't do such a thing because he's a renegade. You know, he's, he's a renegade. And he'll never be any good. Um, and, and that's what started this. Stephen P. New said, well... <laughs> You have an employee handbook that kind of covers the the behavior or whatever the case. And he, oh, no, I don't. Well, and then we sent the picture of the handbook. And he apparently, he just, he has to insert himself in a situation that he wasn't in to call attention to himself for a situation that he may or may not allegedly be actually in. Yeah, well, again, <laughs> to go back to this, we've never talked about stories about Chris doing anything to women. We haven't really heard that much about that. We've heard about him. There's always rumors about people doing things to women, but nothing against their will, let's just say. The story Well, you know, when you're a rock star and a wrestler, you can be a Lothario without being a a uh what do they what do they call them over across the pond? A sex pest. Well, you gotta be careful with that. That's the Joey Ryan defense. I was just living a rock star lifestyle and just Well, wait, but actually, you know, if you even if you think that Jericho's singing is akin to a cat being disemboweled on Broadway, he's still more of a rock star than Joey Ryan was. That's right. Uh, although he's horrible as a musician and he as can't even... sing. But beyond that, he was it's a... Like, I'm, I'm more of an astronaut than my Aunt Lola, because <laughs> I've been farther off the ground. Go ahead. Well... I'm just being silly today, because these people are driving me insane. Nick Houseman responded to Chris Jericho's tweet. Nick Houseman, to the best of my knowledge, wasn't involved in all this, saying, what about NDAs you make other people sign? We talked about that on the last show. There's a mysterious comment. What does that mean? Who is Chris Jericho asked to sign an NDA, and why? This led to some people, and I'm going to pull up the tweets, going back to something from 2019, from the beginning of AEW, one of the first AEW stars signed was someone you may remember, Kylie Ray, I believe was her name. Yes. Not to be confused with, there was also a Kaylee Ray, I think, at one point. Well, I think she was on the very first pay-per-view. Uh, it was the real early, it was before Dynamite. It was the early, early days of AEW. They weren't yet on TV. And despite... Seemingly being presented as one of the top women there, she quickly 
left the company and left wrestling, it seemed like, for a time to reappear and at times leave other companies, which always made people wonder what's going on, I believe. And if I'm wrong, I apologize, but I believe she has spoken in the past or at least on social media written about struggles with mental health, which is certainly uh, something you feel bad when you hear about. You hope someone deals with it. And, and also something that you don't need in the wrestling business. So if she did leave wrestling, and I get, I don't know if she's wrestling now, but she, as you mentioned, she left a couple of companies probably to deal with that because you can't do both at once. Let's face it. So this Jericho stuff caused people to go to this Kylie Ray stuff. Apparently back in 2019, when things happened, at least amongst wrestling insiders, there were rumors that something may have happened. Now, she has not said anything. The only thing I've seen from her was she gave a star, a, not a, I guess not a star, a heart. Not a, she's not Meltzer. Well, not, not a star, a heart or whatever the Twitter like is. Like a, like a happy heart uh, em, emoji thing. She's done that to a couple of the things about this. But let me go to the actual Twitter order of events. Nick Houseman went on his show, which he has, and he said that there are a lot of stories about Chris Jericho that will find their way out over time, and that people, when they're ready to tell those stories, they will. And then he compares Jericho to Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Harvey Weinstein, for those now, of you... Now, was this, was this in physical appearance or behavior? Because, I mean, Chris has put on a few pounds, but come on. Again, I think there needs to be some clarity, or is it about just the idea of someone powerful who's brought down? Harvey Weinstein specifically raped a bunch of women, sometimes in their own home, but probably famously, notoriously, in his hotel room. He would get them to come back to his hotel room by whatever means necessary, and then assault them. We're not saying that. I just want to say this right now. Nick Houseman said it. We're talking about it. That sounds like, it, it does sound, even if... <laughs> I don't think anybody can accuse us of being Jericho's press agents, but that does sound no, a little extreme. But that's, I just want to make sure whatever comes out, comes out. <laughs> I'm not the one saying Jericho's Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> I don't know it for a fact, but a lot of people saying it. What do you know? Just go on. Tell what is, what did, what did Nick Houseman have to say now that you've credited or blamed him, whichever one it was? Well, I'm not sure what his update on what he said is, but then after that, Jim, a tweet went out. Uh, I don't know who this account is. It's blurred now here in this image I have. So here's the deal. You don't quit the hottest Fed going today, AEW, without reason. I have it from people in the know that Kylie was asked to go to Chris Jericho's room with the understanding that others would be there. When she got there, it was just him. He made a pass at her. No other details are given. That says that in parentheses, by the way and she freaked out. So, again, don't know where that's coming from, but that was tweeted out, and it went everywhere. Chris Jericho was trending, I think it was like over 40,000 tweets about this. So, I mean, it was everywhere. Well, he finally got the attention he's been looking for. Then, apparently, uh, hold on, I gotta, these are all the tweets in order, including all my Ooh. tweets making fun of Jericho, so I gotta go past this. Uh... Well, I guess that's it. Now I'm just seeing other people are tweeting. Kylie Ray hearted one of the articles about this, and Nick Houseman hearted that. <laughs> so now this story starts going I've around. really never heard those fucking English words put together in that order before. This whole thing is just ridiculous, the way it came out, the way it's happening. Again, every party involved could end this real quick by saying it did or didn't happen, or there is something or there isn't something. Instead, Well, but, but no... Not every party, because if poor old Kylie Ray, as the story goes, and we'll talk about this, has signed an NDA or signed an NDA in order to secure her release from AEW, because that's part of the, st the story, the rumor, whatever you want to call it, then she can't say anything. That's why she can only reply with little smiley hearts or whatever the fuck, and maybe, I don't know, chocolate-covered donuts and whatever else they send out these days. But that's, that's the issue now, is that has Jericho trying to be the renegade, trying to be, you know, the, the macho guy, I don't sign NDAs, 
has that suddenly pissed off enough people who knows that he has signed an NDA at least that they've decided to bring this to the public forum and now we're all debating about this and Jericho's about as popular as crotch rot in certain circles. Now, the tweet I read you before, I believe it doesn't have the time and date. I think that may have been from 2019 originally. Another tweet went out December 30th this year, 5.55 p.m., from an account, John A. Ferris. No one knows who this guy is, so we don't know what... Not related to Wayne. Not related to Wayne that we know of, but again, something that... It's an account, appears to be talking about this, and it's spread like wildfire on Twitter. She was invited into Chris Jericho's locker room, thinking that there were other people there. Then he tried to make his advances, and she went straight to Tony. And he was afraid that he would lose the TV deal because Chris Jericho was his only star at the time. <laughs> NDA to be released. So that right there is, again, we don't know who this is. And as Tony would say, we'll play some audio later during the press scrum. It's hard to comment on rumors that just pop up from sources you don't even know where this is coming from, unless it's true. Well, yeah, that's the point. I mean... <sighs> It's easy to comment on something that's bullshit by saying it's bullshit. It's harder or more complicated to say, to comment when there's something to it or some element of truth, but the whole story is not known, whether it be beneficial to you or prejudicial to you. It doesn't matter because then you're spending time going down the road telling a 20 minute fucking story in there and everybody's you know, skid mark shorts out in public. So if, if, if I have been, a, I, uh, and I have to make dinner for you and the children, the infamous WC feels line, but people tried to fucking malign me and Stacy. And I, I came immediately out and instead of saying, well, I can't comment on unfounded rumors. I said, that's a big bunch of fucking bullshit. And here's why. And speaking of that, here's who the, People are saying it, and here's what's wrong with them. But if there's something that's actually to it, and we can talk about this. Again, I'm not Jericho's press agent, but you, you can't depend on logical, critical thinking in situations that involve Tony Khan. Because as we have noted, Tony is NDA happy, Simply because, it, again, I'm not picking a side in this right now. We'll examine all sides of it. But if this girl runs up to Tony Khan and she's freaking out, because if she has had issues in the past, this may not have helped. Somebody may have misread the room. And instead, she, oh, Jesus Christ. And that was a point where she, well, you've gone too far. I'm freaking out. I got to go. I don't want to be here yeah. with this guy. Oh, God then it, it, normally because she's done it a couple of other times, she's quit other promotions. I'm not saying there's anything bad with that. I've done it a few times myself. But when you quit a normal wrestling promotion, they say, well, sorry you feel that way. See you down the road, right? But with Tony, it's, oh, my God. I'll pay you the rest of your contract, and, and maybe I'll give you something else. And do you, do you have a new car? Or you just, just sign an NDA so you don't say anything about Again, whether freaking out about the TV deal or freaking out about whatever or freaking out because somebody would say something bad about his baby wrestling promotion. And now four years later, a lot of people have. But it was brand new back then. But you know Tony. He's not confrontational. Even if they did think it was a big bunch of bullshit and this, you know, the whole thing's fucking juvenile, high school, whatever. Even if they thought that, or if there was something fucking to it, they especially, but Tony would go, oh shit, just don't say anything, be my friend, here's money, and, and don't say anything bad, because with Tony, it can't be bad. He never says anything, there's never a bad match, like sometimes the cake just doesn't rise, there's never a bad show, there's never a bad guy, there's never, it's always great, because that's how he freaks out if it's otherwise. That's why the change in, in his appearance over the last four years, he, he's becoming the son of the wolf man in front of our eyes. So I can believe 
that if she went straight to him, that he probably goddamn asked her, please just sign something, I'll give you anything you want. I can believe that. Can you not? I absolutely can believe if something did happen at that specific period of time where he doesn't have TV yet. He has a deal, but he's not on the air. And I don't even know if he had a signed deal. But shit could fall apart quick, especially if your top star is being accused of anything. Yeah. And Chris Jericho, for anyone who loved Omega and the Bucks, or even Cody at that time, Jericho was the biggest star in AEW when it launched. Period. Well, remember, for the first six weeks when we were enjoying what he was doing, we were saying that he's goddamn realizes he's in, you know, the land of Nod, and he's just hot-dogging and taking over the show because he can. Well, this Twitter account that put that other uh, Jericho thing out there, I got to say, they also put out some stuff about Don Callis and Scarlett Bordeaux. It makes you think this account's someone who may know some stuff. I have to say that. So. All of this is going on. Chris Jericho radio silent on Twitter. Tony Khan, not a word about this anywhere. The pay-per-view is coming up that day. And we're going to review it later on, but the story continued because of the reaction Chris Jericho got from the Long Island audience <laughs> and what that says now about dynamite that's about to come up and everything else going forward because Tony Khan, and we're going to play this later, whiffed three times. Three chances to clear Chris Jericho, to say it's not true, to say there's nothing there, to say it's ridiculous, but it's not true. Nothing. Three chances to whiff during that media scrum. And now the story's bigger. But um, Chris Jericho's reaction well, to that pay-per-view. That's the thing is that we, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember in the context of you know, which program, but the AEW audience, because it is smaller and more insular, you. If you're really devoted and like that kind of wrestling, yes, you are a, a smaller, more insular group, but they're all online. They're all on the internet. Where That's why WWE has larger numbers, because they get the people that have actual, you know, other things to do than live and die with what goes on, on, you know, on Twitter amongst their favorite wrestlers or, you know... Our audience is more, just tell us when somebody actually punches somebody for fucking real, right? But the, the, the smaller audience, and that's going to spread on the internet, the tweets, the wrestling sites picking it up. And you've already got a situation where Tony has lost such control of his, the, the entire roster as far as creative, where all of his heels are the most popular wrestlers in a company and the baby faces look like complete morons. And then the matches that uh, the match that he originally had scheduled with Jericho was thrown into chaos when, you know, Kenny had problems with his guts. And then they shoot a last minute angle on TV the night, I believe before this whole thing exploded on Twitter. And there's Jericho in an eight man tag team match with a variety of people that are both over Sting and not over almost everybody else. And the, the risk I've never seen, we've seen the fans like in, in Puerto Rico, right? When they decided in the girls match that time, we're going to like, who was it? God damn it. I've forgotten now. Who was it? The fans loved on the Puerto Rican pay-per-view. Uh, EO sky. EO sky. Right? Even though she's the heel and it, it ain't supposed to be that way, whatever, we just love her. And you've seen that to the bizarro world, as they used to call it, response in Canada and the United States when the Hart Foundation doing the thing with DX, blah, blah, blah. But I've never seen a match where there were so many swings of audience approval or disapproval when the, when the same team was on top. They didn't give a fuck about... I've, I had to take notes. Hold on. Now you've, you've scared me into this. Match is a mess. That's got to be it. Yes. That's going to... Yeah. That's going to be the fucking match. It was Sting and Jericho and Darby Allen and Sammy Guevara against Ricky Starks and Big Bill and Willie Hobbs and our friend Take-A-Shit 
with Don Fallis. And they loved Sting, and they knew they were say, seeing Sting for the last time in Nassau Coliseum in New York, and they actually had a house for once. So everything Sting did from breathing on up, they roared for. And they liked Darby, even though he hadn't done that much lately and he's off to climb a mountain soon or whatever the fuck. And Sammy, they just didn't give a shit. Every once in a while, he'd catch a stray boo but otherwise, he could have set himself on fire, literally. And I don't think they'd have cared. Yeah, how many times has he turned back and forth? And the pe- they love Starks and they love Hobbs. The Big Bill gets some ooze when he throws a little guy around. And I think they would like take more if they do anything with him. And he's kind of got a little heat, though, because he's with Phallus, who nobody likes. But the point is... <laughs> Jericho, they did sing his song. When he came out, there was a significant chorus of Judas, right? And then as soon as the music went down, you saw the guy across from the hard camera with the sign that said, World's NDA. And then there was, the booze would start. There was another sign, Jericho away. Yeah. <laughs> But then they do all the rest of the entrances, right, of everybody. And Sting gets there. Of course, Sting is the most popular guy there. He's 65 years old. He's retiring in eight weeks. So it, it basically every time that Jericho would get in and do anything, they would boo. And I mean, it would got to be loud, but it, it, it grew on itself, you know, over the course of the thing. And they had a couple of spots where somebody on Twitter said, now instead of Lissex sex gods, they're Lissex sex pests. But Jericho and Sammy would do his spinneroony and Jericho would do his cheesy grin pose. And I, I was afraid of snipers at that. But people were like, fuck you. Boo. <laughs> and then again, it would, when they would be, when they'd be doing a four way or more since it was an eight man tag, the people would, at one point, they were booing Sting, who had a scorpion deathlock on somebody because Jericho got a scorpion or a walls next to Sting. And they're, like, fuck you. It, it was surreal. They're cheering the heels when they're beating up a couple members of the team, but then another couple members of the team start doing something and they're cheering that, except if they like everybody, they just kind of sat there and ooed if it looked like somebody broke their fucking neck. And it, it, the match fell completely apart. It was sloppy. There were people fucking... And, and then when, when Sting made a comeback, that got him, right? A, a sloppy comeback by a fucking senior citizen because he was the only star in the match is what got him. But then Jericho came in to help the comeback and they started booing and chanting Kylie Ray and NDA. And, uh, I mean, we will review the match later on, but good Lord, I, I don't... <clears throat> so they basically booed everything that he did, even though he was on a babyface team. It caused Sting to get booed. Yes. I mean, it was incredible. Ricky Starks gave him the finger <laughs> instead of locking up with him. <laughs> gave him the finger and tagged out and made him a babyface. This is a disaster. And they could have put it to bed at any point. All Tony Khan has to say, we've never had any complaints from talent about Chris Jericho. We've never had complaints about Chris Jericho's behavior. There are no NDAs. It's ridiculous. There are no NDAs in place about Chris Jericho sexually assaulting or abusing or harassing anyone. They haven't said any of that. Real quick, Jim, let me play you this. This is from 2019. Tony Khan at a media scrum when he was still standing up and wearing a suit <laughs> talking about Kylie Ray. Let's go to this. Any update on the status of Kylie Ray? She's been a little bit absent. Like uh, she's no longer with us. Uh, we had so many things going into, so many announcements going into that role, but uh, she asked for a release and we granted it. So uh, it was, it was, she, she called me and asked if uh, she could be released from her contract. And it was pretty simple. I said, yeah. And I asked her if everything was okay. And she said, yeah. She, you know, she's didn't want to be with the company anymore and we talked about it and it was very 
simple and so yeah, she's she's uh, not on our roster. Seem amicable, super amicable. I, I, she's a very nice person. Who else has ever gotten their release from just saying I don't want to be here anymore? Andrade <laughs> tried that for two years. <laughs> Andrade was punching people <laughs> to try to get fired, right? And, hey, Tony, I mean, and it, I don't remember. Was she expected to be a, like an instrumental part of the roster, like a Cargill level superstar, or was it just you know again top babyface for the babyface women? I think at the start. Ooh, well, but. <laughs> I think I've seen her a couple times. I don't know if I'd have picked her for that spot. Maybe they had buyer's remorse. I'm not sure. They didn't have too much. Again, the women's division, the problems today all start from what it was built upon. It was Britt Baker who wasn't ready for prime time. There weren't that many top flight available women. But they got the best ones that were available on the independent scene. Well, but nevertheless, so... Yes, again, we must say... Some incident occurred, and there is probably at least some grain of truth in... We don't know that. We can't say any of that. Well, we, we, there's some grain of truth in the that Kylie Ray asked for her release, and it was granted easily. And whether that becomes that maybe they figured out, well, maybe she ain't right for the business, which she apparently was not, and quit a couple of other places. Or something more insidious went on, which we have no proof of. Yeah, what if she quit and the other places because she can't get the visual of a fucking fat Chris Jericho dropping his leather trousers? Oh, now wait a minute. Seriously, what if what happened? Said anything about any dropping of trousers? I'm just saying, if something happened there, who's to say that's not what caused her not to want to be in various environments? Chris Jericho, his friends. I don't, well, Chris Jericho's a... friends run fucking Impact. I mean, his friends everywhere. Oh, for heaven's sake. But at, at the same point, if somebody drops their trousers on Broadway, are you going to be afraid to walk across the street over in fucking San Diego? Let me present the scenario. Just all you. streets? Let me present the scenario. I'm not saying this happened. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying here's a scenario where I could see this happening. She's hanging out with everyone. They're having a good time. It's AEW. They're just getting things going. Everyone is in a positive spirit. Greatest locker room we've ever been in. She gets to know Chris Jericho a little. Someone she's watched on TV, admired. He's a great wrestler. He's very nice to her. Says, hey, we're all going to go back and talk about something. We're all going to go and, you know, just go over stuff. She goes in there and he makes a pass at her. Whatever it is, it instantly changed whatever she thought. And again, different people deal with different things. And again, we don't know if he dropped his pants. We don't know if he started singing, which is even worse. Oh my God. Now, well, now I'm hot. Maybe he started singing with Mega on guitar, just the worst band of all time. We don't know what happened. But it isn't crazy to think that if something did happen, it would cause someone who stayed in that same industry to have problems going forward. I don't think that's outrageous. I would have to say then that you need to, to not be a public personality in the big time world of celebrity sports or entertainment whatever this field falls into these days unless, unless there was some type of violence and fucking horror and goddamn whatever the fuck yeah i would need to have a, 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 a bigger level of happening to say he fucking made me uncomfortable but he didn't assault me and i left and now i don't want to work anywhere in this same industry you know, single guys want to get laid. And sometimes guys in bad marriages also want to do the same thing. But should someone in Chris Jericho's position, at that point, I guess, approaching 50, biggest star in AEW, coming off years of WWE TV, should someone in that position be hitting on any of the younger female talent? No. No, first of all, no. Because... <sighs> If, it, again, it, Tony was counting on Jericho to be the the name that sold his TV show so that he could get his, you know, friends' attention, basically, uh, you know, by putting them on the card also. So a lot was riding on him, and why does he want to start that there? The, you know, the, they're working together. Don't make it awkward, for fuck's sake. And that's, uh, again... 
you know, I'm sure the, a waiter waitress at Hooters would know who Chris Jericho was or a fucking whoever he might run into. I'm not saying don't fuck around. I'm just saying don't fuck around with this fucking girl that's working in the brand new company that you're the big star of. And and here's and here to be honest, here's something else. This is un you can't draw a parallel to the territory days or to the history of wrestling with this situation we've got now. It was sexual harassment in the locker room because there was none because there were not full-time girls on the roster. And there were, you know, there were a lot more women then at the matches that would love to be harassed in some cases by the boys and came for that specific reason, so harassment was not necessary to begin with. And now there's... The, the the women seem to be drugged to the matches by their boyfriends if they have them or whatever these days. And the, the, the locker room is, is Peyton Place, is fucking chaos with all the relationships coming and going and whatever, in every company. It's insane. Two questions, two last questions about all this, and we'll move on. If any of this is true, if Chris Jericho was involved in harassing anyone in the early days of AEW, and Tony Khan was aware of it, and Tony Khan gave talent a release in exchange for an NDA to protect his company and his top talent from sexual harassment charges or a complaint or anything else. How problematic is that going to be for Tony Khan if that gets out? If we find out all this is true, and Tony Khan's run his mouth a lot about Vince, who's a dirty pervert, <laughs> about safety, about all these different things. Tony Khan's always out there. He loves this attention. But if Tony Khan secured an NDA in exchange for letting a woman who was harassed leave the company, how's he going to get past that? Again... Without knowing the story, the question is, do, there is a defense for it if he was proactive with the NDA, say, well, just sign this and do this. She's just upset, right? There was no dropping of trow. There was uncomfortableness or whatever the fuck of some minor level. Tony jumps gun. The young lady's frazzled at that point, but apparently now sending out smiley faces about people in support of her or whatever. Well, a heart. Again, it was a heart, not a smiley okay. face. Whatever the case, if Warner Brothers Discovery, which I guess as of the, this moment right now are still their network, we'll wait to hear news on that. And partner. But if they said, Tony, what's up? Well, she got offended because he did the... Uh, again, and I just said... And, oh, all right, God damn it. Maybe make a public statement, clear it up then, or otherwise fine. But if they found out, holy shit, he brought her into the room and there were shackles on the wall and fucking goddamn, and, and I mean, some egregious, you know, offense that went way too far, then you're probably fucked. Again, imagine a fat, naked, drunk Gerard Depardieu coming at you. <laughs> Hello, hey. It's a frightening sight. One last question but about I'm, this. And, but you know what? And here's the thing. Again, business has changed, and some people don't necessarily are not perfectly suited for the entertainment business or the big-time celebrity business. If you'd have come at Miss Linda drunk and naked, she'd have just kicked you in the fucking balls and probably fucking ripped them off and put them in her purse. You can't say that someone's not ready for... It's one you know, thing if, if they're just quitting places. Another thing if it's because they were sexually harassed by a top star. No, but, 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 what, no, but what I'm saying to you is, is that in the, in the previous territory days, the women, the girls, were, they were the part of the boys, right? They were on the roster, but they had to get used to fucking all kinds of horrible sights, not even directed at them, just accidentally on the road, whatever the fuck. It, it, it has become a a bigger source of contention as the, the honestly people get into business that don't 
understand what they're going to be involved in in the business. I'm not saying she should be harassed, but if just the sight of Chris Jericho bloated and but we don't know. Though he may be, we don't would, know. No, I was about to say would. If just the sight of him naked would have driven her out of the entire industry, she needs to be a more private person. But again, we, we, don't, know. we don't know. I mean, again, you're... That's why I'm saying... He could have grabbed her. We don't know. Well, we if it got know. physical... I hate the idea of blaming her in any way for Chris Jericho possibly of doing something inappropriate. Well, you're the one that's talking about Gerard D Depardo's nakedness or whatever. Because I don't think she would have quit. If, again, I just again said we're... Here's the problem, and this is the big problem, because Tony couldn't say this isn't true, and because Jericho started all this, we're having this long conversation. We know nothing. Nobody knows anything. No one's saying anything, and it's causing everyone to just come up with ideas and opine on this. Opine. That's what we're doing. We're opining. But all I'm of this... I'm opining that, that they're, they're need before we can determine... Whether he's completely fucked or whether it's one of those goddamn deals and Tony just went off half cock and everybody sign everything, we can't tell exactly who should be crucified or who is totally fucked. Jim, a lot of wrestlers have done what they could. We brought up Andrade earlier to secure their release from the company. Considering Chris Jericho's Twitter fight with Stephen P. New and how unnecessary it was and the damage it caused, do you think in any way this could be part of a big plan for Chris Jericho to secure his release to join Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn's new Wrestle Rassment promotion. <laughs> and John Laurinaitis could book it. Yeah, that's right. Head of HR, John Laurinaitis. Head of HR. I say, is that what they call them these days? There used to be a J in it when I was a... But I, let me ask you about this, No, Let me ask you a question. Did Tony Khan not say... In the course of, I think we're going to review the media uh, audio later on. But he's talking about that they're the safest wrestling promotion. And, I mean, do you, do you want to break that down now, or should we save it for the audio? But in what fashion does he, does he even imagine that? Let's save it for the audio because there's a lot to still go over, but you're right. It's ridiculous. It was a ridiculous comment. And again, it was the worst pay-per-view AEW's ever had. Even their diehard fans have said that. Everything was great. <sighs> Everything was great. Well, the content of the classics, great. I'm great. Chris Jericho is great. <laughs> hey! Hey, what? Uh, my dinger. You got a dinger? What are you talking about? You didn't expect any of this, did you? Son of a gun, you got one. That's right. Bastard. I don't have one, I have two. Listen to this one. Hold on. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Oh, I'm used to that. <laughs> Sounds like Kentucky. Hey! All right, well... That sounds like New Jersey. We will uh, definitely go through all the uh, Tony Khan audio a little bit later. Well, but anyway, the, the bottom line of the whole thing is uh, Jericho brought attention on something by that... It, cause it, it's it, What do they call them? An unforced error or a, you know, a, an own goal? Self-own. Self-own. He just had to, he could still have slandered Stephen P. New and poor old Lucy Steele just in a different way, not in, including I've never signed an NDA. And then all these people wouldn't have been really chiming in with, well, maybe you have, and bring this whole thing into question. And then Tony Khan would not have had to comment on it, which leads to disaster in every single incident because Tony does not know how to comment on shit. Tony Khan could not, if, if Tony always Khan says the takes wrong a thing. shit, he can't comment on it. He can't just say, I took a shit. He has said, oh my God, my bowel movement was, it was so great. And I've never had my sphincter open that far before. I mean, it's- Hey, you better save that battery for the uh, review later.
Well, you got one now. We can tag tag. There's a two second fucking recharge on mine, and I can't keep <laughs> up with Tony. Like truck f- trying to fucking mute the audio for the cursing on AEW on TBS. You can't fucking press the button that fast. Well, again, we will talk about the Tony Khan media scrum audio both before and after the pay per view later on in the show. But Jim, let's have a quick little aside before we get to another one of the big topics here. News breaking as we are recording. What website is this? Inside the Ropes reporting, Kota Ibushi rushed to hospital following double what? ankle injury. <laughs> don't, I don't mean the what? Lie. What? Double ankle injury. I've never heard of that before. A, I thought a, a double angle. I thought, what, they did two angles with him in one day? Kota Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, come on now. There's something. Th- this is linked. Because something happened with, with Kenny's bowels and intestines. And now you're telling me that fucking Ibushi has bad ankles. Do you think that they got mad at each other and Ibushi broke both of his feet off in Kenny's ass? No, I don't think it's that because Kota Ibushi was wrestling, apparently. He reportedly injured both of his ankles while headlining a pro wrestling Noah event. How do you hurt both ankles? Did he jump off the fucking roof or something? (laughs) Japanese sports outlet Sports Hochi reports that early in his main event match with Mara Fuji at Pro Wrestling Noah's The Yeet, uh, excuse me, The New Year 2024. The Yeet? The Yeet? The New Year 2024. Did somebody yeet Ibushi? Ibushi suffered an injury to both his ankles. He continued to wrestle, however, eventually beating Mara Fuji. What was he doing? Wait a minute. In over 33 minutes. on his fucking head or fucking walking on his hands? Have you broken both your fucking ankles? How can you continue the match? For 33 minutes. Oh, good lord, he was crawling on his belly like a reptile. Ibushi is reported to have walked to the backstage area under his own power, but is said to have been in so much severe pain that he could not provide any backstage comments. Shortly after, he called himself an ambulance and was taken to the hospital in Tokyo. He called himself and they wouldn't even get on the phone for him? He said, oh god, I gotta go to the hospital. Here, here's your fucking phone. They are what kind of goddamn sloppy shop is that over there? They are awaiting diagnosis from the hospital. Tony Khan recently announced that they signed Kota Ibushi, who looked horrible in every appearance he's had in AEW in the last year. And depending on how this story goes, may not be wrestling anytime soon. What a disaster. Everyone what? they sign, everyone they sign goes down. But hold on now, hold on now. Okay, he hurt himself somehow. It's not... Mentioned in the article, he hurt both ankles at the same time, apparently. One would think it, that would be a, a real pisser, as Captain Lou would say, to hurt your first ankle and then your second ankle in the same match at different times. But nevertheless, he guts it out, kudos to him, and finishes the match so I don't think they can be broken. Um, But then he's in such severe pain that he wants to go to the hospital. Why did he walk to the back under his own power? Wouldn't you, after you'd finished the match, when he's okay, I can sell now. It makes a, it's good for the business, like they used to say when you'd get busted open hard way. It's good for the it's good for the business. Carry me out of here, haul me out of this motherfucker. But he walks to the back and then he sits down. And he says, "You know, I can't do that interview. Instead, hand me my phone. I'm calling my own ambulance." What the fuck is going on with these people? Jim, I have sent you an email with uh, a link that has a few different videos in it to what apparently is Kota Ibushi possibly getting hurt in a match and a couple of the other moments from the match or after the match where he couldn't even stand up. All right, well, hold on. I've got the, now that you've rambled on, I've gotten the link. I'm clicking on said link. Kota Ibushi taken to hospital. Uh... So well, it's a lot. Oh, 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 here we go. It's still popping up. See, I'm a slow loader because I got the spectrum, you know, the spectrum cable and the internet, and it's slower than molasses in January, as Mama Cornette used to say. Okay, is the first one, is the one that I should watch, right? The first one, it appears to be maybe where he got hurt. Well, maybe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click on, on that son of a bitch right now and see what he's going to do that he could potentially. The damage, a moonsault off the second turnbuckle. 
onto the guy on the floor, and he lands right on his feet and grabs his, as I'm turning myself, to, grabs his right ankle, and then the, the, the clip cuts out. So, yeah, that definitely looked like you could damage yourself on that. Again, again he, he just runs down the apron, jumps to the, to the, almost gets to the second turn, then makes it, and then does the moonsault, lands on the floor on his feet, and grabs his right ankle. Well, that was the first video. The second one appears to show the finish. Well, now he should be limping considerably at this point. But he's just collapsed on this guy <laughs> like he's laid down on a bed and pinned the guy. <laughs> just, I've never seen anything like that. I've dropped an elbow on my fucking mattress harder than that laying down it after a hard day. <laughs> Whatever he'd done to the guy, he just more or less... Missionary position, body pressed him, and fucking. Well, the thir okay. the third video is the post match, and this will tie everything together. Okay, and apparently it's it's the guy that tweeted this as I cannot believe my eyes, a disaster. Okay, and and he's trying to walk, and he's limping, and he falls on his ass, and the other guy whose hand he was raising just fucking lets go of his hand and turns off and walks away from him. <laughs> And kneels down selling, <laughs> ignoring the fact that this motherfucker actually just probably collapsed on purpose. Or no, not on purpose, but collapsed for real. Well, Kota Ibushi begins 2024 the way he worked the entirety of 2023. This does not look good, and uh, we'll see what happens. That's well, all but, we can But I mean, before he hurt himself, he, he was, was doing the deal where he runs down and jumps to the second turnbuckle and he didn't make that the first try and then got up on it. Well, that's the thing. He didn't even make, well, like you said, first time he jumped to the second turnbuckle, he missed it. I've never seen him do that yeah. before. And, and then he does the deal and, and the guy, you know, whoever this other feller is, uh, he tried to Mara catch Fuji. him, but Mara Fuji, they tried to catch him, but Ibushi went kind of over his shoulder and bam, and landed on his feet, which apparently he doesn't need to be doing that. Well, there you go. Um, so Tony can, should Tony's father at this point suggest that he open a, an offshoot of AEW as a, like a hospital, medical center, physical rehab, surgery, bone transplant, fucking you know, organ black market operation. It seems like there'd be more money in treating the injured AEW wrestlers than there is in paying them while they're healthy to sell tickets. Even if you were a fan of Kota Ibushi's, based on what you've seen from him in the last year, year and a half, whatever it is, you can't tell me there's anything there that would make you want to sign him to a contract and give him more money. Despite no. whatever you think of his work from before, since he's come back, and before this ankle injury, apparently, he was awful. Even his own fans said that, and Tony gave him a contract. And, you know, and that's... <laughs> uh, there are people out there, the Cornette haters, who will say, wow, Cornette would put the belts on the Rock and Roll Express or some fucking blah, blah, blah. Well, if the Midnight Express, we'd know. No, if the Midnight Express present day right here, right now, we're all here, I would not book them to wrestle on a national television program. Because at some point, age catches up with everybody. If Kota Ibushi was a, a legend in a, in a territory or even in this country, Steve Austin can walk in the fucking ring and take a shit. And people would still pay to see it, but he doesn't need the money to have to do that. But he could. <laughs> and they could make money off of him doing it if he would agree to it. And many legends have. Uh, but but no, you he's not a person that is going to draw you money based on what he can do now versus what he could do in the past. And what's the cutoff then? Is it 40 years old or is it 60 years old or whatever? The territory guys learned to work around their limitations because they were over his personalities. Ibushi has none. Most of these guys have none. And that's why when they're 32 and they're falling on their ass because they can't fucking walk because they've blown their ankles in the same match, whatever, 
they can't work around that because that's the only thing they do. Personalities can work around anything. Goddamn. Think of the guys of uh, Lawler until last year had had a match every year since 1970. Because he knows what he can do and what he can't do, and he knows what sell people. And all the old territory guys depended on that because sometimes they owned the territory, sometimes they owned part of it, or they just wanted to stay in the business. You know, Gene Kaniski was fucking 60 and still, you know, doing what he wanted to do because he was part owner and he knew how to fucking stretch, whatever. These guys, they can't do that because they've set the standard where that's one of those guys that does all that insane shit. And then when it catches up to them and they can't do it anymore, you, you can't pay them. Like it's like you're paying a fucking singer has just had his goddamn voice box removed. What the fuck are you there for then? Nobody's going to pay just to look at you. So that that's Tony is finding out the problem with this putting this much reliance on this kind of chaotic wrestling and signing every darling, even if it's a darling that took him 10 or 15 years to fucking be able to sign. The action figures wear out. Well, Jim, let's stay on the topic of AEW, even though there's so much more AEW to talk about. We'll have to break it up a little bit more. But AEW Dynamite aired last Wednesday, and I had forgotten all about it until you brought it up before. <laughs> But we do indeed, I guess, have to talk about what was on the road to World's End. Well, yeah, boy, in more ways than one. Um, and the road to ruin. And we watched this one program. because They, they were kind and beneficial enough to us on Raw on to just do reruns, right, for Christmas. And But we have to at least reference a few of the happenings on Wednesday night's Dynamite of December 27th before we talk about the world's end for Tony Khan on December 30th because there's, they were still setting shit up because they had no idea what the fuck was going on. And I like to subtitle this episode, Tony Khan wouldn't know good booking if Gutenberg printed it for him. A lot of the bibliophiles out there are now blowing snot. Google it, kids, <laughs> if you... But they led the thing off with another tournament match, but this time it was the three-way to determine the winner of the gold block to go on against the blockhead or whatever the fuck. It was Moxley versus Swerve versus Switchblade or Slingblade or... Slingshot. Slingshot. Slingshot Jay White. That's what it is. And again, you know, you can't stomach Moxley to begin with. He looks like a hobo wandered in from the railroad yard, and then they make it a three-way to make it worse. And within the first two minutes, they were all over the arena. And Taz had to mention the one guy trying to save this thing. He had to mention, well, the referee's being lenient. <laughs> It wasn't no DQ. It wasn't no count out. It was lazy booking, but it's supposed to be their tournament match where there's no interference and it's pure sport. And they're out in the goddamn bleachers because Moxley can't do anything else. He doesn't know how. He doesn't do it well. I can bleed. And, and thankfully, maybe he maybe he got to his quota. That month. I'm sure he has a monthly quota. They measure how much blood he loses. We did that one time. They sent me down in Charlotte to do a live remote on Channel 3 at, at the noon news for the blood drive, encouraging people to come down and give blood, right? Down to the Grady Coal Center. Okay. The old park center. <laughs> and, well, as a court can talk, the other, you know, what the fuck, right? Just be entertaining. So I went down and... And I was talking with the, the newscaster was there and I was also talking to one of the Red Cross representatives and I, I said, ma'am, I said, how much blood is there in the human body? And she answered me, I don't know now if this would, but let's say it was 12 pints, right? I said, okay, well, I challenge right now, I will give $5,000 to the Red Cross if Dusty Rhodes will come down here and donate 13 pints of his blood to the Red Cross. 
And boy, howdy. There you go. They didn't know what was going on anyway. So 13 pints. 13. You got to give 13, Dusty, or they don't get the money. <laughs> Think of the little children. I'm doing this on the goddamn new news on the biggest station in, in North Carolina. Anyway, so back to this fucking match. Um, I, d I think there was about a five minute period. I don't think any of the three of them were in the ring at all. It was just the worst instinct of every indie outlaw wrestler you could imagine. And then, you know, uh, Moxley and Swerve had a slap fight. And I wrote, this will never end. I was fast forwarding through the chairs and the railing and the goofy bumps and everything. And finally, Moxley hit his shitty double arm suplex on light switch and boom, there he is. We were 30 minutes into the fucking show. And again, the one guy who might have benefited from the one guy that's got some momentum and some talent and it needs some direction, but whatever that could have benefited from this was Swerve. <laughs> and... He didn't even make it to the finals. Uh, I think they got Swerve uh, set up for bigger plans. Well, I've, He probably shouldn't have been in this tournament, though. Then don't put him in a tournament. It's a work. That's what I'm saying. It don't, you put the... Uh, 30 minutes into the program for that. Who the fuck is Mariah May? Why is she suddenly get? Has anybody ever heard of this woman before? She showed up six weeks ago. They they apparently decided to do a two year character evolution of timeless Tony Storm in three months, and they've already got her nemesis slash replacement lining up. And I know people have likened it to All About Eve. I I I don't know if we're gonna haul in the Oscars on this one. But uh, isn't it more like Sunset Boulevard, though? Well, they're taking from everything They're And again, Tony Storm probably had a, the root of a lot of these ideas. I hope she's not writing the whole thing or she's rushing her own self. But now that everybody's throwing shit in and I guess a lot of people are too nice or too scared to say, slow down, cowboy. And so, yes, the Sunset Boulevard with Luther, the butler, Eric Von Stroheim, and the All About Eve with the understudy, or the story as old as time with the understudy conniving to replace the star, blah, 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 whatever the fuck. But this was like wrestling school promo. They gave her a live interview with Rene Moxley Good. And it was like, you know, promo practice at school. What the fuck? And then. Out comes Riho and ran her off and beat up Tony Storm. So she ran Mariah May or Maria May or Mariah Mary May. May. Mariah May. Mariah May. <laughs> she may not, but Mariah May. <laughs> you know, it, it could go either way. She can go one way, she can go the other way. Uh, but <sighs> so she runs off. Tony Storm gets beat up by this, this fucking feather. This goddamn cotton ball. She didn't even have her the, pipe. She just ran out there. They ran from her. You, well, you know, you heard the horrible thing about the, the fucking, she dropped the pipe and bent over and tried to pick it back up and strained her back. But when, I didn't hear that, no. No, I wish I hadn't said it. Um, <laughs> But I'm sorry. It, it, it's just ridiculous at the... At this point, they're trying to do something with some women that at least have some personality that the American television audience, which is primarily what they're on here, it's paying them the big bucks, can relate to and might be new. And, and they're still trying to shove this poor mousy schoolgirl down everybody's throat. And <laughs> Well, we'll play you audio later on. Tony Khan defends it saying that she's a big ratings mover. She can't move the ropes when she hits them. <laughs> you know what? Remember I was talking to you about the you scan, the grocery thing where you have to scan at the grocery your own shit. When you scan her at the grocery, it keeps telling you to put her in the bag after you've already put her in the bag. 
Well, that was the uh, that was that segment. Certainly, yeah. Tony Khan is no Thalberg. I'll say that. So poor Irving, we barely got a chance to experience his great dead at thirty-seven. Who's a better Booker, Irving Thalberg, dead or Tony Khan right now alive? Thalberg's rotten corpse. He'd be down to the bones by now. But anyway, um, so then Tony Schiavone was in the ring for the Don Fallis family ceremony with Hobbs and Take a Shit and Cal Felcher because it was Boxing Week celebration because, they're you know, the Canadians up there, they've, they've got these strange customs. Some Canadians celebrate Boxing Day after Christmas, some Canadians get kicked out of hotels in the greater United Kingdom area. They've got strange <laughs> customs. But Felcher, to me, looked badly out of place here because Hobbs and, and our boy Take, they look great. And if they would... Where is Take a Shit been, by the way? If, if they'd followed up on him, he was getting over it. All of a sudden, reedy, reedy. Uh, but they look great, and Felcher looks like the goddamn guy who got rejected at the Leave it to Beaver remake casting call in a suit. It just... And they got all got paintings of themselves with, with him, with Don, uh, as presents for Boxing Week, but they didn't uncover the fourth painting. And he did say, finally, the, the family is complete here. And then Sammy Guevara's music hits and interrupts. And Brian, what was the mood of the crowd at that point when Sammy came out? It was a groan. They did not want Sammy. They don't see Sammy as a baby face. He's kind of killed a lot of that in the past. He's turned back and forth so many times. This but they, segment didn't see was already... he, they didn't know he was going to switch yet. They didn't see him as a heel either. They saw him as a baby face. They all knew we just had a baby because those are the AEW fans. They know that shit. This segment was already dying a horrible death because Don Callis' segments always suck. And this one was as bad as all of them. And again, had they follow up on Takeshita, got a big win. Then I think he lost in like a tag match or something. Then he's just been like in the background in a group. We haven't seen shit from him. We literally haven't seen him take a shit. If anyone watches AEW TV regularly, why would you want to see Sammy Guevara come out here for this? Well, he was mad at Don. I think they thought the immense nuclear heat that Don has where random press photographers in Tijuana try to tackle him on an annual basis. Conan! 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 He didn't get his baby gift, Sammy didn't. Apparently, you know, uh, Don's like, oh, all this. Well, I just didn't know you were going to be here. Didn't know you were going to show up for work. You're on maternity leave or whatever. And he reveals the fourth painting, and it's all of the heels there with Sammy holding Sammy's baby, <laughs> which, you, you know, actually was kind of a, a cool thing to have made like that. You know, if, if it, I, although I thought at first they were holding a small chimpanzee. But nevertheless. What the fuck is wrong with you? Why would you say that? Well, it looked like an ugly child. So apparently, but Sammy didn't say anything about that. We don't know what the model for the artwork was. No, it, it could have been Cheetah. It could have been, but, but nevertheless, the point is, is that Sammy was incensed about this. He's, who the hell told you to put my baby in the picture? Maybe he don't want that baby to be seen. I don't know. I'm, I'm like you. If I had a baby like that, I'd take it to the plastic surgeon and say, can you make him look right? He, the surgeon added a tail. What do you mean but you're anyway, like me? So, I didn't say that. <laughs> but anyway, so of course, then Don immediately starts knocking Sammy in the way that to telegraph, not only that they're about to, he's about to turn, but also in a contrived way that you would not do if you were not intending on turning on the guy to begin with in the first place. So it's right. It's a foregone conclusion. And he tore him down. Sammy, you never, you know, you never show up. You're a hurt loser that hadn't shown up for work in five months or whatever. So choose your other family or my family. 
I can't see Bill Watts having produced this particular big angle here. And sh sh Shammy. 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 How oh, I love you. How oh, I love you, my dear old Shammy. Shammy. Shammy shoves. <laughs> Sammy shoves. <laughs> Here's what Sammy did. He shoved Don down. <laughs> Sammy shoves Don down. <laughs> and the heels get on Sammy. And then Jericho's music plays. And because this was probably hours, maybe, before the the uh, the news was being bandied about, the rumors and accusations, whatever, they didn't really boo him. They just did, still didn't give a shit. But Jericho used his baseball bat to run the heels out. And then broke the frames on the paintings. And every time he'd hit one of those fucking frames and it'd shatter, I'm thinking, boy, if somebody in the front row just had the guts to stick one piece of fucking plastic in his own eye and then call Stephen P. New, they could be a billionaire. But nevertheless, um, the heels bailed. There was a big face-off between Jericho and Sammy. And then they had a big hug. And finally, this long drawn out segment had come to an end or had it not 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 as soon as they hug jericho and sammy being the they starks and big bill jump that just appear and jump them from behind and start getting some of the most lackluster and or immobile heat that i've ever seen on them but i, I i'm like what the fuck and then the lights go out for a while. I didn't have my watch in the same room with the second hand, or I would have timed this son of a bitch, but it had to be better than 30 seconds of black screen on network television with the announcers going, well, wait, but, oh, uh, but, uh, uh. and when the lights come on, there's Sting and Darby Allen who got his name from an old Irish folk song, and they called him Darby Allen. And now Sting and Jericho both, so the ba the babyface team both have baseball bats, and they hit Big Bill about five or six times before he even went down. And w with the phoniness of some of the swings, I'm not actually penalizing him for that. And then that set of heels that are completely goddamn totally unrelated to the other set of heels that had just bailed, they bail, and the baby faces stand there. Did I describe that to what you saw, Brian, or was this some kind of indigestion from an undigested bit of beef or a blot of mustard over Christmas? This was an endless awful segment from the beginning to the very end callous again for anyone who wants to pretend like he's a heel with heat when everyone's booing and smiling you don't have any heat they're enjoying the show and then you get to the substance of it and it's all this stupidity and again him with the paintings the sammy stuff wasn't getting over with anyone jericho comes out jericho even before the the week of jericho i don't know what you call it <laughs> this is the start of the week of jericho right there on dynamite He's not very good anymore. You can stop pretending, everyone who's been pretending. And then just more. It's just more. And everyone likes at hey, one point or another. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I got his regardless, there's another way to put it that sounds even less biased. I'm not saying he is as good as he once was. He's he's better than some they've got, but he's doing the same stuff and or try he's doing the same stuff in the ring while trying to be a different person outside the ring every four months, and they've seen him for five years. How can I miss you if you won't go away? It's getting old, and so is he. Maybe he should revamp his schedule rather than his character. You know what else is getting old? The light's going out. Everyone is starting to groan when that happens. No one's yeah. getting excited. It's the House of Black doing it. The devil's doing it. Sting and Darby are doing it. <laughs> Why? This is one of those things from ECW that 
they got away with not having a logical reason for it. But now you have to have a reason for it. Or stop doing it. It's the laziest thing ever. I get that Sting can't run to the ring, but there's got to be a better way. Well, no, he could, you could, <sighs> they're not even doing it because of that. I mean, if he can have the matches he's having, he can run down the aisle way. It's that they think it's cool and it's not cool anymore. It was, it was like you said, the nineties ECW got away with it. And every once in a while, if you've got, if you can have the lights come back on and there's the rock or Jesus Christ, you know, that's wonderful. Everybody will just forgive you. Even if it takes a minute to get into position, but when it's constant and it's multiple times per show and it takes a while, and then it's not anybody that you wouldn't normally see otherwise on the fucking program. And, eh. <sighs> Did it get you excited for the eight-man tag at the pay-per-view? Well, it, 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 that's what it set up, but they didn't book it right there. They announced it later on at some point that I was zipping through. But what? No, because there was no logical reason for a variety of these things to go on in, in in the same segment or the way that they did but nevertheless more is less as they say speaking of more being less did you like in hindsight now when i saw this i did not know what was going to happen at the pay-per-view but did you like roderick strong again in a pre-tape segment doing comedy with Taven and Bennett showing the chart why MJF is the devil and being silly and and the neck brace and these two flunkies that Taven and Bennett have become in whole nine yards in hindsight now how fucking ignorant is this it's been steadily awful for a while I'm not convinced that anything that happened at the paper you're going to end the awfulness we'll see but it just, I can't believe that it, we'll, we'll get to it at the pay-per-view, but I can't believe they have done to all of these guys what they've done for no good reason with the position they were going to put them in. There's no one in charge with good mm. ideas. There's no one in charge who will say no to the bad ideas instead of trying to put his spin on them. That's the problem. It all comes from the top. The fact that at the same time, they're trying to sell everyone on the sports-based wrestling of the Continental Classic <laughs> They're doing bad WWE comedy. I hear not let, even let, the WWE comedy, which sucks on its own. Bad versions of that. Let me just say this, and maybe if it's not completely Tony Khan saying you guys must do this or else it's your jobs. Roderick Strong, Matt Taven, and Mike Bennett, whoever, I will say, please, somebody who knows one of those gentlemen, because I've dealt with all three of them. Forward this clip. If it's one of the three of y'all's ideas to be presented this way, treated this way, and do the things you've done since you joined the company, the other two of you ought to beat the fuck out of him. Because he's not only ruined his own career, he's ruined y'all's too. Y'all are toast. You're fucking stale goddamn bread in the fucking pan at the bottom of the toaster that only gets cleaned out every six months or so. Because that's a, you will never be taken seriously by that audience in that company. I don't care whether you're devil's henchmen or not, because you've been portrayed as brainless fucking twits, comedy characters, people who are unserious about their profession, and the whole thing's totally phony. So, who's ever, if it was any of the three of y'all's idea, instead of you being forced to go along with it, that person is a fucking idiot. But don't worry, you got company. Because MJF's a goddamn stupid a son of a bitch walking the planet on two feet right now. So uh, probably a lot of the attention will go on the failure, the complete failure that this angle is going to be will go on him because he gets a lot of the attention. And he's a fucking moron now too in the public eye. But we'll get to that. Anyway, you want to move on with Dynamite? Yeah. So... We got a tournament match with Danielson and Eddie Kingston. And remember, I thought it, you called it, by the way, 
You know, you're Brian, you're great. You just, I'm telling you, because I thought, all right, now yours echoes a little bit. You need to tone that thing down. All right. Hey, thank you, doctor. <laughs> I thought that even if Brian Danielson had to hop to the fucking ring on one leg with no arms like the goddamn Black Knight or whatever, um, that Tony would let him win it because it's his G1 before he, you know, finishes his full-time wrestling career. But you correctly called it. We'll get to that later on. But in the meantime... Now here is two baby faces, Danielson and Kingston. The whole tournament's practically been two heels against each other. Kingston could have been, as we've talked about, an over gimmick baby face. Of what of a couple years ago now, when he had momentum and the article and blah blah blah. But it's been the same thing for two years, start and stop. You see him, then you don't. But also his worst Japanese wrestling fantasies have been allowed to come to fruition where instead of a a fucking guy that somebody in Queens might relate to as a mechanic that worked down the street from him and is getting a big time chance at a sports career instead he's a fat guy having bad Japanese wrestling matches so that season has passed and then you got the fact that this went 22 fucking minutes counting entrances, I believe, with Eddie Kingston basically beating Brian Danielson, one of the best wrestlers in the world, by bitch slapping him with an open handed backhand and then a powerbomb one, two, three. Did this do anything for Eddie Kingston worth sacrificing Brian Danielson to that degree when you haven't got Danielson for another full fucking year? I think the way Danielson sees Danielson and the way we see Danielson may be different. I think the way some of these people see may be different. This whole thing was set up for Eddie to win. I mean, it was, well, it was telegraphed when he put his belts on the line early on. And whether Eddie is the person who should be winning a tournament like this, at this point, who's the younger wrestler that's going to be helped by this? Maybe Swerve. Is he younger? I don't even know how old he is. Who's the wrestler? I guess maybe Swerve. <laughs> and again, you know what? Again, I've, I've referenced earlier in the program, you know, people that, ah, Cordetti's stuck in a fucking past. God damn, he'd book the Midnight Express to No, I wouldn't. He'd book the Rock and Roll Express, not on national TV as the world champions. No, I wouldn't. But when I did book the Rock and Roll Express on TV, as champions last in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, they were younger than all these fucking guys are now. Remember, we worked it out. <clears throat> what Robert was 30 fucking four, right? Yeah, Robert Gibson was 34, and I think Ricky was, well, depending on which birth certificate you believe, he wasn't even 40 yet. So what the fuck? Anyway, so after... Eddie bitch slaps Danielson. What a fucking way to go down for a former WWE champion. The plumber comes out, and Brian, I know you saw it, but the folks will never guess what he told his opponent in the finals. He said, I want you at your best. I want you at 100%. <laughs> we keep joking about this it's every awful. fucking week. Can't somebody be honest? No, I want you to be hurt. I want you at your work. I want you hung over. Go out and party the night before. Because I don't want to get hurt when I beat you. Fucking morons. I want you at your best. Everybody loves you, but they know and you know that you can't beat me and on and on and on. And I wrote this slobbering wino. Thinks he's a badass. And then Kingston fired up and responded with a bunch of Japanese wrestling references to young boys and... Fucking various said, not in that respect. You know, the young boys are the the stooges over there, the 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 fetchers and carriers. But anyway, uh, at least Kingston has a little fire to him, unlike this fucking Moxley. But the whole point was show your fighting spirit. What? God damn it! Would a mechanic from Brooklyn tell a guy? 
I'm going to kick your fucking ass. I don't care who you fucking are. You think you've been a big star, but I've been waiting for this all my life. I'll pull your fucking eyeballs out. Or would they say, show your fighting spirit? Rest up. Bring your best. Drink some fluids. Train. Be ready. None of that. Here's the thing about wrestling. It's always been this way, and then we'll move on to the next part of this fiasco. It's always been this way, but when other people, smart people, were in charge, it wasn't a problem. A lot of the guys in the wrestling business, Brian, would you say down through history, is this an inflammatory statement, or is this an exaggeration, or is this truth, just plain fact? Most of the guys that have made money in the wrestling business since the start of it had a an odd or unique or a different look to them visually, physically. They didn't look like normal people. They looked unusual even, right? Would you say that's a fact? I would say that's a fact. And the most, you, like Bruno San Martino was a normal guy, but he was gigantic. He had a massive chest. Yeah. You would see someone and they go, oh, he must be a wrestler. Most like, people don't the most look like this. Yes. Don't look like this. Don't talk like this. Don't sound like whatever the case, right? But by the same token, you would find if you were a booker or a promoter down through history that not all the guys really acted like they looked. So sometimes you had to give them a little bit of a gimmick and bring it out to where that they acted publicly on television like they looked, like they appeared, like they spoke, so that the gimmick would be complete. Wee Willie Davis was an expert at horticulture. He was six foot ten and 350 pounds, and he had a face like a goddamn... 30s gangster, which is why he got into movies after he was a wrestler. But you wouldn't expect him to to expound eloquently on the fucking gardenias and blah, 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 and the golden rods. So that's the point. Is Kingston had and has a look and ability to talk and, an, and a charisma, and he should be, instead of letting the, him fantasize about his Japanese wrestling fantasies that appeal to a niche audience that he's been performing for his entire life, now that he's on national television, somebody should have said no. Yeah, like J Watts did for Junkyard Dog. Remember the Junkyard Dog's original gimmick was he was wheeling a goddamn wheelbarrow full of junk from the junkyard and the chain around his neck. And Murdoch used to come out with, he was, he played the U.S. Marine Corps theme and he had a fucking Marine Corps backpack and he'd hit people with his entrenching shovel. If fucking Kingston came out with a goddamn monkey wrench in his back pocket, one of those fucking caps on to hit a guy with a fucking wrench, I'd believe it coming from that fat, ugly fuck, right? Jesus, be nice. No, I'm I'm complimenting him. He's got a fucking look. He's not working it. Fat and ugly is his look? He's a fat, ugly fucking mechanic from Brooklyn or Queens or whichever one is He's most... From Yonkers. He's from Yonkers. Yonkers? Okay, I don't know. I never got that fucking fine into the neighborhoods over there, but that's the point I'm making. Yo, hey, we're gonna fucking go down and bust some heads tonight at the fucking plant or whatever the fuck, right? The plant, yeah. <laughs> Wherever you could buy this shit from him. But, but any, you, he would broaden his audience... If he if it's a hacksaw Duggan with the two before. Yo, USA, whatever the fuck. He said right? ho, not yo. Ho, ho yo, yo, it was ho. ho, not yo. Well, you ho, you yo, your ho, and I'll I'll yo mine. <laughs> Duggan and I shared a couple of yo's, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but, nevertheless, oh, so God. point is, work your gimmicks, people. So speaking of working a fucking gimmick. Can I just say something? Yes, you can. Very unpopular uh, opinion, but I have a few of those. But they're still true. I'm starting to think Brian Danielson at this point may be the most overrated wrestler in the world. Because I'm sick of his matches. And why I say that is, I know exactly how his matches are going to go. And they almost get too slow for me. Too slow in the middle. 
too slow with the guy sitting there on his knees with his chest up waiting for a kick. Like, I don't like that. And he may be one of the biggest problems in terms of the timing of the, you call it yay boost spot. You can't even call it that anymore. Just the trading blows back and forth with permission in the middle of a match or yes. towards the end of a match. I'm really starting to not like his matches because I'm seeing his match over and over again. Some of the stuff he could do on the mat is beautiful to watch, but his matches are, I don't know, becoming kind of boring to me. Well, but you know what? You said he, he's maybe overrated as the greatest wrestler in the world. There's two ways to look at that. Both these things can be true, whatever the case. He's not been produced and advised and booked correctly. He's too indie-minded to be given free reign over whatever he, uh, whatever he does. Although, at this point, in his career, and he's going to retire soon, and he's got a family, and he's got money. He ought to be able to do what he wants, just not on national TV and somebody else's fucking company. Let him do indies, right? Uh, but he hasn't been produced. Orson Welles made some real stinkers, right? Because he'd just take the money and do whatever the fuck, especially in the later years. He didn't give a shit. Drink wine. And yes. And that's the thing is, if any of these guys, Danielson, when he was, remember that run where he was the sly, smart-ass heel that we praised to the heavens, the matches were incredible because he had a variety of opponents who needed to do their own shit too. It wasn't a bunch of people working with him that were pleased and, and thrilled to be in the ring with Brian Danielson and wanting to try to have his match because that's what you do out of respect. When he worked with MJF, MJF had to do MJF shit, right? And Brian, he, he was doing those promos, which were great. He was having those matches, which were great against a variety of people. And then suddenly, as we talked about, however many months later it was, he was in the meaningless fucking group with the goofy plumber and poor Claudio, just a mute fucking lurch in the background. And there was it's not special because now he's doing the same thing over and over, except when he's out for long periods of time because he tries to have these goddamn Japanese matches and a Japanese guy broke his arm and then somebody else broke his face. He like is he a he great worker? Is, he, is someone a great worker if they always get hurt in these matches well, that really no, appeal no, no, more no. to themselves than anyone else? No, the guy jumped off top rope and dropped an elbow on his arm and, and or landed on his arm and, and broke it. That's not Brian's fault. And I've fair enough. I would have to know exactly the spot where he got his face fucking caved in to ascribe blame to Brian. That's uh, that's hard to do to yourself. But again, produce him. Tell him, Brian, no. <laughs> we need you, that that personality that you had. And we need you to, instead of fucking encouraging these guys and girls Japanese fantasies, get them into the fucking wrestling business in the United States and how to work and how to get over as a personality because you've done that too. And instead, they want him to go all out and show this mastery that he's already showed plenty of in-ring wrestling in his last nine months in the business. How about let's create something that maybe puts his ultimate career in jeopardy where he wants to finish at Wembley Stadium or whatever, but something might stand in the way of that and he has to overcome that and make it a goddamn nine-month story instead of having him in goddamn tournament matches where he's getting beat with a goddamn backhand. Fuck. Anyway, now can we move on to the next bad gimmick? I forgot what else is on the show, yeah. Christian Cage, Nick Plain, and Nick Plain's mom, who now is dressing like a Bond villainess. Have you noticed that? Yes, I did. I don't think she looks like Ursula Andress in a bikini, but she looked like she was wearing black leather and she has evil intent in her eye. They were supposed to have a sit-down with Edge on this program. And I got to think, 
I don't even know whether whether this was in the building or not. Did they not show Edge to the fucking crowd, if that's the case, that, that they pre-taped this somewhere else? Or if it was in this building, they still didn't show Edge to the fucking people, right? Right. He wouldn't have been on YouTube. So, I mean, would he? So they're supposed to have a sit-down interview in the back with Christian and his band and and edge and edge runs into the room and attacks everybody and he and christian fight out into the hallway and the security and the job guys try to separate and they have big fight in the hall and and edge god he's got a great mean face boy he looks like he means business and then it was broken up and i'll get you sunday or saturday or whatever it is but i guess those people they just didn't get to see edge in person I, maybe did they do that earlier in the day so he could catch a flight? I don't know. Why fly to the building to do that? When you go to a, a WWE show, correct me if I'm wrong, all the big stars usually at some point run in, make an entrance, they talk to you, basically talk to you. But if you buy a ticket to go there live, you actually get to see them in the building, right? Right. So these people probably thought they were going to get to see Edge amongst, they know who's hurt, but he ain't hurt. Anyway, they milked that for almost the whole program, and that's what we got, was a fight in the hallway. At least they've never done that before, so it stood out as something different. And then what did you think of Statlander against Blue Sky? I thought it was all right. In <sighs> the AEW women's division kind of way. You, what do you think of Sky Blue's new dark side personality? She's no longer wearing blue. She's wearing black, and she's teaming up with House of Black, uh, whatever she is there. Perpetrator, perpetrator. Julia Hart. I don't know if she's the leader. I was trying, do I say leader or not? But no, Julia Hart. I don't. How many? How big is this house? Are they going to have to put on an addition? Maybe get a fucking Murphy bed or something? Because people are they're moving into the house left and right. Nobody's leaving. Although, if I was in the house with Julia Hart and Blue Sky, I probably wouldn't leave too often. They'd leave. But, uh, thank you very much. Here's the problem. <sighs> I've mentioned Julia Hart's a personality, and I would have her wrestle very minimally and only when people pay to see it, and have her be the spiritual centerpiece of the House of Black, or maybe even something with somebody that could actually get over. Somehow, attention is put on her, but she ain't just out there taking bumps. I understand Blue Sky is a healthy, exuberant-looking young lady, but she's green still, and now they're putting Julia and Blue together, and they did the deal where Julia hits Statlander with the title belt, and then Blue did some fucked-up kind of sunset flip off the top rope thing powerbomb one two three they statlander what the fuck happened i thought they were gonna push her i thought she came back from injury i thought they were gonna put the belt on her she was starting to be seen on tv she's a grown adult she looked like she had improved i would like to see her follow jane our friend Miss Cargill over to NXT to get some proper training and see her in the ring wrestling the adult girls like Charlotte and Ripley and whoever the fuck. Because now she's just putting over these green munchkins in AEW for no, you know, she made changes. Statlander did. Drop the goddamn, I'm an alien being from another galaxy and the nose booping and the silliness. I guess she has no control over whether they send her out with the pudding gang or not, but she improved in her matches and she looks like a grown adult woman that could do some damage. And now she's going down to fucked up sunset flips by blue sky. That was my observation there. I mean, Statlander should be in NXT and Julia Hart and sky blue should probably be in developmental. Even though personality-wise, Julia Hart's obviously ready. 
Maybe in the ring she's ready for NXT. I don't know. I think Statlander should be in developmental or NXT, and I think that Blue Sky and Julia Hart ought to be down at the mouse's ear two shows a night. Oh, stop it. You see, now this they is where you become up. just a chauvinist pig. Oink, oink. What nights? Anyway, well, Tuesdays and Thursdays oh. um, are... Uh, There's no wrestling on... Well, NXT's on. Tuesdays yeah. and Thursdays are amateur nights where, you know, but anyway... So that was the main event of the program, Brian. At least the one I saw. Because the main event of AEW last Wednesday was supposed to be MJF and Samoa Joe taking on two of the Devil Stooges in another one of these challenges that never seems to come about for some reason. And right as MJF was entering the ring, and before I even saw Samoa Joe or any kind of a match, I was alerted to the fact that it was 10 o'clock Eastern and my DVR froze. They didn't even start the fucking main event until out of their time slot. So can you explain to me what they did? Because I tried to read the recap on the internet and I didn't understand the evolution of events as they were written down in front of me. All right, I'll see what I can remember off the top of my head because I don't, uh, you know, a lot has happened since last Some Wednesday. way or another, Joe is the one who's, who w turned on MJF right. by... MJF was found in the back. It was on the screen, lying on the ground, hurt the same way Joe had previously been, I think, last week. And then Joe revealed himself. I forget. They may have done the lights out, lights on again. I don't even remember. <laughs> Joe revealed that he's in cahoots with the devil. He isn't the devil, but he's going to take that title from Max at the pay-per-view. So then they... they The top they, baby they, face has been made to look like a complete piece of shit. Not a piece of shit, just an idiot. And just a an dude, idiot, a buffoon. And, yeah. No, he trusts all the wrong people. But so then now are the Devil Stooges the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions? Yes, they are the World Tag Team Champions. Because MJF beat, got to the ring and got picked. They beat MJF. Yes. But never took their masks off. See, I forgot that was the match. You know, you, now that you're saying it, I remember it all in yes. a different order. Yeah. So MJF's hurt. Then he finally gets to the ring. Then Joe turns on him. And then they reveal that the uh, devil has paid off Joe, I guess. And that the devil's tag team, which we believe are the kingdom, are now the Ring of Honor tag team champions. Well, no, but we didn't know that then. We didn't know that then. We don't know who these people are. No. So basically... The match, which didn't start until the fucking show was supposed to be over with. Then what transpired was that Joe revealed that he had been paid off by the devil and, and his henchmen to milk MJF into that position, where then he then turned on MJF. And then the devil's henchmen, who were still at this point unknown and unrevealed, beat MJF and win the Ring of Honor tag team titles that MJF and Samoa Joe were defending on behalf of MJF and Adam Cole, who is hurt and cannot wrestle for months and months and months from now. And that's so that MJF basically was left laying on his fucking face again. And again, this was the buildup. This was the last thing for the pay-per-view. A pretty big moment, Samoa Joe turning on MJF before the pay-per-view, and a lot of people like you wouldn't have seen it if you tried to DVR this show. Because this was the thing <sighs> they decided to stick in the overrun spot. Instead of just not having the, I don't know, Statlander versus Sky Blue match, and having this fit into 10 p.m. Instead of doing it at 9 o'clock and then referring to it and talking about it and what in the world is MJF going to do to get even with Samoa Joe on Saturday night until 10 o'clock, they put it on after 10 o'clock and hope for the best. Well, that was AEW Dynamite. <sighs> uh, I probably should have the ratings and I don't have them in front of me. I'll pull them up in a bit. Before we move on any further, we have a couple of updates here. Right now on Twitter, Houseman is trending. <laughs> I'm trying to see what's going on. Apparently on his show today, is he walking back some of what he said? Let me... Apparently, he's, a lot of people seem to think he's now walking back any claims 
Other people are saying he never actually specifically mentioned Kylie Ray in any of the things that prompted everyone to run crazy with it on Twitter. So you have to wonder if he's uh, heard from any attorneys. And I have to say, I've said a lot about Chris Jericho. It's all stuff. It's not anything like comparing him to Harvey Weinstein. If you don't have the goods and you're making a comment like that, I don't see how Chris Jericho doesn't sue him. How do you not? But in in in, in old Nick Houseman's, uh, in his fairness to his interest, also he didn't say Kylie Ray's name. He talked about Jericho signing an in, an NDA, right? And then other people took making it. other people sign NDAs. Yeah, so. Maybe he's trying to d- differentiate himself from the the rest of the comments uh, that he uh, elicited and stands by his comment about, hey, you make other people sign NDAs. This is still a developing issue, a fluid situation. And like you said, we still have no proof that Jericho came at anybody naked no. like Don Pardo. We have no proof that Jericho did anything. We also don't have AEW saying it didn't happen. We don't have AEW saying this is completely ridiculous. Chris did nothing wrong ever. Like nothing. I don't know if I'd make a blanket statement like that about anybody. They got to say something. It keeps festering. Yeah, but this nothing go wrong away. ever. He's only known the guy for five years or whatever. Well, that's right. nothing wrong after he lost the belt the first night that we gave it to him. But there's the update. Apparently, some people think Nick Houseman walking back. Other people think Nick Houseman just reaffirming that despite what other people ran with. It's not his story. So we'll see. We'll add this, Jace. You can add this part to the earlier (laughs) Jericho conversation. Jim, one other thing, and then we'll get back to Dynamo, but we got to mix it up. I'm sick of AEW this week. The Velveteen Dream. Oh boy, what in the world has he done now? He has issued a public video apology. Oh, for what? Let me set the stage. He's outdoors. This appears to be in a park of some sort. There's a uh, <laughs> facility in the distance with some trucks. A facility? There are trees. Is there, is there a wall around it and men with white coats patrolling? There's not. He is wearing a uh, camouflage vest and a cap, and here's the Velveteen Dream. As you've probably seen or have heard over the course of the last few years, I want to apologize for my behavior. Both professionally and personally, I always preach to those closest to me about the power of accountability and responsibility, and I take full accountability for my behavior over the last three years of my life. When narratives were written about me, uh, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter what was written about me. It doesn't matter what was said about me. It doesn't matter what's on the internet about me. I was wrong, okay? Uh, And because of that, I need to apologize to a few people. First, I want to apologize to the WWE organization. I want to apologize to the WWE organization for any unwanted attention and negative press that I brought to your brand and your product. I want to apologize to the WWE fans and the Velveteen Dream fans because when you hear the name Velveteen Dream, it should have only been spoken about in a productive and a positive light, Uh, not the name Patrick Clark. Uh, as another statistic of what happens when talent and opportunity meet immaturity, okay? Uh, That's not what you spend your hard-earned money on. It's not what you invest your time and your money in. When you look on the TV and you come to the shows, you should uh, escape reality, not have to deal with mine. Let me stop this for a second. Wow! Now, again, to be fair, and I don't have it in front of me, I believe he previously was dealing with accusations of some sort of dealings with an underage minor. I mean, I well, guess a minor and, is underage. And, and, but and, and, and three women and a fucking person. It was an underage whatever. person. I don't even remember if it was no, a boy there, or a girl, it, to be it, honest. Hold on. There was, I think that was sending pictures back and forth or whatever. It wasn't like he was down to elementary school, but he had a problem also at a... Uh, tanning salon or goddamn health spa or whatever where he got in an argument and they asked him to leave and he wouldn't, they called the cops and he had some various issues and a lot of it was, you know, he was making his own headlines there. But from what he has said so far, that's about one of the most grown up adult fucking responsible statements I've heard anybody make in the wrestling business. Well, there's more. Let's go back to this. And I agree with you. Um, 
I want to apologize to the WWE and the fans. I want to apologize to Paul Levesque. Paul, you are such an understanding and patient man and leader and getting the opportunity to work with you and to learn from you. I get the sense of what makes you who you are and how you've been able to handle the responsibility of being in the public light for such a long time. Uh, I want to apologize to you, Paul. I'm sorry. Uh, also, I want to say I'm sorry to Shawn Michaels. Shawn, it's still beyond me that I've been having the opportunity in this lifetime to learn from you, to have your mentorship and your guidance. And I apologize if you feel like you've wasted your time and your energy uh, investing into me. You have not. Uh, I'm still a work in progress. I'm still learning. And I remember all the lessons that you've taught me. Uh, Sean, I'm sorry. Let me stop real quick. This is the greatest apology video I've ever seen in my life. I'm, um, I'm stunned. I'm amazed. Uh, uh, yes. Wow. Well, let's go back to this. This is more. My best friend. It's a Hootie Miles. I want to apologize to you uh, because before you were tied to me publicly uh, for the support you've given me and you continue to give me, your resume was impeccable. And I apologize for any smudges that I may have put on that resume because of my behavior. Uh, you're the last person that should have to deal with anything like that. And I'm sorry, man. Uh, I want to apologize to my family. My mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my nieces and my nephews, because you may read things, uh, you may hear about things, you may uh, be confronted by people who you don't know, and you might feel the need to explain yourselves on my behalf. I just want you to know that you do not have to do that, ever. No one should have to explain anything for Patrick Clark. No one should have to trend because of Patrick Clark. No one should have to ask, you know, answer the questions. Oh, where is Patrick now? What did Patrick do? What happened with Patrick? That's not your responsibility. And I don't want you to feel burdened with that responsibility. That's Let me pause. For, okay, the plane is in the video. I was like, is there a plane going over my head? What the fuck is happening? <laughs> he's in the park. You got to, right. He's in the park. That's but, right. But again, the, yeah. Of course, now, the way that he, maybe it's just he's misspeaking with the tense, but is there something else he's expecting to come out, or is he talking about the the things that people have talked about in the past he's trying to make amends for, right? Did I just misunderstand his tenses? I have to think that's what it is, and again, there's a little bit more that we'll play here. I have to say, he seems composed, he seems... Yeah, very, very sober and somber. No, but looking at him too, like you're not saying like this is a guy who's fucked up right now or anything. He seems like yeah. he's really got his shit together, at least from appearances point of view. But let's go back to the end of the Velveteen Dream Patrick Clark apology video. That's my responsibility, okay? And I apologize to you all for any energy, uh, negative energy that has had to come your way because of me, okay? Uh, again, I want to apologize to the fans, and those in my professional and personal life that I've affected by my behavior. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I recognize that I was losing myself and I apologize to anyone that I lost along the way, anyone that I've upset or offended because of my behavior. Um, man, I'm sorry. And I hope you all forgive me. Thank you. Well, there it is, and boy, that's holy. The... Who's his doctor? Who who's working with him? Holy shit! That's the best babyface promo I've ever heard in my life. Yes. Um. Well, there you have it. Well, it's good to to know that uh, that he straightened out whatever his issue was that was causing the the situations. What do you think a wrestler should have to do? And, you know, it's different today than it was in the past, very clearly, to get a second chance. Something like this. And again, not even going into the details of what he's been accused of, because I'm not even sure exactly what happened, as we talked about earlier. But the idea of doing something like this, doing it very publicly, would that entice you to give him a chance? And, you know, maybe on probation, 
secret probation, see how it works out. Like, wh what do you think of this video? Should there be any anything from the wrestling business in return? Well, I, you know, again... He never in, says what he's apologizing for. Yeah. Well, no, but in the odd that just for being a general fuck up, maybe he was on pills. Maybe he just, uh, he, as he said, immaturity. Maybe he thought he was a big star and he could just act any way, whatever the case, right? It's happened before with various people in show business. It's harder now, in, in, uh, again, in the territory days, you probably had a more personal relationship with the booker or the promoter or the, you know, one of the boys could come to the bosses, hey, can we... Can we give old, you know, Zeb a chance or whatever the fuck? You know, he stopped drinking or this and that. Or he got rid of that wife. is driving him crazy. And that's the way, you know, guys, but uh, with a national company and he made headlines and obviously, you know, they didn't feel the need to retain his services. I think at some point you have to look like has he ever wrestled anywhere but the WWE developmental system? I would think he would have to go out and get booked with some people to on independent shows to show that he can show up, that he's not going to call bad attention to him. If he wants to, maybe he's just apologizing. He doesn't give a shit about wrestling. He's going to do something else. But he can't expect to walk right back into the WWE before he goes back to the Toledo mud hens and shows he can show up on time and still run the bases or whatever the sports analogies might be. I mean, according to Wikipedia, before he went to WWE for Tough Enough and then training, he was wrestling, he's from D.C., he was wrestling for MCW, so that's Maryland, I believe, right? Oh, good, well, but I'm right now, though, I'm talking about, oh. has since he's... You don't hear about the Velveteen Dream anymore or formerly known as or whatever. So if he's been working on himself and getting his shit together, as it sounds like he has, maybe he hasn't been wrestling at all, but I don't think he could just expect to walk into the WWE before he proves that he can do this once in a while at a local level and nothing particularly bad happens. All right, well, that was the live update of the news that's happening now as we review all the big news that happened last week as we Excellent get caught apology, up Excellent apology, though. One of the better apologies in the history of apologizing. People usually don't do that. You know, when they apologize, it's a private thing. It's a maybe a thing in hushed tones. That's very out there. I mean, it's a bold move, that's for sure. Maybe well, he's sorry. Maybe he's sorry. Potentially he's sorry. I'm... I know I'm starting to regret a few things. <laughs> well, on that note, Jim, I'm trying to pull up the fucking dynamite numbers. Hold on. <laughs> AEW Dynamite that we just reviewed. AEW Dynamite without a fucking in there for YouTube. But AEW Dynamite, ladies and gentlemen, from Wednesday, December 27, 2023 on TBS, on average, watched by 843,000 viewers. Good, wait a minute. Isn't that what they did two weeks ago? This week versus the trailing four weeks, the trailing four week average was 827,000. Last week was 782. Well, I know, but then the week before that was 823 or so. It's like, it's like the, the house in Baton Rouge because of Jimmy Kilshaw, the local promoter. So 10-6, $10,600. There'd be a thousand people there. Ten six. It'd be three thousand people at ten six. Well, let's see what you think of these numbers. Again, this was the go home show for the pay per view. Jim, 8 to 8.15, I don't know why I said Jim there, 8 to 8.15 p.m., these were compiled by WrestleNomics, quarter one, John Moxley versus Swerve Strickland versus Jay White with picture in picture, 983,000 viewers. Jesus Christ, so Sheldon, again, hands it off, Sheldon with the tag, you got a million people there, what are you going to do with them? Well, what we're going to do is go to quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m., the continuation. Because that the... thing was still going on, that match. Yeah, throughout the entire uh, quarter two, 8.15, 8.30, with picture in picture, 869,000 viewers. Ouch. So uh, 114,000 people. So that's, that's where the, the real number starts, right, basically. That's what it seems like. Quarter three. 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., Danielson and Eddie Kingston's video, an ad break, 
Swerve and Prince Nana backstage promo, the Mariah May rant promo, and then the live angle with Riho and Tony <sighs> Storm, plus the backstage confrontation between Action Andretti and Top Flight, and Tremperetta, Orange Cassidy, and Rocky Romero. Yeah, I skipped that. I skipped that on purpose. The other guy on the show wearing an eye patch. <laughs> and then an ad break. 839,000 viewers. X, another 30,000. So that, now we're 144,000 down. It's only been 45 minutes. They started with Danielson that quarter. They ended with Rocky Romero. Two guys with an eye patch in the same segment or the same quarter. What is the matter with Rocky Romero's eye? I think he just is a pirate supporter, an enthusiast. <laughs> a pirate enthusiast? Jim, we're going to sail off the quarter is a, four. Is that anything like a turd burglar? Maybe so. 8.45 to 9 p.m. The endless Don Callis, Sammy Guevara, Callis family live promo. And then the angle with Chris Jericho, Ricky Starks, Big Bill, and Sting. Followed by Roderick Strong in the Kingdom's backstage angle. 867,000 viewers. So they managed to muster back up uh, 28,000 of them. And and uh, now this has been fairly steady. I've taken out the first quarter because that was artificial. 869, 839, 867. They can't keep this up all day. Well, we have the big 9 o'clock hour, 9 to 9.15 p.m., quarter 5. Brian Danielson versus Eddie Kingston with picture-in-picture. Picture. 792,000 viewers. Ouch. Okay, Danielson and Kingston. Because it's a tournament match. They're both technically nominally baby faces, and why do people want to sit there and watch them kick shit out of each other for 15 minutes for no reason? And eight, uh, six, uh, 75,000 people agreed. Well, the match continues into quarter six, 9.15 and 9.30 p.m. with picture-in-picture -picture ads and then the post-match with John Moxley. 832,000 viewers, also the high point in the key demo, 433,000 between 18 and 49. And what in the world do we attribute to eight, uh, the 40,000 of them coming back? Was it the... Remarkable backhand slap finish, or... I think the callous angle drove them away before the 9 o'clock hour, and then the 9 o'clock hour comes on, and it's Danielson versus Kingston having this match. I think that match... Some of them get, came back for some it. Some of them came back for that. That's what I think. Well, you may be right. I forgot about the uh, phallus effect. We will continue things here with quarter 7, 9.30 and 9.45 p.m., John Moxley and Eddie Kingston's live promo, mm -hmm. an ad break, the Christian Cage, Adam Copeland backstage angle, and the beginning of Statlander versus Sky Blue, a picture in picture, 794,000 viewers. And they're back uh, under eight, but again, 869, 839, 867, 792, 832, 794. They've, this is remarkable. They have kept much of their audience for the first time in what months? They're only down. Again, you got to take the first quarter out of it because they're down almost 200,000 from the first quarter, but they're not even down uh, 80,000 from the second quarter. Well, let's go to the final quarter with an overrun, 945 to 10 p.m., quarter eight. Statlander versus Sky Blue continued. The post match with Julia Hart. Willow Nightingale, and Abaddon, the Ruby Soho Soraya and I J forgot about Abaddon. The Ruby Soho Soraya and a J backstage angle, and an ad break, 781,000 viewers. Well, that's a gift that that didn't lose any more than it did. Uh, 13,000, that's the low point of the show, but it was the on-screen low point of the show. And finally... 10 to 10.06 p.m., the overrun, the Samoa Joe backstage angle where him and MJF take on the Devil's Masked Men, and then his promo, 807,000 viewers. So 26,000 people showed up thinking they were going to watch Gardening or whatever comes on after that, and like, what the fuck is this? 
I don't think it's gardening on uh, TBS after Dynamite. Okay, we've got to get to the the root of the the matter here. From now on, we got to start disincluding the overrun and the artificially inflated first quarter and doing averages based on what they really fucking get for a viewership for this program quarters two through eight and i the average <laughs> would probably be significantly lower well they're about to be helped i just saw the end that vanderpump rules is coming back but it's going to be on tuesdays well how's that going to help them it's not going to be on wednesdays against them Oh, I thought you meant for a lead-in. No, I meant to destroy them. Why can't they figure it out where they can have this Vanderpump fella lead right into AEW, and then they'd get the Vanderpumpers and the Big Bangers? God damn, it sounds like a fucking Roman orgy. You know, all kidding aside, if you know that Vanderpump is the one show destroying you in the ratings, why not throw a bunch of money at one of those idiots and get them on your show and try to get some publicity out of it? And ruin their show in the process. Either that or just fucking bribe Vanderpump. Say, hey, move over to fucking Thursday. What's it going to hurt you? Well, Jim, those were the Dynamite ratings. Let's quickly move on now to some other uh, topics. Uh, there's a big one coming up I'm going to ask you about shortly. But first, Jim, I wanted to get your thoughts on the news that broke this past week. The passing of Killer Khan. Um, and, and for a lot of the folks who don't... Uh, who aren't old enough or who weren't around at that point, Killer Khan was probably most famous in America for he had the run with the WWF in 19... What was it? Was it 79-ish, 80-ish, 81-ish? What was the day that Andre was broken? Uh, 81, 82. And that time frame where Andre the Giant had an accident outside the ring and broke his ankle... But because he had to be out for a period of time, they actually incorporated it. They blamed Killer Khan for it and even showed some footage of Andre with his doctor and the size of his cast and it made something out of it. And that was unheard of at that point in time that anybody could injure Andre the Giant. I don't think it had ever been done, at least not on any widespread, maybe in Montreal in the early days, right? So. That got him over with that audience. He had a ton of heat, but he was a a real Japanese wrestler, um, you know, and, and worked Japan for periods of time, both when he broke in and then later on when he went home uh, to bookend his United States excursions. But uh, he, uh, you know, he was huge for you know, for the Japanese wrestling scene, he was, you know, much bigger than almost anybody except Baba. So he got over that way. And, and then, you know, uh, had the Mongolian look when that was fashionable over here in this country with the ponytail and the whole nine yards and the, the big chops. What'd you think of his screeching? I guess that's the best way to, to call it the best thing to call it screeching. Yes. Right? He had, yes, it was a, a screech kind of like, a, a larger, more intimidating-looking guy doing Cactus Jacks all, you know, at that, at that level. Um, and didn't he then? I mentioned he went back home and wrestled in Japan when the his run in America was done, where he'd he'd worked all kinds of territories. He was in Dallas for quite a while, wasn't he? Wasn't he part of Akbar's gang of foreign misfits at one point? Yeah, well, he was with Akbar in Mid South, and then he went to World Class. And actually, if you remember, there's a great match. I'm sure it must be available. Gordy and Killer Khan with Kerry Von Erich as the referee, and this is before the Freebirds had officially turned babyface. And it's the first Freebird Von Erich handshake. It's Terry Gordy at the end, covered in blood, after one of the most brutal matches of the '80s, shaking hands with the Von Erich. Well, the Von Erich with Kerry Von Erich. Well, he was the Von Erich at the time to all the fans. But what a match. One of the most brutal, bloody matches, but in the ring, like not like around the arena with chairs. Yeah. It was an in-ring brawl. You, hey, in Dallas, you couldn't go around the arena with chairs or you'd have come back in the ring with knives sticking <laughs> out of your ass. <laughs> Fucking idiots. But anyway, but yeah, I mean, he for a big man, he was a great worker and he had the intimidating look. And then, but at the same time, he didn't just, when he went back, 
who went back home, he didn't just work a gimmick. He was a, a good worker. And then I guess reti- owned a restaurant, right? For some period of time over the last number of years since he's been retired from the ring that uh, some of the boys would visit from time to time. Not just owning the restaurant. I believe he was the chef in the restaurant. Well, there you go. He wasn't just the owner. He was a customer. He wasn't. No. Well, yeah. Well, no, that's not how that works. Well, that's how the hair club for men fucking spot went. I'm not Joe. Oh, I'm not just the president. I'm a customer. I don't know how you link. Well, he wasn't with killer Khan because he wasn't just the owner. He was the chef. One of the best big men, I guess, in America during that era, because he had a second run with Hogan in like 87, I think. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. What He was on one of the, um, oh, God damn it, you're probably better with the WWF history than I am. But wasn't he, uh, didn't they do an angle on one of the Saturday night's main events? Am I thinking about somebody else? You may be thinking about somebody else, but uh, you may be But I never about met Killer Khan, in case you were going to ask that question. I'll preemptively strike. Never met him, believe it or not. When he was he was in Dallas before we got there, and Mid South before we got there, and then WWF before I got there. He was a trailblazer. He was always there first. Speaking of trailblazers, I don't know how much talking I'm going to do for the next hour or so. <laughs> there was a topic in the middle of the tsunami of Chris Jericho related stories and AEW drama stories. All of a sudden, the news, I thought this was going to be the one to pull you back early. Kevin Dunn out at WWE. I believe Mike Johnson was the first person to report it, that Kevin Dunn had given his notice that his last day was the first or as of the first, I guess the 31st. And then Nick Khan, yesterday as we are recording, put out a statement or sent a missive to everyone on their email chain in the company saying that Kevin had departed. So I'll read you that in a bit, but what were your, uh, I'll sit back, say whatever you, it's Kevin Dunn. This is one of your big ones. Oh, come on. No, see now you've built up, you've built up this false fucking expectation that I'm not going to be able to fulfill or to follow through with. And, and here the problem is, is that it wasn't, it wasn't a, a fall from grace. It wasn't a goddamn they didn't find, see, see, that's what everybody was saying. Oh, what's Jim going to say about this? He's going to have a lot of pleasure. No, he's a 70 year old man. That's made tens of millions of dollars from this company through no talent of his own. And now he's going to go off to fucking play polo ponies and watch other people have women sign NDAs. It, 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 he wasn't caught with compromising pictures of him having inappropriate contact with a goat and run out of town on a rail. See, that's the thing. We knew the rumors had been out there for some time that, you know, when Triple H or Stephanie took over, that they'd probably have their own people in. Well, they never really took over. But at the same time, the the thought was out there that Kevin Dunn would be gone if Vince was ever gone. And Vince wasn't gone long enough before to test that theory. But it makes sense from a, not only from a company standpoint with the new ownership, but also from Kevin Dunn's standpoint. (laughs) Not only was everybody says he didn't want to work for anybody but Vince, that's right, because Vince put up with Kevin Dunn being Kevin Dunn. He's not a popular person. He's not a people person. He's a miserable person. And I mean, look at the physical state of him. He's 70 and he wants to fucking go away with his tens of millions of dollars that he got because he was figured in when Vince took this thing to new heights. If it was Hollywood, there are goddamn people in the television industry in Kevin Dunn's line of work or in movies or whatever that have never made an iota of the percentage of money that Kevin Dunn has, but are infinitely, infinitesimally, exponentially better at their jobs. It's because Kevin's been there for 40 years, and he insinuated himself up under Vince's armpit or outer sphincter ring or whatever he penetrated on Vince that led to him being there for 40 fucking years in that position. And and he 
you know, uh, profited from the stock deal over 20 years ago and has continued to profit from it. And then now he's profited the most from it with the big sale. He had still a significant portion of stock. So he's made ridiculous amounts of money that I'm not saying that any goddamn jack off that runs the Ferris wheel at the county fair could do Kevin Dunn's job from a standpoint of dealing with the budgets and hiring the crews and overseeing all the different departments of production and all that boring bullshit. But as far as having not only a vision for wrestling that differed in any way from Vince McMahon's, that was never going to happen. As a matter of fact, many of Vince McMahon's worst instincts were either the seed was planted or they were watered by Kevin Dunn. Laughing that anybody would ever present this in a sports-like presentation. And also, you just talk to anybody in television or anybody in filmmaking or anybody in any kind of broadcast, and nobody stays in a job like that for 40 years unless they own the fucking thing, Right? And that was brought up when I was working there 20 years ago. They I can't believe he's been there 20 years. But nevertheless, he's leaving on his own terms. He don't have to work for anybody else because Vince made him rich. And now TKO, Endeavor, whoever it is, they not only want a different look probably for the programs, but they want a younger guy in charge because how long seriously is he going to live at this point? I mean, that's not even being cruel. That's just being a statistician working for an insurance company. You keep saying they, 70. Is he that old? Well, I, he's got, he's, look at him and look at me. <laughs> he's got to be older than me. Look it up. How old is he? I don't fucking know. I'm looking it up. And goddamn it, you know what he used to? You could be able to tell what kind of condition he, he was in by just checking his teeth. But then he got those fixed. But nevertheless, he's made a ton of money. They want a new guy. They want a younger guy. Maybe this will mean that there will be a different look to the program, not in terms of how many cameras they're going to use or the way they're going to light the building, but maybe in terms of presentation. Are the announcers going to be able to interview talent again, or do talent still have a free reign to just walk to the ring with a microphone? Because it's been so long now, that's the way we do it. Or are they going to reevaluate this thing and bring it back to a really high-def, glossy, new presentation of what the it used to look like before all the sports entertainment horseshit took over? The personalities could still get over. It would probably be easier because you could get lost in the presentation better. Does it concern you when people get jobs in wrestling that trained under him that may have his philosophy? Yes. Yes. Because they, you don't, that's the thing. I'm not saying he can't teach anybody anything about producing television. I'm saying it would be the worst thing ever that he ever taught anybody anything about how to think about wrestling. And there was the problem. I wouldn't have had nearly the problem with Kevin Dunn that I did if he was like the head of production in every other wrestling company and just shot the shit. But he had opinions with Vince that Vince would take seriously on the talent, on the angles, on how, oh, don't get too wrestling if you tried to make people believe shit. That was what needed to be snuffed out and unfortunately never was. And that's what we've got a lot of this shit now that we look at as a matter of course that came from that way of looking at wrestling on television. Well, let's talk about his early days. He was a young beaver when Vince McMahon discovered him because they say, I mean, how true is it that Kevin Dunn's father, Dennis Dunn, saved the company? I mean, that's the way it's been presented. It saved the company because he well, rescued the tapes out of a burning car. Yeah, no, the company was never at risk. What happened was... And they were so loyal that they said, we're going to give your son a job forever and make him one of our top executives. Well, hold on, cowboy. What it was, was that I, and I heard that story, which at that time was only not even 15 years old when I got there. But Dennis Dunn, Kevin Dunn's father was a, 
one of the heads of production back in the days of the WWWF when they taped in Hamburg and Allentown, Pennsylvania. That's outside they, production, though, because obviously they didn't have their own in-house production team or studio at that point. But Dennis Dunn's one of the people that used to head up the production facility they, where they did post and they did other things down in Washington. Remember, do you remember hearing about that? I believe so, yeah. Yes, and that's where, because Kevin Dunn's from Washington, and that's where uh, Vince Sr.'s original Capital Wrestling, Capital Wrestling, imagine that, was incorporated in Washington, blah, blah, blah. Point is, Stamford didn't come in until later on. So Dennis Dunn was driving the tapes back from Hamburg or Allentown or whatever, and his fucking car caught on fire. And as the story goes, he wrist singed hands and bony fingers to get the TV tapes out of the trunk, or elsewise they, it would have cost him, back in those days, a pretty penny to shoot a TV and, and pay for everything and pay the boys and then not have anything show for it but it didn't save the company, but that was the start of loyalty or even more furtherance of loyalty between Vince Sr. and Dennis Dunn and also Vince Jr. because he was at the time, he didn't own the company yet, but he was the TV announcer. He was on the shows, right? He'd have had to do all that shit over again. And then probably because Kevin Dunn, who is Dennis Dunn's son, and they brought him in in the early 80s, to be some type of associate producer. And then he and Vince, for whatever reason, hit it off, probably because of their disdain for anything approaching professional wrestling. And Kevin moved up in the ranks to where you see him 40 years later, a 70-year-old reformed beaver who has just retired with one week's notice. So how old is he? Did you find that? He is 68 years old. Kevin Dunn is 68 okay, years old. Okay, when you get to be 68 fucking years old and somebody calls you 70, you can't get too goddamn insulted. Well, here's a statement that Nick Khan sent to WWE staff and talent. I believe it was put out there by Sean Ross Sapp. After 40 plus years of helping to build WWE and hands down the best production and media unit in the entire sports and entertainment business, Kevin Dunn will be leaving our company as of today. <laughs> Before WrestleMania 1. And he seriously, like, this came out like in a week, right? From Not even a week from no, the start of the announcement. Kevin Dunn is retiring to New Year's Day. He's done. Before WrestleMania 1, Kevin joined Vince at WWF. Many of us remember a pre-WrestleMania WWF, a regional wrestling company that looked like a regional wrestling company. Then, we experienced WrestleMania 1, whether live, on closed circuit, or years later elsewhere. It was magic. A regional wrestling company had become a global sports entertainment juggernaut. Vince led the way, side by side with Kevin Dunn. Joined at the hip, like a conjoined twin. When many of us were kids standing in line waiting to play Pac-Man, Kevin was already on the road, breaking his back to help build our company. When you so, that, so that's what happened to him physically. I wondered why he was hunched over like that with that Renfield stature. When you see our product now, there is nothing that comes close to its look or feel. 52 weeks a year, three to four times a week. It is singular and truly special. No other company can or will do that. And that is because of Kevin and our media team's hard work, smarts, and determination. We are forever grateful to Kevin. He will always be part of the WWE family. Paul and I will be having an in-person meeting with the media team at Raw in San Diego today at noon and with our superstars at 12.30. We look forward to seeing many of you there, and we look forward to crushing 2024 together with all of you. You know what would have been great? What would have been great if he'd have sent that email out and then had the in-person meeting with the production team where he said, okay, that fucking no-good piece of shit's out of here, that goddamn demanding, commandeering motherfucker. Now we're going to have fun. Just a change in tone. Well, it'll be very interesting. 
he is right that so much of the look has been, it's Vince, but it's Kevin Dunn. So many of the things that a lot of people like me complain about, the staleness, the sameness, the crappy music, whatever it may be, a lot of that's been Kevin Dunn. This is going to be the first real test. I mean, Vince they're is gone. Obviously, they're going to go after somebody that had experience in live sports, one would think, because that's the only thing that compares to this from a from a television production standpoint. You can have shot goddamn the highest rated sitcom or the highest rated dramatic program or you've produced The Walking Dead or whatever, but the WWE is closer to a live sporting event still than anything else in television or broadcasting, and you've got to get somebody with that background. They're doing live remotes from from the field or the court or wherever. They're not shooting shit on a set. Say that three times quick. And so, and Kevin Dunn had none of that background. They started out just, his father was the post-production guy, right? So they're going to go to a, I would think, a heavily experienced live event, live sports director. I remember one WrestleMania, Timmy Walbert, the director who later on worked for TNA and, and actually came and helped us in Ring of Honor a couple times because he lived in Maryland just as a favor. He did a 22 camera shoot at one WrestleMania, a live shoot with 22 cameras. What the, f you know, you need to not only, uh, uh, Kevin Dunn a lot of times gets credited as the director of the program. He's not. The, the actual director is the guy who sits there and says to the technical director, ready three, take three. Kevin Dunn is overseeing everything, but he's more, more of the time than sitting there calling cameras. He's fucking chewing on his goddamn snacks in the announcer's ear going, okay, the package is coming up in 30 seconds. That's a producer, not a director. So where was I going with well, that? Well, I think they would actually hire in-house because it's such a unique thing it's hard to go out and get someone just from sports because they have to understand a whole lot more than that to do it it seems like the kind of job where you almost have to bring someone up who's been there for a while well the 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 thought was it was going to be the michael mansuri fellow and he's already now gone to AEW where he's got nothing to work with to ruin that show yeah <laughs> he's been doing <laughs> a great job over there but it, it's you know that's the thing is who do, who somebody's got to know who all our cameramen are everywhere and who all our vendors are everywhere and who, who to get the lighting in Portland, Oregon and what the fuck, you know, and that is an acquired knowledge over years and years. If Kevin's been the only one doing it and hopefully he shared some of the information with the other people, but I'm, I'm wondering because Endeavor doesn't know any of these people yet. Do they think, okay, we're going to bring in Johnny Hotshot that fucking produced a goddamn Super Bowl a couple of years ago? You never know. And don't forget the influence of Dick Ebersol and the NBC Sports production team. Oh, yeah. On what became the look of WWF, because there's a clear line from what it looked like in 85 as they were trying to expand before NBC and after NBC. That was the thing. And then by 87 both syndicated shows, or by late 86, they had the big arena look. Shoot big people from below. And, you know, big yeah. arena, yeah. make everything look bigger than it was. And that was Kevin Dunn. That was Kevin Dunn, even before he was the top guy in production, he was there for that whole ride. But it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see. But again, if, if you've got a tale of two cities. The AEW VPs are bailing for various reasons, having to do with not doing their jobs very well, whereas the only VPs that are leaving the WWE are people who were under Vince and who it may be time for them to, to go, and there's unlimited resources to fill those spots. But the question is, that's what I'm hoping for, is maybe somebody's going to come in and say, well, why? In the UFC, the announcers interview the talent. Why do these fucking wrestlers just wander out without a microphone? Why don't we try to make this shit a little bit more plausible and produce it that way? That would be 
the first UFC show when they got the Fox deal. And I can't even, now it was, God damn it, who tried to kill the guy that molested his kid? Help, Cain Velasquez. Cain Velasquez. He was in he was in the fight against somebody who's I'm escaping me now, but this was back when I was in TNA. So this was 15 years ago. But they had a one hour special on on Fox, and that was the 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 big fight that they were hyping for the title. And it was their network debut. And from the graphics and the way they presented the program and the packages they did to explain to a new audience, to a new network TV audience, the rules of this sport and who the fucking major players were. And the announcers established themselves. And as in color, I think junior dos Santos might've done color because he's the guy that's going to get the winner of tonight's main event match for the world title. And I said, my God, if somebody had taken Bill Watts's vision of professional wrestling and done a network production like this, it could be huge. And then they had the fight, and it reminded me why that wrestling became a work, because the fight lasted 45 fucking seconds. And then they had to fill fucking time. And yes, I know those things happen, but the debut on network TV, if Ada had a three round slobber knocker, holy shit. But instead it, and that's why, but that just reinforced my opinion. If somebody could do what they Fox network that night did for the UFC to a new broader audience with wrestling, instead of this goddamn hokey, you know, inside the actor studio bullshit that we've got now, you could hook people and then you could really play on their emotions. And then you could get heat when you were kicking a shit out of that good looking fucking baby face, et cetera. Just like we did a hundred years ago, they could do it all over again. But instead we've got alas, poor Yorick. If Vince tries to ever do anything outside of WWE or God forbid makes a run at taking it over again. <laughs> Will Kevin Dunn be there by his side? I mean, when you say he's as, he's 68, he's almost 70, he's leaving, does that mean he won't come back if Vince calls? And, uh, well, and Vince, by the way, I, breaking news, Bruce Pritchard has handcuffed himself to a tree <laughs> in front of the new offices. He said, I'm not going anywhere. It's the Magnolia tree down the street from, from Titan Tower. I remember that one. Um, no, it's a big if. I don't personally believe that there's a chance that Vince McMahon will do ever do anything else in wrestling or the wrestling space, as they say, but the WWE. However, just from the, you know, goddamn things we've seen, I guess you can't rule out the realm of possibility. He might try to take the thing over again. Because he's still in that mix. If Vince McMahon called Kevin Dunn, and said, I've just driven my fucking car into a ravine, come to fucking Bangor, Maine, and pull me out with your teeth, he would be there. But I don't think Vince will ever do anything but the WWE, and I think as the clock ticks, the idea that he might try to take the whole thing back over somehow is probably fading. Well, with that, we uh, say goodbye to Kevin Dunn. Does this open but a door, I, I Does this open a door for you coming back? Oh, God damn it. No, what the fuck? Again, he's older than I am. He said, fuck it, I'm done. Uh, but uh, no, it doesn't open a door for me to go back because I'm still not any younger. It's not a time machine. And I can't take joy in Kevin Dunn leaving when he's been made a multimillionaire by business that he was always pissed off that he was in because he they always wanted to win emmys he wanted to be recognized as a great tv producer not a great wrestling producer and for what they did and the budgets they had to keep and the amount of people they had to hire i'm sure he was a wonderful television producer but on the his effect on what you saw and or what you got to see from wrestling was not anything to brag about so I take no joy in him leaving 
with his head held high and his bank account full. I wanted the pictures with the goat. Well, there's still time, but Jim, moving on that from... goat's getting old. You know, the prime, the prime breeding time of a goat is short with their adult life. I did you not know, know that. that. No, I don't know yeah. too much about the breeding styles of goats, no. So we, we ain't got much more time before we're going to get those pictures before that goat's going to be completely worn out and good for nobody. Well, Jim, Kevin Dunn used to produce a show called Monday Night Raw. I don't know how much of this you saw or how much we have to talk about, but the big thing everyone's talking about, the return of The Rock. It was billed as a former WWE champion will be returning. Jinder Mahal came out, <laughs> did a very, uh, very interesting promo. He was good for what he said, although I think timing and place, it seemed a little bit ridiculous. And then it led to the return of Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. And uh, we could talk about the segment, but did you watch more Raw than that, or were we just talking about no, this? No, I just got a soup son, just a mere steak tartare of Raw. Cause I've, and, of course, there was another thing that made news there that I'm going to reference that I did watch the clip of this. Um, poor old, uh, goddamn, what's his real name now? I get Da Vinci. Da Vinci. Da Vinci of, of Imperium. They had to stop a match, and I know everybody was praising the referee, and he did a, a a good job there for what they tell him to do, but did you happen to see that, or should I describe it for you and everybody at the same time? You know what? I was kind of uh, in the middle of other things, but I had it on the background, and I looked up, and I was like, wait, what the fuck's happening? And I rewound it and watched it again, so I did see it. Well, it, it, here is... Because normally I wouldn't pay attention to this match, I'm sorry to say. Well, and, and you know, you wouldn't be alone. It was Jey Uso and and somebody I can't remember against uh, Kofi Kingston. Kofi Kingston against Da Vinci and Marcel Marceau or whatever his partner's name is. And they did a spot where, as Da Vinci was going to jump and did jump off the turnbuckles in kind of a jump up and turn around thing, like he's going to cross body or do something to Kofi. Kofi jumps up and drop kicks him. And boom, down goes Da Vinci and stays there. It wasn't the drop kick. It, it, it was the, if you watch it back, he's reversing his momentum. He's going forward into the drop kick, and then suddenly he's got to go backwards from the drop kick. And he whiplashed the back of his head down on the mat, and apparently instantly knew well i'm not going to get up and apparently the referee saw what his the guy's face looked like and you saw they got a close-up of jay uso on this move and jay uso's face oh shit so apparently they could tell that he rung his bell on the mat and the referee went right over there and was down and everybody was selling and he was talking to the guy and he did the x sign and they had literally just come back from a break like 10 seconds before this because the match was in progress for a while. They come back from a break into that spot down, boom, and they're there. And so I think the baby face Kofi rolled over and tagged Jay, I believe. And just at that point, the referee called for the bell and stopped the whole thing. I don't know who was supposed to win. I assume the baby faces. So they did win anyway. Um, I don't know how much longer they had to go, but they knew the rock was coming up. I'm sure he could pad the time. And so, but at the same time, it was, it was kind of an expose because you've never seen two guys more unhappy about winning a match than the baby faces that won the match. They're all, you can almost see them like cussing, like, well, fuck, this is bullshit. It stopped our match. They don't know how to react when shit happens. It's not supposed to happen. It was even more obvious that this is a complete fuck up, that their Uso and Kofi are standing there going, well, shit. And they didn't raise their hands. They didn't try to get the people involved in cheering for them to not feel bad about this guy laying there with his bell rung. And then after they stopped the match, once the doctor had checked uh, Da Vinci, they saw you saw him in the camera shot walking back, holding his head, but walking down the side of the ring under his own power. 
So that was flat, too. They've got to be able to improvise when shit happens. I'm not saying to let anybody work when they're injured, right? I'm not saying get the guy back up, fuck the brain damage. I'm saying everybody else still has to play their part enough to think that what would this be like if this was happening, but it was a shoot. If it was a shoot, the baby face would want to go back in for the cover, but the referee would wave it off, call for the bell. What? The baby faces realize we won. Hey, we won. Yeah, fuck you. You were trying to fuck us up. And then the partner could come in and he could take a couple of fucking bumps as they're tending to the injured guy on the side. The partner could come in and improvise, go over and spin a baby face around, slap him in the face, boom, let bang, 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 shoot off, backdrop, whatever the fuck to get the people thinking about something else besides this, this guy got brain damage or not. Make it a little bit more exciting. Not make the baby faces look like just putzes and not cast a cloud over everything. But yeah, it's it's phony bullshit and that guy's really hurt. Does any of that make any sense? Again, it all happened on the fly. They reacted on the fly, but you would think... Everything happens on the fly. You would think they could have done something where you still had one competitor who was standing and two others. You could have done something so that it wasn't just, all right, let's all go back to the locker room now. (laughs) Yeah, just, it's over. And and again, it's over. Referee stoppage was the official announcement. Yes, referee stoppage. And the people who won the match were upset about it. Because they, because it wasn't what they had planned to do. But everything happens on the fly. What my first year watching wrestling live at the gardens, I saw a guy break his leg, and they were supposed to win. So the guy with the broken leg, the baby faces, and and his partner had to figure out a way. Where before he could get out of the ring, so they could tend to that leg that was flopping around, he had to win. So he won. Crazy Luke Graham hit Tommy Gilbert in the fucking throat with the tape thumb, and he fell backwards over the guy with the broken leg. One, two, three. Now get me to the hospital. Sounds like a regular Kota Ibushi over there. Well, things happen on the fly. What do you think about this, though, considering this comes on the heels of Tony Khan's comments about being the safest company in the world to work for, their track record on safety? We'll play the exact quote later on. The question about concussions, Moxley brought it up previously after he was concussed and then worked a Long match, I got pile driven twice. I can't even say it without laughing. It's so Ish. ridiculous. But that match happened. That match kept going. This match literally instantly stopped. A lot of it's about the referee and what they're thinking, what they're being communicated, or what's being communicated to them, I should say. What do you think about this just in terms of the general sea of change, I guess, around concussion protocol? Well, it ain't ballet. And things happen. And especially in a big money match, there's the the effort for everybody involved to work through it to get as close as, as you can to what you were supposed to get, right? And in other times, it's a goddamn cold TV match. Just stop the fucking thing right there. And everybody should know how to react and work around it where it doesn't look like a big expose. But here, the more important point that nobody has brought up is this. I'm not talking about making hurt people work or stopping it too soon when it's a minor injury that could be sorted out later or anything in between. I'm th- Did you see the drop kick and the bump? Yeah, because they replayed it, so I did see it. How'd it look to you? Which part? The idea that that was the move they decided to do, it seemed like it was a bad idea to begin with, and then the dropkick seemed like it pushed him back. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're you're calling, you know, what happened, but how did it look as far as, of all of the wrestling that we've watched in the last two weeks, what was going to be the move that a motherfucker wasn't going to get up from? Where would that have ranked on that list? Pretty low. Pretty low. Because it can happen. And that's where the idea of taking a plausible bump and selling it came from. You didn't have to be thrown off the roof because everybody knows, kind of, 
as they reach adulthood that if you get your head hit the right way, or if you take a bump over the top rope like Buddy Rogers, get your foot stuck in a water bucket, or some freak thing, it doesn't have to look like that a human body would be burst into goddamn a million pieces for somebody to be incapacitated. This was an innocuous-looking bump as bumps go in wrestling these days. But he hit his head. And so therein lies the lesson. You don't have to do a shooting star press off the top rope through a table wrapped in barbed wire sitting on a concrete floor and then get up and limp for 10 seconds when you can take any kind of a bump if you build to it right and you do it right and it looks good enough, you can sell it as believable that you were hurt. So this was this was one of the pissiest looking bumps on the whole show. But it was the one the guy couldn't get up from, which is, as long as you tell that story in wrestling all the time, it can happen anytime in any way. Somebody can, you know, three seconds is all it takes to get pinned. One bump is all it takes on your head to get knocked out, whatever the case. Then you don't have to fucking mutilate yourself over and over every goddamn day. And if this shouldn't be a lesson, I can't imagine what it, that's a, that was again. On the list of dangerous bumps, number 984 on a list of 1,000, but it's the one that knocked him goofy. So why don't they concentrate on selling these type of things more instead of not selling shit that looks like that you would kill any normal fucking human? It doesn't make sense, does it? You know, it's like the disconnect if you think back to the 80s. Ricky Morton's strong suit was his selling. He was great at everything. Right. But it was his selling. Remember when Rock and Roll Express got booked in all Japan? Ricky Morton's yes. a great wrestler. Yes. Well, Robert Gibson's a great wrestler. Or, you know, really good. Well, Ricky's great. I don't want to put Robert down, but Ricky Robert, was great. Robert stands in the shadow of, of, you know, and that's why, but Robert, especially in his younger days... Uh, and a wonderful teacher as well, but go ahead. And a physical guy. Everyone always talks about what a tough yeah. guy it was. Their success was their ability to manipulate the fans and get them, the fans emotional around Ricky selling. Get the sympathy. Be, be a snazzy, well-versed tag team combination of two young good-looking guys with some snazzy moves, and then one of them is isolated and is beaten half to death, and the other one desperately tries to get the tag. And then finally, when that happens, through some type of Hail Mary, they either come out victorious and slide out of the ring with the heels wondering what happened, or they get the shit kicked out of them and swear to come back and get even. That's the formula. And Ricky Morton can, during that match, get punched, shoved, shoulder tackled, and he could fly across the ring and he could sell something. Yes, he. he I've seen him take three bumps for one punch and it didn't look phony. They went to all Japan and were getting hit. You know, it, it's not a shoot, but all of a sudden they have to, you don't have to yeah. take a bump. You're going to take a bump. You're about to be run over. And it was a completely different style. And I like all Japan and I like Japanese wrestling, especially from the 80s and 90s but it wasn't the right fit. That was the difference between American style and Japanese style. Unfortunately, that Japanese style, whether it was the men's or the women's wrestling, has kind of infiltrated America, even though there really wasn't a big fan demand yeah. for it. And now they're finding out that the same thing applies in reverse. It don't work the other way either. Ricky and Robert were selling fucking buildings out across the country with that formula. Didn't fucking work in Japan. They couldn't couldn't grasp it because that wasn't their culture over there and the style that they were used to. And now, because the American wrestlers became fans of what they were doing over there, they try to bring it over here, and it don't work either. The other way around. People want to see an underdog. They want to see a baby face. They want to see a fucking struggle. They want to see all the 
emotions of these. They want a reason to watch the fight. Why are they mad at each other? They want their wrestler not to be injured so they could see him. Yes, they want all those things. And that's why that what works here don't work, Jan, and what works, Jan, don't work here. That's one of the big problems. America got away from what made American wrestling work for America. And now it's just kind of what the most no, super no, hardcore America, wrestling fans want American wrestling to be. America didn't get away from it. The American wrestlers got away from it. And then the American fans said, what the fuck are they doing? We used to like this shit. Well, Jim, speaking of things that fans used to like and still do, the very popular Rock returned to Monday Night Raw. As I mentioned earlier, Jinder Mahal yes. giving a promo, a speech about how much he hates America out of nowhere and how awful and disgusting. The, he was getting some real booze. It sounded like that's, that military yes. town where someone was ready to jump the rail or something. It sounded like it. No, and here's the thing. This is a, they may have stumbled onto something here, but they won't capitalize on it. It was, they got a chance. The Rock was two hours away at a football game from where they were doing Raw, and obviously they got a chance to have him come, so they put out that a former champion will return, and people were wondering, who's going to be, who's going to be, and then out in the building comes Jinder Mayhall, and the people were shitting on it. Oh, fuck, we thought it was going to be somebody we liked, and they shit on him, and they even said, why are you disappointed, and they started whatting him. And if they were just shitting on it. They weren't going to like it. And they started what him. And what this was designed for was just for him to come out and cut an anti-American promo that's as old as the hills so that then when The Rock came out, obviously he's on the other side and the people would be happy, right? But I don't even know if the writers, the young writers these days that they have, if anybody realized this, and maybe Jinder Mayhall knew that I might be able to make something out of this because as he started in on the thing, he started, as you said, he started getting real heat and they started to listen and they started getting pissed off instead of the what and the bleh. He's a big, ugly motherfucker. He's a foreigner. But Brian, you know the old rule of thumb about Heels lie and baby faces tell the truth, right? That's a rule of thumb in wrestling. Right. Do you know when that rule can be violated? When? When it's an arrogant, obnoxious, foreign menace telling the truth about the United States. And that gets heat. He said, you've never been more divided. Your politics, your news, the misinformation, the ignorance. This country was once a superpower, and now it's a joke. And that's when they started fucking, ah, oh, fuck you. And that's the thing, is right now they're... And it's a military town. San Diego yeah. is a military town. But you could do it anywhere. You could do it anywhere. In that right now, if you had an American wrestler go out and be a Democrat or Republican... He would only be a heel to half the crowd, right? Because as far apart as, as those two things are, and we know all the reasons why, if you speak anything related to a Republican ideology to a Democrat, you're going to be a fucking heel and vice versa. Whether you're telling the truth or not, because Republicans are disgusting and Democrats are usually right. But nevertheless, if you get a foreign heel especially one that we, we've been mad at recently. The Germans have kind of become baby faces again. And he tells the truth about this country. You could have... Gender Mayhall, they really started booing him. He struck a nerve. He started to speak in Punjabi. And then when they booed him, he revealed that they just booed the words to the United States National Anthem. And that was heat right there when he said that. Yes. I was like, Ooh, if anyone's going to shoot him, it's now. <laughs> and if you had a guy like that come out and say you had a fucking criminal for your president, he's now being charged with fucking felonies. He's going to, to prison. This is all of you are disgusting criminal pigs. Then even the fucking Republicans 
or even the Democrats would get mad because, yes, Trump was a criminal pig, and we hope he is going to prison, but fuck you. You're pointing out in front of the world that, goddamn, that we elected a criminal fucking pig to be the president, and fuck you, your country's worse. You see where I'm going with this, no matter what the situation. An American can't do it, but a foreigner can. He can tell the truth about all the... It's the same thing as a heel going to town and knocking the local sports team for being losers only magnified millions of times over. You get a foreign heel that can talk and he can come out and tell the truth about everything that's wrong with the country and how that we're all at each other's throats because a bunch of people are ignorant, believe misinformation, and want criminals to be in charge, and I don't care what party you're on. You don't like that guy. And they'd have to bring him out of the building in bulletproof fucking cars. A, I don't think it would last very long because I think eventually it would get too much pressure about doing it that a, com oh, yeah. the a company networks, like CAA or, you know, yeah. uh, TKO will say we can't run with this, let alone the networks. No, this was this would have been good old time local wrestling where you'd started riots, but you can't do it on national TV because they're too touchy. The second thing is, and I thought this was the best I've ever seen Jinder Mahal, even though, again, the material may be somewhat questionable. It seemed to me like this was a one and done. Did you think like he was going to do more of this? I mean, they brought him out there and then he immediately got squashed. No, that's what I'm saying. They they only set this up purely as a bait and switch, you know, a, a tease where they announced a former champion was going to come and then surprise him with the rock and he gets to beat somebody up. But and do you think they, they were scared? I mean, the fact that they had to load this up so much to get a baby face pop, which I mean, they're going to get a massive pop for the rock. Do you think it was too much? No, because it was actually good for once, because normally it's the Miz coming out and making canned smart-ass remarks and then some legend coming out and beating him up until he switched babyface. This was somebody, you really wanted to see The Rock come out and beat the shit out of him by the time he got finished. It was fucking great. And it, and that's, that's the thing. I, I wrote, if this guy could work, he'd be the hottest heel in the company. And if The Rock had come out there and kicked his ass right away and grabbed the mic and said head of the table and walked out, it would have been great. Well, but... Instead, we had the worst of Brian Gewertz. You not only you not only had to get the quarter hour, but also you had to make up for the match that got cut short. And let's face it also, with the way that Raw goes these days, if you can get 20 minutes of The Rock, that's better than... Fucking 20 minutes. Of, if you promised everybody will come to your house and individually let you have sex with fucking strippers, they'd rather, I just want to see The Rock for 20 minutes. No, no way. Give me a break. All right, maybe half the audience. Mouse anyway, is here? I mean, come on. So when he went into Gender Mayhall, went into, and now I'm going to speak more Punjabi about what the rest of the world thinks of you, because he could say, he could say the entire rest of the world thinks you're all idiots. You had a buffoon for a leader. You, it turned you into a fucking clown show. You were a joke. Nobody respects you. You'll never get it back. Again, people would want to lynch this son of a bitch. But anyway, here comes the rock music, and the people lost their fucking grip. Did you see coats and things being flung in the air, and people hit their feet? Because... Well, it's San Diego. I don't know how many coats there were. Well, whatever the case, various... I saw things go up in the air. But to point it, maybe it was just people waving their hands and partying like they didn't care. But the point is, normally you would expect this to happen, but he had gone on long enough that I think they'd kind of given up on something like that happening. And then when they hit the music, they milked it great and the people lost their fucking minds. Coincidentally, at 9.56 p.m. Eastern when Rock started making his entrance, but by the time he finished milking and the chants and the cheers, he didn't speak for four minutes, so he spoke at the 10 o'clock hour. I mean, they're right on. They could time this down to a fucking hair's difference. And then Rock did his thing. He told Jinder Mayhall that he wasn't the Iron Sheik, that his Iron Sheik would say, Bubba, you ain't no good son of a bitch, jabroni bastard. This was so lame and so bad. You have to oh, call it out. Oh, come on. You have to call it out. It was so awful. 
It's it's the Rock. He he's can... lame. He's he's turned into a lameo. This is Hogan coming back in '93. He's he can lame. read a cookbook. It doesn't matter. This was the he, worst it material ever. It doesn't matter. Ever. He talked to the. It doesn't matter. Now you're sky. doing his promo. He talked to the sheik in the sky. He told Gender that he had a raging asshole face instead of a resting bitch face. He knocked his movie Baywatch. He defended America and got the USA chant going. And then he got the one side of the arena to chant day one and the other side of the arena to chant douchebag forever. They would, if he'd have said in 10 seconds, everybody on the left side of the arena is going to start blowing everybody on the right side of the arena. They'd have had to turn the cameras off. No, that wouldn't have happened. Why would they that be the anything. example? They no, won't they do wouldn't. anything he says. They're going to be so sick of this roided up idiot in a few weeks. You'll see. There was nobody in San Diego that was sick of anybody. They were day one douchebag, day one douchebag. Because the, the chant is fun. They're an audience that'll sing Seth Rollins' music until he lays down. Hey, but here's the uh, imagine that fucking. The average fucking Yahoo on the AEW roster came out in front of a full building in San Diego and said, I'm going to tell you what to chant and I want you to do it. No, this is literally what MJF was just doing a few weeks ago. I said it, the average douchebag. But I said it didn't work. I mean, uh. remember when MJF was doing that? Who did he do it with? We won one side of the arena, chant one thing and one side the other, and it bombed. Well, that's because he picked the wrong sides. But anyway, then he sang the national anthem with special words for gender. And that was too much, and Gender attacked The Rock. And The Rock made his comeback and hit a spine buster at a people's elbow, and Gender rolled out, and the crowd went insane. And that's when The Rock said he's going to go out to get something to eat. Should he sit at the bar? Should he sit at the booth? Or should he sit at the head of the table and a place go, ah, and he leaves? I'm telling you, he could go out there and finger paint with his own feces and the people. Why do you keep using these examples of blowing everyone just, and feces painting? And I forget what the other one you had. These was, are but. just examples of things that might could happen that he could do. And no, they would love it. This, these things might not can happen. These things will not be happening. If he did them, they'd love it. I, I <laughs> again, I don't even know how to combat this, but I think. The Rock coming out there, major pop, really cool moment. He's super over. I think taking Jinder Mahal's performance and everything out of this, The Rock saying head of the table, that's big. Because now everyone's wondering what's going to happen. The material in between was horrible. It was horrible. He was blown up. He looks unhealthy big. Well, it was a 16-minute segment. I remember what he looked like at his peak. He looks unhealthy big. Well, and... By the way, I have I think that may be a sign that we might be going to see something in April. Well, the question is, are we going to see something in April or are we going to see something before April? Because didn't word come out that Australia, when they were paying all this money to get a big WWE pay-per-view there for the first time, they said they wanted The Rock? Does Australia have that much money? I believe so. Because think about it, Rock, 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 Rock Reigns. Rock Roman, Reigns. Well, you know, that'd be, there you go when his brother gets in, breaks into business. There's Rock Reigns. Roman Reigns and The Rock could be this generation's Andre and Hogan. I don't know that, I don't know that The Rock might necessarily want to do it at anything but WrestleMania, and I don't see how in the world they would want to present it at anything but WrestleMania. It's about money. I mean... How does Saudi Arabia keep getting a lot of these big things? Well, they want to pay more money for this kind of thing on their okay, show. Okay, what the fuck is Australia laundering Saudi Arabia's money? How the fuck does Australia have more money than Saudi Arabia? If it's up, just up to money, how's Saudi Arabia not going to get it? Well, again, different country. I'm not going to go into how much oh, money every country has. Now you're singing. I'm, I'm saying right now that, that Saudi Arabia's money can kick the shit out of Australia's money. Well, we well, shall see. Four million people and thirty million sheep down there, right? Or is that New Zealand? I forget. Let me ask you a series of questions. Should the Rock be the one to end the bloodline or end Roman Reigns' title run? Oh, boy, that, I don't think that can be. Well, not to end the title run. Not to end the title run. It. <laughs> we talked about this a few months back. Yeah, you remember? it can't be a. It can't be a one-word answer, but. I don't think anybody would want to see The Rock lose, and I think it would detract from people's enjoyment if he did. 
I think he would almost have to beat Roman Reigns, but I think at the same time, as I believe I said, that it can't be for the title because that wouldn't do any good for anybody because then he's got to come back and drop it. And would it have to be the catalyst, the impetus, or some major cog in a wheel of Roman Reigns turning babyface at the same time with a a nemesis on the horizon that could take the take his heat and and let people acknowledge him for real at 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 some point. Roman Reigns is part time, I guess we could say right now. The Rock wouldn't even be that. I guess that would be my biggest issue with it. The Rock is a major star. Yeah. And he should win major matches at WrestleMania. I don't think just big stars should just lose all the time to younger wrestlers. However, this is a different situation. Cody's been built up, not even throwing other people in there like Punk or Randy Orton or anyone, but Cody specifically has been built up for this. For The Rock to be the one to beat Roman would defeat that, but for Roman to beat The Rock... Do you do that at WrestleMania? I guess you have two nights. I mean, you need something. I don't, I don't think you do it. I don't think you do it. You can't. Very. It, it, somebody's going to be disappointed regardless. Does it help the person who beats Roman if Roman beats The Rock to get there? Yes. Because, I mean, that would. He would have everybody on his resume at that point. Is there anything to be said for. Actually, there's not. Is Cody needs to beat Roman to to finish his story, right? But with all due respect to Cody and anybody else, the biggest money match possible in the, in the world is The Rock and Roman Reigns. And Cody Cody has already been beaten by Roman, so you wouldn't want it to happen again. But to be the second guy to beat Roman Reigns does not carry the same cachet, but we've been wrong about these things before when we're putting that fine a point on it. Does Roman lose to The Rock at WrestleMania if that takes place? And then, because of some rift with the wise man and Solo and whoever the wise man may be in cahoots with, does Roman then either lose to Cody and be cast out to Obscurity Island by his wise man and and his new henchman, and that way you get two jobs out of Roman, but now he comes back to get even with the people that have wronged him, and it kind of, and Cody's got the belt, and he's uh, Roman's off in a different direction. As of today, as we are recording, Jim, WrestleMania Night 1, Saturday, April 6th, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Lincoln Financial Field, There are 57,225 tickets distributed with 1,685 available right now. Night one. Night one. Night two, 57,279 distributed, 1,631 available. So they're almost sold out for what's currently allocated as of right now. I imagine they can get more people in there if they want to, but but more important, we're not even talking about ten or twenty thousand people at this point. We're talking about again rights fees, the cock, uh, who's subscribing to that or where that might go in the future to get a chance to see Roman Reigns and The Rock live. Would you sign up for four ninety nine a month when you used to be have to pay fifty dollars or whatever? So there's a lot more importance now to to the match around the, the the country and the world that's being broadcast rather than even a stadium show live when you get to that level. All right. Well, that was The Rock's return to WWE Monday Night Raw. We I think you're, ju- you're just an anti-Rockite. You know, I want to like him because I used to like him. It's just his material sucks and he's lame and he looks like he's putting on a show and he never used to. He was a ridiculous character talking and acting in a ridiculous way. It never seemed completely fake like it does now. And we've seen enough of his good guy act in public that it kind of doesn't work anymore. And he's coming out there doing lame material. The national anthem thing was lame. Whoever wrote that, Brian Gewurz or whoever, it was lame. It was terrible. All of his material was terrible. They set him up by having a guy established himself quickly as a nuclear heat heel, and then they brought him out there to do the worst material ever. 
I'm just saying that he can't be as serious as he once was about it because everybody knows him as a rock st- as a rock star, as a movie star and as a football team owner and as a tequila magnate. And he's coming out and he's doing his version of the tongue is in the cheek because everybody knows I'm making a cameo here. But he's still so over, they don't care. We'll see how long it lasts. Again, he's kind of in a weird position right now where the last few years, the the bomb that was Black Adam, everyone finding out publicly the damage he did to the DC studios or DC's movie arc. I really don't know. I'm a Marvel guy. And then the football league, which has been a bomb. <laughs> and now he's coming back to this. Got a lot of criticism for the thing with him and Oprah. We'll see. Again, the more he's around, the more I think people may turn if this is the kind of material. But he's going to get major pops everywhere he goes. I'm I mean, not he, disputing his star power. I'm disputing every single thing he fucking says. He's not going to be around in the WWE often enough for anybody to get tired of it. That's my prediction. We are in the future, but we're still tired, ladies and gentlemen. We have more wrestling, much, much more, much more, much more <laughs> wrestling. <laughs> of those gimmicks do you have surrounding you in your office there at last manor where you have the keyboards and the xylophones and the marimbas and kalimbas and uh, yo mambas and and, charge. and the, the, the charger you've got uh <coughs> you've got uncle teddy going up the stairs um oh that didn't work what, how do you house this I, I picture you as as Lon Chaney Sr. in the Phantom of the Opera surrounded by a gigantic pipe organ. Oh, man, that's how I picture myself, too. Well, would you put your mask back on, fella? All right. I don't mean cover your mouth. I mean cover your entire face. And I'll put my organ away. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you have had many comments on your organ. <laughs> I'll have you know. And once again, as if, everyone what knows, heard? what's... <laughs> What's better than roses on a piano, two lips on an organ? Well, now we're in the mood, ladies and gentlemen, and what gets you in the mood more for AEW wrestling than talking about playing with one's organ? Because <laughs> what else is AEW than someone playing with their organ on national TV? Jim, <sighs> AEW's big pay-per-view event, World's End, a new pay-per-view event from the Nassau Coliseum, Uniondale, Long Island, and it took place a few days ago. Well, December 30th was the official date. If you want to call time of death, that was uh, for World's NDA as the guy had the sign in the crowd and et cetera. And let's talk, Kenny, you want to talk a, a little bit about booking philosophy and 101, Brian, a little, a little bit of that at the start of this thing. You know, Tony's the booker of the year. He's going to be just decimated if he doesn't win that thing. There's no way he's going to win for 2023. Well, I mean, it's meaningless to begin with, but you know what I'm saying. But do you want to talk real booking the way real bookers would book the booking? I think that's what a lot of the listeners would like to hear, yeah. How much booking would a booker book if a booker could do all the booking? Two hours of TV a week. No, I'm I'm (laughs) fine. The first match on the pay-per-view was an eight-man tag team match, and the... The uh, reasoning behind this match was it was all the tournament participants, all eight of them, that didn't make it to the finals, like the other two guys, which we'll talk about shortly. That's the only reason. So, so naturally, the, after they've all wrestled each other in round robin fashion over and over, now well, they're clamoring to see an eight man tag match with, and they just pick sides, right? I'm a like, what the fuck? It's like a small show in the south in the. 50s. Like, here's the opening match, here's the second match, now they're going to have a tag team match, and now everyone's going to have a battle royal. <laughs> yeah, but there was umpteen more matches and plenty of other mouths to feed on this card. And But here's the... Because Tony's mind works very fast all the time. I think that's a problem. It never does slow down, so I'm sure he thought this was going to be fabulous. But let me ask you this. The match was Brody King and Jay Lethal and Rush and Light Switch. um, Slingshot. Slingshot, Jay White. I started to say ping pong. Light Switch. Whatever. (laughs) 
versus Claudio Castagnoli, Mark Briscoe, Daniel Garcia, and Brian Danielson. And as I said, the the whole causality of having an eight-man tag match, because these were the eight guys that didn't make the finals of the tournament, but now it, it, looking at it from a business perspective, rather than just Tony thinking that would be cool, right? From somewhat of a professional standpoint, did that? I did. I forgot. Did they even announce this match was going to happen ahead of time on the pay per view? Because they they were still firming it up the Wednesday before on television. But was this advertised ahead of time? It was. I just don't remember how far ahead of time it was. Okay, certainly, certainly not more than like five days ahead of time, but I think it was. Well, because they they have another eight man tag team match later on in the show involving Sting and Darby Allen and th that whole angle that we'll talk about with Jericho and a whole nine yards. Oh, yeah, that whole angle with Jericho. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and so now they've got an eight-man tag team match to open up the pay-per-view where later on Sting in his final appearance in New York in front of, they had a full house, was it 12,000 people or whatever it was, He's in the second eight-man tag match of the night. So we're having dinner before we have dinner again. And this match, this first eight-man, is a cold match. Only They're only connected, any of them, because of the tournament. If, think about how do you want to expose your talent and, and your featured talent, your top talent. I'm not even suggesting Tony Khan push different people. I'm going by the television that he does and who his main event people are in his mind in this match, don't you want at least one of them, one of them to come out better than, than they did going in? If, if, if nobody bought this pay-per-view specifically to see this eight-man tag, I think you'll agree that's a fair assumption, right? If it was or wasn't on the card, was not going to affect the buy rate of the pay-per-view. It was an add-on. And except maybe it probably would have done great business in Sandy Fork because of the Briscoe family. But otherwise, so if you're just, you're opening the show and you want to do something positive for one of your talents, a main event talent that you happen not to have a spot for for whatever reason on this show, to feature him in a main event money match, at least build for the future. Make him look good in some fashion why instead of and this thing by the way they were 30 minutes into the show before this was over with and it just wouldn't end would you agree with that assessment if you even paid any attention after a while that it just wouldn't end yeah it went on a long time i mean it was an opening eight-man tag and everyone has to do their thing you have to give it time to breathe and <laughs> It went a long time. It, it certainly got it got CPR in an oxygen tank. It was having no problem breathing. It breathed forever. I love WWE shorter pay per views. I know WrestleMania is one of the longer ones, and maybe the Rumble will be too. But the pay per views they've done that have been like three hours or whatever it's been, or feels like three hours lately, have been such a breath of fresh air. When you know it's going to be like four or five hours, some of these matches don't need to be there. Well, yeah, they'd already done the hour that they always do before the show, the pre-show, before the show. So they've had dinner before they've had dinner. And then they put the eight man on first and they go 30 minutes. So everybody involved in this thing does so many moves that, you know, the rest of the card is somewhat hampered just by unless they grow another set of arms or legs, what to do. But why not do something positive for someone instead of this mess. And if you, it was three hours and 50 minutes this show. So if they needed to go 30, then they could have had two matches in this spot. But why Brian Danielson wasted in a no money match? He's a, a main event guy. Why would you not say, okay, we're, we're going to do something. If Brian Danielson, did they hide him in an eight man? Cause he certainly doesn't look like he's being hidden that much, but did they hide him in an eight man because he was injured and doesn't can't go to singles? In which case, as we saw the other night on raw, you can get a concussion from a fucking drop kick. So maybe he shouldn't be working in the opening fucking match at all. 
But if he is okay and not banged up, have Danielson and Claudio in a European rules match and let him give the people some fancy wrestling for 12 minutes that both of them would look like athletes and put Danielson over. Or if you're supposedly pushing a fucking sling blade, what's his name? Switch shot? Switch shot. Uh, switch, whatever the fuck. Jay White. Straight shot. Straight shot. If you're pushing Jay White, him and Mark Briscoe in a singles match, I think that they may have had in the tournament. It doesn't matter. They got to ask for a rematch. The loser did. Did you know who the loser was? And let Mark get over as a baby face, but then put Jay Switchblade over by cheating and get some heat on him because you're pushing this guy for whatever reason. Or is it possible that you could give the people a feel-good opening match for 12 minutes and have Mark Briscoe beat Jay Lethal and tear the fucking house down and get his hand up for once, and the people would have probably given him a standing ovation. And it would have done something positive. It would have opened the show on some type of professional note without having it. it was it just, oh, I feel bad because I didn't book these guys on the pay-per-view? What the fuck? There's 14 other fucking matches. I think, I think it was Tony's long-term plan because he loves the tournament that he came up with to have the people that weren't in the finals have a big match at the end. That's what I think. <sighs> you want to talk about booking philosophy? I think that was Tony's booking philosophy. Well, anyway, um, so yeah, so they had an eight man before they had the eight man with actual money drawing stars in it. And Garcia is the one who got the pin for their team beating lethal. And here's another thing. Brody King is in the house of black, right? Well, none of his house is around. He's completely on his own. He's standing. To, it, how does it get the groups over? How does it make the groups look when one of their guys is completely disconnected from them and just having random matches with other people as partners? Aren't they, aren't they renegades? Aren't they people who don't do what the man tells them to do over that at the house of black? Why didn't he just turn out the lights? Yeah, and and slink off. He does that at all other times. Why not here? Same thing for uh, Kill Switch. Um, Jay White was supposed to be a juice is hurt, right? Where's the guns? But he had a group. He had, he had one of the larger groups. And it, no, he's just teaming with random. Jay Lethal, my God. He was part of a goddamn mob scene surrounding Jeff <laughs> Jarrett. <laughs> Police used to come up and tell him to break it up at ringside. It was such a fucking crowd. <laughs> but he's not with his people. Garcia's with the BBC. Is that a, so is Claudio, but is that a thing? And, he, and Danielson. Well, no, no, Garcia's not. Garcia's. Oh, what if Gar, wait, Garcia wasn't. That he's was with the, the French Canadians. I thought you were going to say the French connection. That's right. Yuda's with the, but Claudio and Danielson were in the BBC, but have they broken free of the, the web of the evil cult leader, Plummer Moxley? No, I don't think they've acknowledged yet that this was a horrible idea from the beginning. The Blackpool Combat Club. And the telltale sign was when the guy from Blackpool quit the company. <laughs> that was like the chance to change this into something realistic as opposed to, I like these guys, let's walk to the ring together. We're cool, we're the thing together. I bleed, they uh, don't. Uh... I think that would have been like the governor of Texas that sent Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch a letter saying, hey, take our state out of your name. <laughs> but anyway, so... Have any yes. of them been to Blackpool? That's one of my questions in this. Have any of them ever stepped foot in Blackpool? I don't know. A couple of them have spent some time in a cesspool, but... So that was the start of the pay-per-view. Uh, in thir about 30 minutes in, it was finally over, and Garcia beats poor Jay Lethal, who apparently was trying to lay down for the fucking popcorn vendor on his way out after the show that night. And uh, do you have any comments that we even need to dignify this? No, I'm bored with a lot of this, and I said it before, I'm not really that excited about Danielson matches lately. They had him buried in this match, and 
Claudio's been boring me. I hate the way Briscoe's used. Oh, and, and by the way, I think this this followed a battle royal on the pre-show, from what I read. I believe it directly follows. They went from a 20-man battle royal down to a fucking to an eight-man tag team match. I Brody King, I think, could actually do something, but you either got to put him with the group or take him out of the group. Like, figure out what the fuck you want to do with him. Did you ever have the feeling that you wanted to go? Did you ever have the feeling that you had to stay? You wanted to go, but you decided to stay. Jimmy Durante. This was, though, I will say, from watching a lot of the online feedback as it happened, a lot of AEW fans started realizing, well, you know, that really wasn't the greatest opening match or the greatest <laughs> match here on the show. And it never really recovered from that. There was never anything that was like, man, there it is, AEW. There was nothing. It just kind of kept this pace of banality all throughout the show. Here's part of the problem is, again, not even booking. Tony is not a performer, has never been a performer. That's fair to say, even though he's appeared on oh, television. He's, you, didn't he's see never, this, you didn't see this scrum, his performance. Well, no, there. no, no. And he's never been an in-ring performer, whether it be a manager and a, or an announcer even, or a, a directly involved, much less a wrestler. And he does not, this is just people doing moves. And a lot of these guys are very good at doing the moves in these matches because that's a lot of what they have on the indies where other marks book them. But it's hard to have any chemistry, whether you're all great workers, but there's four guys on each team. You can't tell a story. You don't have timing with everybody. You're trying to remember umpteen fucking spots. And it just gets repetitive and not. It doesn't showcase anybody to their best example. And I'm not talking about a, a eight or ten man war games match or some big main event spectacular like that. I'm just talking about random multi-man tag matches on the indies, which is what this was. <sighs> the indie audience is different than most wrestling audiences. AEW may have more of that audience than other people but what was booked by indie people with indie wrestlers on an independent show isn't necessarily reflective of the crowd that would attend a wwe show or maybe even some aew shows well exactly and that's why basically they've hit their ceiling uh, and and i'm sorry if it's controversial and we'll move on but if if they've hit their ceiling which they have on the indie wrestling fans because by its nature indie wrestling was not seen on national television now, indie wrestling is being seen on national television, and in all the United States of America, there's about 800,000 that wants to watch it regularly. And then whenever a CM Punk or some goddamn celebrity or milestone or whatever would hop along and, and come in, it would increase them a couple hundred thousand, and, and there you go. And that's what... Everybody's been trying to tell him he's burnt through so much talent because he didn't capitalize when he had opportunities. He picked some of the wrong talent to begin with because it tickled his indie uvula and, you know, and, and nobody gets over. He gets them under uh, moving on. The second match was that interesting to you. Miro and Andre with his manager, CJ Miro. It was certainly interesting to me because I had heard that Andrade was finishing up, knowing that Miro <laughs> has not exactly been a happy camper. <laughs> the weird booking where Miro and his wife are always doing some kind of angle where she leaves him or he's in love with God. I don't know what the fuck is happening, but it's clearly from their own minds. I didn't know what. It's a weird match. It's like in a vacuum. Here's a guy that Tony can't book with anyone because he only wants to do his shit versus a guy that has been desperate to leave this company to the point where he's punching people in the face <laughs> and he's about to leave the company. So yeah, I was interested in this. You weren't? No, that's what I'm saying. I was being sly. Were you interested in this? Because there was so many, so many ways it could go wrong, but no, that's, and by the way, did you see the statistic Miro for the year 2023 in AEW was six and O. Oh. He worked six times. <laughs> I did not see he that. He worked six times and did no jobs. 
How do you get this job? I'll show up when you do something with me and my wife. Nobody will understand what it is or even whether we like each other or not. And and it'll be confusing. It'll it'll be rare when it happens. WCW was never this lenient. I do what I don't even know if, if he's being lenient. I don't know whose idea is this. I mean, would would if the rumors are true that for like a year and a half or two years or however long it was, Tony was like, hey, Miro, I got this really great thing. I'm going to book you to lose to, let's just say, Hangman Page. And Miro was like, no, I won't do it. <laughs> All right, stay home. But, you know, <laughs> and then this continued. And now he's doing what he was doing in WWE, an angle with his wife that made no sense on the face of it, was ridiculous. She looks good, I got to say. She's Well, she's, she's she came back body. from, her, from oh. her hospitalization. She, you saw that, and she had the the. Uh, she, she had, had apparently a life threatening infection from getting a splinter in her finger, and was hospitalized and given, Lord knows how many antibiotics and probiotics and prebi all those biotics that the medical science people have these days, and had her finger there in the in the stylish black cast. So amazingly, she's come back from a near death experience. These tables are going to kill somebody. I'm telling you, but it, it, the the deal is that she has been trying to manage people and everybody that she's tried to manage, which or that wanted her to manage them, conveniently, who were all job guys, Miro would beat the fuck out of him. You'd never see him again. And then finally, old Andre, who's smarter than your average bear and a little tougher than the rest of them, he has stepped up here. And so she's managing him against Miro because we... Do, we don't know if what the fucking deal is with him. She's like, I want to do my own thing. And you know, the other thing is everyone knows who his wife is. So everyone knows like they're not romantic together. So like she's not with her husband, but she's also managing this other guy who there's Wait nothing Wait a minute, with. I thought that was his wife. Andrade's married to Charlotte, isn't he? No, no, no. I mean, CJ Miro is yeah. Miro's wife. I'm yeah. saying the other way. She came to the ring with Andrade against Miro. Well, yeah, but but it's purely business. But we the whole thing she's teasing with all these guys is I'm hot and flexible. What do you think that's supposed to fucking mean? Not I'm good with money. Well, it's just a negotiating tactic. Ah. And we don't we haven't heard that she has to follow through with it. It's just a tagline. Maybe maybe it's <laughs> who was it Tim <laughs> Ross said in four rooms? Maybe it's some kind of weird psychosexual game you two are playing. <laughs> but Wow, a Four Rooms reference. Very yeah, good. Well, you, know, you are an impressive man, I have to say. <laughs> but nevertheless, so the finish was not a mystery because it leaked that Andre was leaving effective pretty much immediately and is going to be a free agent. But Miro jump-started it and kicked the shit out of him, and then Andre made a half-hearted comeback. And then I started zoning out because it went way too long for these guys, whether they were trying or not. Uh, but finally, Andre got the figure eight a la Charlotte. And old CJ leaned underneath the ropes and jerked her own man, Andre's arms out from under him. And it flattened him out, so he immediately... Let's go of the hold of this big Bulgarian beast that he's got and stands up and looks at her with a shocked look. Like, How could you do this to me and help your husband? <laughs> and then and then he turned right around and, and, you know, completely open and blind and fucking turned right into the big old kick. Boom. And got a two count. It was a two count. They can't even do a fuck finish or they fuck up fuck finishes. Right. I thought that was going to be the finish. Well, if Creed should have been because he gets a two count and then Miro gets the fucking camel clutch and old Andre taps out. And I guarantee you it Miro ate. He can't be in any way smart to the wrestling business, even after the background that he has, the big company, et cetera. Because I guarantee you that he insisted, no, I thought he's leaving. He must tap out to... <laughs> I sound like Sheik now more than Miro. But... It didn't sound anything like Miro. It didn't even sound like The Rock doing the Sheik. 
Well, how about Sheik doing The Rock? How would you like to hear that? Humbling him. Well, you want to hear the Sheik doing The Rock? No. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> he... <laughs> so, so what would have helped this thing and whatever the fuck it is, is if CJ had actually led to the downfall of Andrade. But instead... She just got a false finish, and then Miro just turned him over and got him to tap out with the camel clutch, like every other fucking jabroni. So, like I said, they fuck up fuck finishes, where people leave with a completely different... They know he won, but it's completely different fucking... What's the word I'm searching for? Sense of feeling of how it happened that leads you to manipulate your emotions in a certain way. What the fuck is that bitch? Whatever the fuck. And then, instead of... Normally, you would see CJ would come in and hug him or raise his hand or cup his balls and check his fucking oil. I don't know. But instead, she never got in the ring. And they never spoke to each other. They looked at each other, and she just wandered around the outside of the ring. And... Well, that settles that. She kind of gestured like Vanna White... (laughs) To the people at ringside, or, you know, I don't know what that was. That is what she did. (laughs) And Miro just stood there and huffing and a-puffing. And so, I... Thank you for coming, Andre. Uh, You're (laughs) about to be significantly upgraded, I would imagine. You know, I had heard, and I guess other people had heard, that Andre... uh, Andre... Andrade El Idolo was leaving before the match, before the pay-per-view. If you remember WrestleMania, I guess, 20 at Madison Square Garden, they booed Brock Lesnar and Goldberg the fuck out of the building because they found out they were both leaving. It was like, boo, you know, you don't want to be here. Fuck you. Yeah. No one gave a shit here in this building. (laughs) They just watched it like a match. Not like, oh, this is the last we're going to see Andrade here. No, they just had no reaction to any of that news. Whatever that means. And to be fair, they uh, the Nassau Coliseum in Long Island, which uh, that's where they were, correct? That is correct, my old that, hometown that, arena. But that is a notoriously hard building. I've talked about it. I talked about it when I when we were there for Crockett. I, when I worked there for the WWF, when you would have thought that you know they're not as expressive there as most places. But in in some cases, they. They had no fucking reason to be here. Uh, And uh, anyway, should we go on now to the next contest, Brian? Well, that's two matches. So far, people at home who are hardcore AEW fans, from what I saw online, are like, when's this show going to pick up? Well, it didn't pick up here because the next match was the Women's Championship with Timeless Tony Storm versus Riho. Jesus. God, you all right? I'll be okay, kid. There was no editing applied to that, ladies and gentlemen. That's actually what you just did. Amazing. I just just thought I'd see what I... So, again, that was better than this fucking match. What? (laughs) How does Kenny... Kenny... Our friend Kenny... How does he have this much pull with Tony Khan? And why, if you had this much pull, would you use it for this with a billionaire, for fuck's sake? If you can talk Tony Khan into using this poor, mousy little, innocent-looking, totally oblivious and unprepared featherweight fucking minute microscopic amoeba of a girl as a professional wrestler you can get somebody to do any goddamn thing can't you could he just walk up to tony and say tony start turning cartwheels across the goddamn floor i think if tony hired you you would be able to get any of your friends hired get them booked if you get to be really good friends with tony you could probably book your own shit i mean the sky's the limit with tony Khan. Well, the problem is I don't have any friends that are under fucking 50, except for you. 
I ain't working. You don't there. want booked either. I'm not working there. All right. So anyways, uh, so apparently next on the agenda is a serious push for a trained kangaroo on this program. And uh, poor Tony Storm. What? Uh, I mean, it, at least again, I think we might have said it earlier on the uh, talking about the TV show. They have a couple of girls that will get over to some degree and attract some level of their audience in the United States. Timeless Tony Storm probably being right now the preeminent example. The people won't totally just go, Pfft. but Jesus Christ, this is embarrassing. And, uh, and counting the video package they did on it, 16 minutes. And finally, Tony Storm hits some fucked up looking finish, to be honest. I don't know how that you can, it's, it would be like trying to work with a goddamn medium-sized rutabaga. How can you even give Riho any moves uh, that she's so small? It... Anyway, you didn't watch any of that, did you? I, I did watch it. It wasn't good. Tony Storm is entertaining. Like, I wish she was, like, outside of wrestling, just like, you know, today on the Drew Barrymore show, time was Tony Storm. And then, like, who's this wacky character? And then she's on, like, The Tonight Show next week or different things outside of wrestling. Okay, I got it. It would be really entertaining. It's horrible on this wrestling show. Um, They've just, gone too far. It's horrible. Riho sucks. Whoever doesn't think she sucks, it's like watching your own kid perform in a talent show or something. <laughs> it's like you're waiting for them to do something. Yeah, yeah. The other person has to do everything. Tony Storm was like Kota Ibushi wrestling a doll. You have to do everything because this person can't, she's not good at this. And she doesn't even have like expressions or anything. <laughs> like expressions. Like nothing. Like she gets kicked in the gut. She's like ready to just go run somewhere else. Like well, nothing. Of course. She always looks like the, the deer is looking at the headlights and you're bearing down on it. The hard truth, despite Mercedes Monet possibly being about to sign, AEW should have never had a women's division. AEW still shouldn't have a women's division. Just because WWE did doesn't mean you should. There isn't the talent there. There isn't the reason to devote that television time to something that's going to drive away the portion of your audience, never increase it. And AEW, it never gets better. It never gets better. If you want to test it out, give them their own show. But it dra it's the bathroom break on Dynamite. It drags down... Every show it's on, it's the bathroom break on the pay-per-views, too. What's the point of it? Is it just to appear? Well, sir, the point of it is pe people have to goddamn violate their bowels and empty their bladder at some point, Brian. That's the point of it. I guess so. I mean, how do you divide? I don't know. Forget, <sighs> Forget it. <laughs> the next match, Brian... Let me ask you what you think this did for anybody's business. Swerve Strickland versus... Now, I should preface, it was supposed to be that red-hot angle finally coming to a boiling point with Swerve Strickland versus Keith Lee. Remember, because Swerve broke a cinder block over him about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. As we recall, barely, only because it was so preposterous at the time that you could double stomp a goddamn cinder block into a fat man's belly and it would powderize itself instead of the belly being ripped asunder. Nevertheless, they're finally going to have a match. And then earlier in the day or the day before, whenever it was, Keith Lee is injured. He apparently got injured on the Ring of Honor pay-per-view that apparently happened at some point. And is the, should we just call it, should we call it on Keith Lee and everybody go home? It doesn't look like the rain's going to let up. What do you think? I don't know. I'm trying to remember where it was. I read an interview or quotes with him from a few days before. And it was like, I'm really banged up, I'm hurting, but I'm doing everything I can to make it to the pay-per-view. And then they announced he was off the pay-per-view. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what to think. I mean, 
I liked him in NXT. Whatever issues he had on the main roster under Vince McMahon as the Bearcat, who knows? Uh, but he got I'll the, tell you what, Bearcat Lee looks good from what he's done the last two years. But he got to AEW, and in that time, I mean, the only thing he had going, I guess, was the tag team with Swerve. And then they broke up and never did anything again other than Rick Ross called him a big motherfucker on live TV. <laughs> and then they had no feud. That was it. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just realized something. They have made history. <laughs> never before in the history of the wrestling industry since television went on the air and was invented has the shining most memorable moment of a wrestler's career with a promotion on television being have been being called a motherfucker. <laughs> you know, and then the other thing he was trying to get there, and then Tony Khan said he wasn't cleared. So what exactly is the injury? What wasn't he cleared to wrestle for? I don't know, but remember, and I'm not making fun of this guy's health and injury. I'm saying perhaps this is not going to work. Remember, he was off for months and months with a COVID-related problem. And then he's been injured multiple times. And as well, he his weight seemed to fluctuate somewhat, let's say that. And he's getting he's in his late 30s. We've looked that up. It might be that he's starting to damage himself with, with not a large element of return on the horizon, especially the way that these imbeciles have booked him. And that, to be honest, he apparently insists on talking like he talks in the promos, which doesn't do him any favors. And it, the, the, we've seen his matches for the last year or two, whether it's injury or illness related, a couple of amazing feats of agility for a guy that size and a lot of slow nothing and the slow nothing has been increasing and the feats of agility have been decreasing so anyway nevertheless keith lee was not involved in this it was dustin rhodes that red hot goddamn program um and i i wrote at the time as you know as soon as they're coming to the ring i said okay at least this is going to be a better match, and Dustin Rhodes will lead this thing, and we're going to see how good Swerve really is without doing the aggressive parkour and the excessive tumbling that he sometimes finds himself getting lost in the weeds with when he, one of with one of his age generation, right? I'm thinking this will be a real good old-fashioned wrestling match with a fucking professional like Dustin Rhodes leading it. Boy, howdy, they're going to tear the building down. I didn't realize they were going to do an angle in a fucking cold match to make Swerve now not only a baby terrorizer, but the most popular legend mutilator in fucking... If it takes you 20 minutes to mutilate a legend. Well, but it, it, this and, went and, a long time. Yes, and at the same time, they did a, a they did a hospitalization angle, followed by a twenty minute match, which was and good was, for what it was. <laughs> but no, there was there's a reason for this. So let me tell the people because I'm sure most of you listening did not see this. Before Dustin can step through the ropes, Swerve jump starts it and knocks him to the floor and posts him and runs him into the rail a couple of times and into the stairs and gives him a running knee into the stair sandwich type of maneuver. What a maneuver. Pulls out a cinder block. Prince Nana holds Dustin's ankle on the cinder block. Swerve gets up on the apron, milks it forever. Dustin is he's, he's having to lay there and keep his leg on the cinder block. And then he does the double stomp off the apron onto the ankle on the cinder block, which breaks. It doesn't powderize at least this time, but it does break. And nobody was trying to help. The referee was standing there, mouth agape, arms akimbo. Dustin sold the ankle big, but then suddenly, as soon as the guy who was standing in front of the firing squad has been shot, the fucking doctor rushes in to see if he can save him. 
Why didn't you say, wait, don't shoot, mother... All the doctors and the referees are checking the guy with the fucking obviously broken leg because how would the bone not break if the cinder block did? And I'm thinking, do the uh, swerve is the most popular baby face or most popular heel in wrestling. The people like him, but do they, do they want to cheer him? So he terrorizes infants and cripples legends. What is the psychology behind this? Right. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking Dustin's going to be taken out and somebody's going to come in to, you know, take up for him and get even for him or whatever that's going to lead to a big match with Swerve. Maybe they'll shoot an angle or whatever. And the doctors and the referees are helping Dustin to the back and Swerve's standing there in the ring. And Dustin turns around and he wants to go back. And now they've been helping him. Now they turn around and they're helping him limp to the fucking ring. What? Wait, what the fuck? I understand breaking loose from goddamn people and running back to the ring, but when you have the people that are helping you because you can't walk, say, no, turn me around. Tave, help me back. I'm, I can't walk, but fuck it. I'm going back in there. And they do it, including the doctor that's so concerned with the health and safety of the athletes in the safest wrestling company in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and Dustin rolls in the ring and talks to the referee forever. And I'm thinking, I'm seriously, what? No, they can't. And Dustin pulls himself up to his feet. And the referee rings a fucking bell. And now I'm thinking after a hospitalization angle, they're going to have a match. And it went again on and on. I won't even bother to tell you the preposterosity and the ludicrousness is success of, and I mean, Dusty, he was making a comeback. He got false finishes. They went back and forth some. He got to punch Nana. Nana took a nice bump. Dusty did all kind of shit. It, it, with it, and then finally the finish was swerved, kicked him that sideways kick in the head twice and hit the double stomp off the top. One, two, three in the flattest finish to the stupidest angle that I've ever seen. The, it, it, actually, it was, it was 10 minutes bell to bell after the, the whole rigmarole with the uh, cinder block and the attack and the breaking of the ankle and et cetera. But what the fuck are they doing? This is the point where I had to take a break from the show. I was watching it on DVR and I said, fuck it. I went and, and did, I can't even remember what I did for a couple hours, but I didn't want to see any more of this. What uh, helped me with this? Why? You could have either done the angle or done the match. Or done the angle after the match. I mean, you didn't have to do it this way. <laughs> or if you were going to do the angle and then the match, the match had to be like 30 seconds. Dustin did a great job. I'm not saying anything about, I'm not saying Dustin didn't do a great job. He was great. No. He's always great. It's the reasoning behind all of this that makes no sense. Again, Swerve is becoming a bigger and bigger babyface by just being a heel, which says a lot about the fan base there. But it doesn't help him too, even though he won and he beat up Dustin. It took him forever to do it. And this also may not have been the place in the card. This was the place in the show to do this if it was five minutes or less. Not if it was this long, coming after everything we had just seen. Well, there's more to see. The eight-man tag team match number two that was put together from the angle on Wednesday night, Dynamite, where the people just ran in and out and were routed and left and other people came to attack and take their place. Remember with staying in Jericho and Darby Allen and Sammy and Starks and big bill and Hobbs and take a shit and the Don Fallis organization. Shammy. 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 And the, of course, Wednesday night, as we mentioned earlier in this broadcast, if, if you hadn't heard it, if you haven't already heard, you will hear, like Nick Goulas used to say. Th this was before the Jericho um, controversy became a thing on social media. So on Wednesday night, he was 
they were just kind of, huh, okay. But tonight, they, it's all sunk in on them. And they gave him the entrance first. And, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, the people were still singing. Is it possible the song, they still like the song, but they hate the singer? Don't hate the sin, hate the sinner, or what is that old saying? But They like audience participation. Well, Anything there you with, go. This is a the era of audience participation, whether it's The Rock making them say corny things or whether it's an awful song by an aging wrestler. They just want to participate. Watch how you bandy the word corny around. But so, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. How they, they, they had the music up loud, and uh, they had lots of singing. And when they cut the sing they cut the music, there was some singing, and then the booze started. But then they quickly transitioned to Sammy's music. And I think they were pretty goddamn blase either way, to be honest, on whether Sammy walked out there or not, in my estimation. I don't know that the people were really stirred in, in their loins one in a positive or negative fashion. He's the perfect example of someone who's been booked under because he switched back and forth so many times. When the fans were ready to accept him as a babyface, whatever, the way he was booked, the way he was used, his no, behavior. No, remember, remember he was starting it over as a heel and he hurt himself and he was booked like an idiot. He was starting it over as a babyface and that's when people found out that he really was kind of a dick in person. And then it was him and his wife, and they were a heel combo that the yeah. fans really did hate. And now he's back, and he has a baby, so that makes him a baby face, I guess. Well, yeah, certainly, you know, can you imagine if they'd have kept her on TV, coming out pregnant, being a real bitchy fucking whining moan? Oh, my goddamn, my goddamn ovaries hurt, and oh, my goddamn hemorrhoids. Don't give them ideas, please. Well, it's too late now. They'll Let's try it with someone else. Well. I can't, I, there are apparently a lot of people in that company are trying to get other people pregnant. But anyway, back to this match. So then Sammy's entrance stopped while he was still in the aisleway. He's partners with Jericho, he go, but they just transitioned to Darby, and Darby's music played for like 15 seconds, and he stopped on the ramp to wait for Sting. And then Sting's music plays, and it's the biggest babyface reaction of the combination for a 65 year old man because he's the biggest star but why i understand when baby faces stop on the ramp to wait for their partners when the heel team is in the ring you don't want to get in outnumbered but sammy his entrance got cut off and darby just got 15 seconds to wait until his big brother sting came out so that he could i guess ride him piggyback there was no single spotlight for these guys with their own team in the ring that makes no sense and then stark's music and here comes him and large william and then the phallus family and we mentioned it was slapped together you know on the wednesday night tv after they had gotten the news about kenny having problems with his guts after the issue with the painting well and and you know but jericho was originally going to be with kenny against the tag team champions and blah, blah, blah. So they had to start from scratch with all of that chaos. And here again, we mentioned in the preface on Jericho from the start of it, they, the, the fans clearly liked a couple of people in the match. They clearly didn't give a shit whether a couple of people in this match were in it. And they definitely didn't want to approve of anything that Chris Jericho did. So as a result, when Sammy tagged Jericho in, they booed. And the spinneroonie with Sammy and Jericho's pose, they booed. But then... And it wasn't a Don Callis, Dominic Mysterio booing where people were smiling. It was a statement booing. And no, it was like, oh, just a steady, ooh, we don't want you. We, ooh, we want you to hear this. And then, But then other guys would get in. And by the way, what was Big Bill trying to do to Jericho, though? Was he trying on purpose to pick him up just randomly and throw him in the air and drop him on his head to get over with the crowd? Because he did it like twice where you didn't know what he was trying to do and Jericho didn't look like he could, knew how he was supposed to land. 
if you watch this match with the idea that the people wrestling Jericho are pissed at him just like the fans are and don't want to be in there with him, you can come away from it believing that. <laughs> Ricky Starks giving him the middle finger and getting out of the ring while the fans oh. cheer him doing it. <laughs> I mean, that was an amazing moment. Oh my God. It, anyway, <laughs> I don't know what, maybe Bill was being paid under the table to try to take Jericho out, but that was sloppy at, at best. And then Darby and take a shit would get in there and they'd go a hundred miles an hour. And, you know, take a shit would stop him and do a spinning power bomb of some kind off the top rope. And I'm looking and people were on their fucking hands. And you would think they'd be, you know, they would ooh if it looked like somebody really got hurt. But they, the crowd was not, they, they actively wanted to appreciate staying his last time in New York. And they wanted to tell Jericho, fuck you verbally. And otherwise, there was no life to this match in the ring or in the crowd. And did you see the part where Big Bill and Hobbs get in there and, and grab Darby like the old hammock throw thing, right? Arms and legs. And they're standing there ready to throw him 20 feet across the ring, uh, you know, get ready, get set. And none of Darby's partners are even blinking an eye or making a move to try to stop it or to try to be blocked off by the referee or what. <laughs> They're just getting it over with. And then finally, Darby, oh, and they they chanted, we want Sting finally, right? As I think Darby took the hint, and he gave Sting a hot tag. It was actually a hot tag, miraculously enough. And the comeback was sloppy because he's 65. But it was the, they finally came back to life because that was the, he's the star. And then... <laughs> When Jericho came in to help Sting's come back, they started booing again and started chanting Kylie Ray and NDA and that stuff. Uh, you know, and they they then went back into more goddamn match. And it just, the action stopped for a second. Well, more than a second, but for a few minutes. And then it went back to being, there's there's no reaction. Until Jericho then hit a code breaker on Bill and got booed again. And that's one of the times where he, Big Bill picked him up and dropped him in a heap. And it was the dichotomy of where they were cheering and booing, not for a, a side to win or a team to win, but individual people that they liked or didn't like in the goddamn mixed up eight man tag match bullshit. And I'm not sure that take a shit should be having his shit no sold by fucking sting. They've just minimalized. Yeah. Why not? They've, they've done nothing right by him since he first got used as a heel and was getting over. And you were like, wow, there's your next top heel. This guy's great. And since that time he's been buried. Yeah. I don't even mean buried just in the booking buried in the background. And he doesn't know how to fight for himself, and English is his second language, so he needs it. Boy, can you imagine what Gary Hart would be doing with him right now? Can you imagine if instead of Gary Hart, the Great Muda was listening to Kenny and Don Callis and people no, like that? Boy. <laughs> I mean, that's the problem. But anyway, so, and then they, they had the part, uh, as I said, where... I think that was, yeah, Jericho gets in and puts the walls of Jericho on Hobbs and they boo. They boo the baby face for punishing the heel. But then Sting got the scorpion on take a shit right next to him and they cheered. And then Stark super kicked Jericho and they cheered. <laughs> and then Stark speared Sammy and they cheered. Um, and, and I'm like, well, whose side are they on? And finally, Sammy went up to the top and took a while and gave the shooting star press to Ricky Starks. One, two, three. Starks got beat by Sammy Guevara. Starks is one of the two people they actually responded to positively all throughout this man and Darby, three. And <laughs> Sammy, the guy that universally everybody was like, fuck. Or should I say... He gets the pin. And uh, did we notice? Did we notice that finally the only time the people actually stood up and cheered and showed appreciation 
was after the other team was out of the ring and everybody gave Sting his last hurrah. And Jericho, of course, was the last one to back out of the ring to do that. But that was the excitement was appreciating Sting for his last time in New York. This was, for a really, really bad match that fell apart, it was quite a spectacle. It was like one of those really bad matches you can't take your eyes off. Something has to improve it. Nothing ever improved it. And Jericho was the problem. The problem also is, when you have an audience that's more smart fans than family fans, I don't know what you want to call it, casual may not even be the word anymore. The people that get over aren't the people that, you're, you're, the baby faces aren't going to get over like baby faces, the heels aren't going to get over like heels. The people that are good at what they do and are used well are who are going to get over, or who they want to see used better. Yes, yeah, sometimes sometimes people get get over with the fans when they're used like shit out of sympathy. Well, Ricky Starks is a great example of that. Yeah. He's been booked like shit for a long time, and the fans chose him a while ago. They never gave up on that. Jericho, he got Sting booed. He had to get out of the rings. They were booing <laughs> Sting at the very end. They better figure out a way to deal with this. This isn't going away. And... Here's an update, and we'll tie this into the show somehow. But Nick Houseman has put out a tweet saying he has not walked back anything. Oh! That he's not the one who put the name Kylie Ray out there. And whatever he's referencing, he's not walking back. So this isn't going away. They better so figure out how they're going to deal with in it. In an unwieldy fashion, expressing sympathy for her name being drug into this, that he didn't do it. But he's not saying that he doesn't stand by any of his other reporting and is jericho gonna start i mean they're gonna pull jericho from dynamite they're in newark i think tonight it's the same market <laughs> it's the same market as the nassau Coliseum. oh those new jersey assholes i mean where's he gonna be able to work that people aren't gonna react to this if it's never addressed and never denied and doesn't go away and then if anything else trickles out if they're booking him on tv or doing anything with the idea that something could trickle out they're gonna look like fools if they know about it and if they pull him because they're waiting for something to come out, then what the hell's going on? This is a no-win situation for anyone involved. Did you have to say trickle out? You have a problem with trickle? Could it, could it have been just drip out? Trickle sounds so much more off-putting than drip. All right, well, we can go with drip. Ric Flair goes with the drip, apparently, when he's... uh. Doing whatever he's, scheme he's, he's up to. <laughs> dripping and wooing and winging and... Uh, speaking of... Speaking of trickling out, uh, the next match on the pay-per-view, and pay-per-view, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, means that we are supposed to pay for it, correct? They gave us, for the TBS title, Julia Hart versus Abandoned. I'm sorry, Abaddon. And the special stipulation for this match, because God knows they needed one, was biting is legal. On a show we're paying for that was nearly four hours plus the hour pre-show, they're going to do this to us. <laughs> and all I will say is that Abaddon needs to abandon wrestling before she gets hurt because I don't think she's cut out for this. It looks like trying to work with a bowl of stale pudding. She's going to get hurt. There's nothing. To, did you watch any of this? I didn't because I needed a break after that. Uh, that Jericho match was something I yeah. had it on in the background, but I had to see what the reaction online was to the Jericho match. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, moving alongward. Did anything happen? I mean, Julia won? I don't know. I don't care. I am i don't know if people were taken out with a spatula. Did you see that footage that was on Twitter of Julia Hart's entrance from like a fan cam or fan cam, a phone? I, I didn't. I did not. Did they, did they do some kind of upskirt type of situation? Or? She comes out on the stage. She's slowly singing her song with the lights going. The cameraman and the guy holding the cord are right in her face. <laughs> you know, you never think about what it looks like for the rest of the arena. Well, yeah, yeah. They're right in her face as she's slowly walking and lip syncing. 
And then the lights go out and you see her run as fast as she can <laughs> into the ring to get herself in position so that she's draped over the second rope with her hand in the air. You know, I don't know. What are they doing? What are they doing? <sighs> well, speaking of what are they doing? One of the matches I was looking forward to, unfortunately, again, let me down. Some of my almost peers, they're the the next generation down from me. Uh, the TNT title, no disqualification. That should have been the tip-off. I was just paying attention to the fact it was Edge versus Christian. Christian, of course, accompanied by Nick Plain and Nick Plain's mom. And I thought, okay, before I <clears throat> before I dwelled on the no DQ stipulation uh, right after Edge's entrance when the fight began on the stage slash ramp of the thing, I th two professionals, <laughs> again, two guys that can work their ass off if they want to, and they should have some element of psychology if they just use the ring. Boy, we'll see some of the element of the art of professional wrestling. And instead, because I get Edge is retiring, they want to have fun. They want to do they want to tickle the kids in the back, the indie wrestlers that did what they did because Edge and Christian came up with all this ladders, tables, and chairs bullshit and pretty much led to a goddamn ruination of the business now that I think about it. But they could have had a fucking match. But they didn't. And it, it, it lead, they're over, so it woke the fans up. I hated to see it because they're so much better than this type of thing. But the people wanted to see it. And they worked hard and they were serious, even though what they were doing in some cases was preposterous. And Edge is a hell's angel now. He looks like Don Fargo. But... From the start, when they were in the fucking ring, the crowd was chanting, we want tables. They they have partially led to ruining the fans because it's only, we want tables. We want fucking whatever the fuck. And then they run up into the general admission seats and they have the fight up the stairs and then the fight in one of the... What do you call the level there, Brian? Between the real cheap seats and the fucking lower cheap seats the fucking aisleway there the mezzanine reserved there you go and then edge jumps off one of the railings and cross bodies both because nick's up there too and they get the holy shit and then they do the fight walk down the stairs again i wrote i'd love them to start their match and they went back to ringside and got back in the ring Edge went for a spear, Christian sidestepped it, Edge went into the post, and they went back to the fucking floor. And I'm like, God damn it, God damn it, God damn it. Ah, I go to the next page of my notes. So then, apparently at that point, I guess it was a potato Christian gave kind of a curb stomp and effect thing to Edge's face on the stairs and rolled him in and got a two count, and it looked like it was a potato because Edge's eyebrow was not only busted open and bleeding, but it was swelling up like a, a goddamn potato over his eyebrow there. That I didn't see anything else that would have done that, so I think it may have been that stomp. I don't know. But and then Christian pulls out two kendo sticks, and I wrote, I've given up hope. And then Nick Plain threw in two chairs, and Christian sat one chair on top of Edge and posed with it, and then put the Boston Crab on Edge while sitting in the chair that was sitting on Edge's back. And now I said... Before I said at least they were being serious, now I was, I'm was i losing patience. And then Christian throws... He's got two folding chairs, right? Two metal folding chairs. He throws one chair out of the ring and ignores the other one completely and goes over and asks Nick for a small metal rod off of a chair. Because remember, 
Edge has done the thing where he puts the cross face on the guy with the fucking metal rod from the chair in his mouth in the other company and blah, blah, blah. And of course, when Christian did that, it gave Edge time to get up and knock Christian on his ass. So you've got a goddamn chair. You've got two chairs. You throw one away and you ignore the other one to take time to go over and ask a guy for a fucking metal rod about as big around as your index finger, about 18 inches long. The fuck? And then they wore each other out with the kendo stick and put the cross face on and put the rod in the mouth. And then Edge pulled out a ladder. I'm trying to get to the point here because, uh, yeah, they boomeranged Christian into the ladder. I wrote, are they almost done? Christian went up the top of the ladder, but Edge climbed up the other side, and then Christian gave Edge a sunset flip powerbomb off the top of the ladder to count. And then Christian threw the ladder out to the floor and pulled out two tables and I said, fuck it, this is unbearable. I'm fast-forwarding to the finish. Six more minutes after he pulled out two tables. Apparently, Christian and Nick Plain set a table at ringside and set it on fire and tried to throw Edge on it, but Edge made a comeback and then set the, either another table at ringside or that was the same one, but he had to go down and spray the lighter fluid back on it again to relight it. And then he powerbombed Nick off the apron, allegedly through the flaming table, but in trying not to put him down right on the flames, he goddamn threw him over the table and the back of Nick's head hit the fucking concrete. And he turned the table over. And it was a complete... Outlaw Mud Show at this point. Just a fucking parody. A complete farce of anything to do with a wrestling show. And then Edge hit his finish on Christian 1-2-3. And won the title. But then the dinosaur, Dino Douche, came out and knocked Edge on his ass. And then Christian made Dino give... Christian, the title of shot contract that Dino had won doing whatever the fuck he did. And then Christian covered Edge, one, two, three, and won the belt back three minutes later or less. And this took a long fucking time, too. Did you like any of this better than I did? This was so bad. And I've not been a fan of Edge's comeback, to be fair, but this was really bad. And. I thought to myself, at least they gave everyone that moment because there was a massive pop when he won and he got the belt. All right, at least they get that. And then they immediately, <laughs> immediately <laughs> negate all of that with something again. Even their own fans are like, why do this now? The overbooking even here in this overbooked match. So no, I didn't like it. Thought it was counterproductive. It doesn't make people want to see more of Adam Copeland. It makes people want to see less of Adam Copeland when he gets, when he has a match like this and you get a good moment and then you take it immediately away. That doesn't have a good effect on people. So really bad. Really bad. This show is the worst AEW pay-per-view by far. If it could, Tony can't stop. He can't control himself. He's like Russo on meth. I thought the shit stain was bad. It, you can't stop this fucking guy. So anyway, then they had the tournament final for every miscellaneous belt that Tony likes featuring the plumber against Eddie Kingston. I've made my views clear on how Kingston could have been used, been successful, been, you know, it somehow featured despite his, some of his own worst tendencies or instincts or whatever. But I couldn't, I couldn't suffer through this with this show going this long. With the, and what was left for these two to do after you've had tables and chairs and fire and ladders and chaos and stars? You could have them stand in front of each other and take turns hitting each other with the other one's permission. It was horrible. And I like Eddie Kingston. Yeah. I'm starting to think I just really hate everything that makes Eddie Kingston want to wrestle the way he wrestles. This match wasn't good. This I match, had to, this I, match I had to see the, the, the Twitter spot they put out because somebody put the split screen between the, as it was described, the bitches slap fight that Moxley and Kingston had. 
side by side with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels trading punches with each other. And it was fucking embarrassing. It looked like two drunk women at a bachelorette party. And, and these are two guys who try to do a lot of shit that you can't work well to begin with if you're really good, and they're not. So it looks like shit, and it hurts. You can pop a guy's eardrum with one of those stupid slaps. It looks like fucking shit. It looks like ain't Lola. It's just so fake, and at the same time, reckless and unnecessary. Because it's that goddamn Japanese strong style bullshit that ain't going to ever but be over here to any degree. And it's done poorly. And it's done out of poorly. Context. Yeah, you can't compare it to even what they did in Japan in the 90s or anything. Well, no, because they, they I all love all that stuff. brain damage for real. I love all that stuff the same way Eddie Kingston does. They never just stopped the match and just started standing there and as <laughs> slow as they can laying shit in. It's just not good. And everyone's doing it. And it's not like the flying tackle or the hip tossing. And it shouldn't be a regular part of the wrestler's repertoire. This match wasn't good. This tournament was a waste of time. The creation of another championship, combining other championships for no good reason, was done for no good reason. Eddie got the pop in front of the hometown crowd. That's what this was all about. With a, with a, with a backhand slap. When Eddie used to come out on the mic from that first time he came out and tore into Cody and all the early stuff when I had him with Santana and Ortiz and Penta was his best friend or someone else was his best friend. That was that stuff was good and compelling even when it was bad. <laughs> but his work in the ring, he has to he likes wrestling a style that doesn't look good on him. It doesn't he doesn't pull it off well. Yeah. And I feel bad saying that because he clearly loves it as much as anyone loves any style of wrestling. Well, and also at this point, getting a dream job where you're making six figures a year after trying if, and toiling in relative obscurity for that period of time, and it's been, what, three, four years, three years now or whatever, he could have lost some weight. He could have lost some weight. You know, I just want to see him on the mic. Like I said, I wasn't even talking about his early matches. On the mic, he's money. People would want to hear him every week if he was involved in stuff. Instead, he pops up here and there, and you have to watch his matches. And I think anyone who gets into Eddie talking, if you watch one of these matches and it's 15 minutes of this, it's rough. You don't want to see it again. Well, speaking of not wanting to see anything again, we come to the main event. The, the match, the one match that you would want to see on this show. And after suffering through the rest of this thing, at this point, I just wanted to get it over with. And I wonder how many other people felt like that. Like, okay, let's see what the fuck. And it's a disservice to the guys in the match. But anyway, they did a number of disservices. Uh, it's for the AEW title. Samoa Joe against MJF. And they give Joe his entrance, and then they have to do the video on the screen, and it can't even be serious. I think MJF is maybe getting a little too cute. The local citizen's commentary on MJF, but the girl has to mention, oh, and yeah, then we fucked in the back seat of the... It, there was a lot of comedy in this, which was out of place, I would think for such a serious match with the champion going in injured and a big reveal of a long-running angle, at least being teased, and as we found out, going to happen, such as it was, if they just, can they just not? Can they just not? I don't know what to say. Do they have to diminish everything? Was that a question? Yes. What, would can they not? Yeah, can they just not? Can they just not make everything somehow funny or silly or call attention to their tongue and their cheek on the main event shit they get us to pay for? No, they The need devil to. is going to be revealed as trying to apparently murder MJF or abduct him to a deserted island somewhere. And it, Samoa Joe is so goddamn compelling as an evil, badass fucking kind of guy and but they gotta and then 
MJF, of course, you know, a great new outfit for the for the match. And the fans chant, he's our scumbag, which we've established. Apparently, the root meaning of that is a used condom. And then Adam Cole gets his music and entrance, and he comes out on crutches and in a cast, and he's going to be in the corner for MJF. And apparently, nobody's going to say anything bad about this, including Joe. Why does he? Uh, nevertheless. <clears throat> and MJF is in a shoulder and arm brace because he's hurt and fucked up. And I, you can't even critique this match. They did... Again, it was the closest thing to two professionals doing their thing without being ridiculous. They did big shit you'd remember, but not too much of it. MJF did all of his stuff that gets over with the crowd. I think there's a little bit too much kangaroo kick milking, especially when it doesn't work twice in a row, you know. But they're both good, great workers and great at putting matches together that make some sense and under this circumstance it did they kept it interesting and and they went a while and then so there's nothing to as i said too much kangaroo milking and kangaroo foiling i should have said uh because if it doesn't work a couple times in a row just take it out but basically, nothing to say about the match. It's all about what the fuck's going on with these people after the finish, which was Joe gets the sleeper, MJF shoves Joe into the buckle, and they squash the referee in the corner, and then MJF gives the laugh like he did it on purpose. And did you see what the fans did immediately when the referee went down, Brian? What's that? I learned this uh, in, in when I first got into business in the early 80s. When you are doing too many run-ins, whenever the referee goes down, if the fans immediately oh. stand up and look to the entrance way. That's what started killing the horseman matches in the late 80s. Yes. When they stand up and look to the entrance, you're doing too many run-ins. And that's exactly what they did. But now, of course... <laughs> They weren't even getting a run in until later, but it shows they're doing too many of them. And MJF nutshotted Joe on the ropes and hit the fireman's or got a fireman's carry and hit an F5 on Joe, and that got a a big pop. And then the cover and the referee had gone down and been squished. And it was such a bad count because he comes over like he's weak and feeble, recovering, and then does the most animated, violent. <laughs> sharp count one and then is feeble and can't move and then does the same thing too like he like he's being electric shocked into counting it <laughs> <laughs> did you see that I, I didn't think of it in that context but you're not lying you're saying yes in, instead of laying there and feebly go one two he's like oh i can't get there out of one oh i can't do it again out of two and then MJF asks Adam Cole, for, give me the dynamite diamond ring. And Cole can't find it. He starts looking in his this pocket and that pocket and his sling and whatever the fuck. And finally, he gives it to MJF, but Joe has grabbed the sleeper from behind. And MJF rolls backwards, but Joe gets it again. And MJF goes to sleep. And the referee drops his arm three times and calls for the bell so that's different um the lack of outraged reaction before a hometown crowd or the lack of reaction i know like they said the crowd went quiet when bruno lost the belt and now this uh, it wasn't the same thing right but that that this, was interesting this was too. that was i can't believe what i've seen my hero my countryman has been defeated instead i'm shocked instead this was well, I can't believe they did that like that. Now let's find out who that devil is. And the thing is, yes, with where we're going, it makes sense that Adam Cole couldn't find the ring, right? But they just... And we know MJF is going to take time off because he's hurt. And honestly, after this whole thing is about to unfold and already has unfolded here, maybe if he's off for about a year and they forget all about it, that might be the best thing. But Cole 
goes to console MJF, and then the devil's goons appear. And they tackle MJF, and one of them holds Cole, who's trying to fend off with the crutch, and the other three rough up MJF and hold him, and one of them's got a chair. And Cole and MJF are each saying, don't hit him, hit me. Don't hit him, hit me. And the chair guy turns to Adam Cole, and he draws back, and the lights go out. <laughs> And when the lights come back on, Adam Cole is sitting in the chair and the devil stooges are all lined up behind him and they all unmask and it's Roderick Strong, Matt Taven, Mike Bennett and Wardlow. And MJF is, how could you do this? Do you remember when we first started seeing the brochachos doing their videos at Denny's or Chili's or Spaghetti Factory or wherever they were dieting at that point. TGI Fridays. We said if Adam Cole turns on MJF, MJF is going to look like the biggest fucking moron walk on the planet because nobody could take any of this acting seriously. And then you throw in Strong and Taven and Bennett and none of this has been serious. None of it has been in any way something that the babyface world champion of the company, MJF, should ever fall for in a million years. And the Adam Cole shit with the... He needed surgery, but he had to mow the lawn, but we find out they're all in cahoot. How does any of this... And... And while I'm on the subject, they have spent... Months, the past three months at least, reinforcing that Roderick Strong, Matt Taven, and Mike Bennett are comedy characters, never win matches, can't do anything right, and act silly on camera. And now they're the henchmen of the top heel, the devil, who is crippled and can't wrestle for at least another six to nine months, probably. So it was all an act. If that's the if that's the explanation, it's even worse. They were acting like children for months and months and months to fool everyone so you wouldn't suspect them as the devil's associates. Then you would think that they were so stupid that they couldn't possibly pull anything off? Is that what the plan was? And Wardlow decided on his comeback the best thing was to be in another faction. Another group. Because they worked out so well for him in the past. It doesn't make any... It, what Again... Samoa Joe's the, the one that injured Roddy Strong's neck, isn't he? I think so. That's the reason he's in a neck brace, was Samoa Joe choked him out. And Samoa Joe is now on their side? Well, he was just working for him. Ah. He just took their money. He didn't want to get too much of it on him. So Adam Cole, the leader of the group, is crippled and can't wrestle. Three of the four members of his group have been painted as comedy underneath jobbers who never win matches. And they have just fucked the goddamn world champion and the only guy that, that the company had that was really kind of over still. And then they beat him up. And Wardlow powerbombed him, and they pulled out the devil mask and laid it on top of him. Thanks for coming, MJF. Please, I hope your next visit is to the Stamford train station. Unfortunately, I don't believe it will be. I think he's going to be there a little while longer. A few years longer. The best thing is that he's going to be <sighs> off TV for a while. Hopefully, like, I don't know about a year. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously. How long will it take people to forget about this? Hopefully a while. But I'm not an Adam Cole fan. And I don't buy him. And I could never buy him as a bad guy character ever in a million years. I don't care what he did on that show. No, remember in, in the undisputed era, they were heels in NXT and it worked in the group. And in, we've done a lot since then, haven't we? We've done a lot since then. I'll never be able to see him as a serious heel in any way. And he now has a faction made up of guys who have been <laughs> treated like comedy jobbers mm. and Wardlow, who is, Maybe the biggest example of AEW booking malfeasance from a homegrown talent ever in that company. A few times, actually. 
This upset their fans. I shouldn't say upset. This disappointed their fans at the end of a disappointing pay-per-view. To a lot of us, it was just, <laughs> this doesn't make me want to see anything. And if MJF's, if MJF's off, who are they feuding with? Who is this faction? Is this faction? <laughs> now they're just going to go pick on someone else this week? If MJF's injured and he's going to need them surgery, it's just not good. AEW is really not good right now. We'll play the media scrum audio shortly. Tony thinks it's great, but this hey, shit's why, not why good. Don't, uh, why don't uh, they, uh, they suspend Adam Cole and all of the goons, so they're suspended as long as MJF is out, so they don't have to feud with anybody else. And I don't want to see MJF versus Adam Cole. Honestly, Adam Cole is smaller than like a teenager. <laughs> Any wrestler should just be able to crush him. It's like a Riho situation. So I don't know. I, I'm, I left this pay-per-view event just thinking, wow, this is the most underwhelming pay-per-view from AEW ever. There have been pay-per-views where I've enjoyed matches, and then there were some shit show matches that I at least watched and was like, oh, man, I can't wait to talk to Jim about this shit. <laughs> this wasn't that. This was plotting. And I will say, to be honest, and it's, again, the arena I used to always go to as a kid, it is a tough room. Usually it's a family audience in that building for WWE. That was a, one of the problems for Crockett Promotions. That's one of the problems today. But they sat there and watched this like, like a New York City crowd watching a band. <laughs> Just stood there and watched it. And the booking is so uninspiring and so bad. and. Who do you come out of this wanting to see more of? Swerve, I guess, because he has an unresolved thing with Keith Lee, who we may never see again, and he beat up Dustin Rhodes for no good reason. Jericho, I definitely want to see Jericho. I'm dying to see the crowd reactions to Jericho. Yeah, yeah, everywhere. he's got to go on a tour across the country with this. How is he going to try to turn this so that he could use it? That's the way he thinks. How can I make this where, you know, I could trademark, boo me, you know, whatever the fuck. <laughs> But there's not a lot. Blackpool Combat Club, dead. Eddie Kingston, I don't want to watch another Eddie Kingston match for a while. Danielson, I'm sick of Danielson. They've got me sick of Danielson. MJF appears to be off. I like Samoa Joe. I don't know who he's going to wrestle. How is that? Who is he going to Swerve. defend the title against? I, you know what? Swerve's the top babyface. Who are baby we supposed face. to? Oh, God. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll cheer for Swerve. Swerve's the top babyface. I think he said he didn't win that tournament. Give him Joe. As long as he keeps committing attempted murder and aggravated mayhem, apparently Swerve will be a popular man. The best AEW matches, I think, probably in 2023 on TV were those FTR tag matches. FTR nowhere to be seen on this fucking pay-per-view. I forgot about where the fuck are you? <laughs> you forgot about him. The Elite, nowhere to be seen on the last pay-per-view of the year. You know, a lot of people are talking about the changing face of the company and how people are leaving. It's also just less exciting. I don't know. I, you know, the idea that it's all being booked for one man, it's truer today than ever before. Well, Brian, you know what all of those smart fans and website reporters did immediately after this show was over with, don't you? Immediately? No, I do not know. Immediately. They got on their telephones to get on the social media and the Twitter and the internets and all of those things and tell everybody that wasn't there what had happened and try to give them the scoops. And to do that, you know what they had to have, don't you? What they had to have to give the scoops? A uh, scooper? Yeah. A scooper? No, not a pooper scooper. But a cell phone and a cell phone plan. A wireless plan. You know, because, Brian, these cell phones, apparently, from what I understand, some people have these things. Now, a lot of people have them now. They're taking the country by storm. Maybe even, I don't know, half the people in the country now have a cell phone and a wireless plan. Did you realize this? Have you seen this on the news? They've been talking about it. It probably is a lot more than half the country. Everyone has a cell phone nowadays. Everyone uses a cell phone. It's how we're, most people get rid of their home phones. They don't even have those. They only what? have cell phones. Oh, come on. Got to be out of your mind. Uh a landline will never go out of fashion. Well, but you can folks, do both. If, you can do both. If you're one of these people that needs the wireless cell phone and you're wondering why your wireless bill is so damn expensive, last month you were worrying, why is the rent so damn high? And now you're saying, why is my wireless bill so damn expensive? 
Because after all, it's radio waves. How much can a radio wave really cost? And especially when, when the wind is blowing that way anyway, it ought to be cheaper. So what? what are you talking are, about? Well, I'm telling you, it's going to help it along. The wind's blowing what way? You don't know what way the, the wind's way, going to the blow. The way that the wireless wave, radio wave is going. But what if you're living the other direction? Well, then they may have to add a surcharge. We're going to establish this here in a moment. But some of these big companies, they're just charging you whatever they want to fucking charge you, and you're paying for it because you got to talk and you got to do the text messaging like the kids do, and you got to send the pictures of your genitalia and genitalia no. to your significant other. No, it's a good idea not to do that. It may leak. Well, hey, you can go to the doctor and get a shot for that. But once again, folks, if you don't want to pay one of these big, high wireless bills and you want to pay a low, low wireless bill, you go to our new friends that we've just met. And of course, we've checked them out thoroughly and they're Absolutely fine people that use their left and right turn indicators. Their names are Mint Mobile. And it's going to save you a Mint because they phone plans from Mint Mobile, 15 bucks a month if you get a three-month plan. And that's unlimited for the talking and the texting and the data, whatever that may be. And I guess that means you can send multiple pictures of your genitalia, or if it's large, you can... Send like a widescreen shot. Well, stop it. There's no widescreen. The you're... magnitude of it for the same price. It Again, ain't gonna, it ain't, no matter how big your phallus is, it ain't going to cost you any more for this phone plan. I'm not sure why your mind went in this direction. Well, some people may be worried about that. Please. They may be saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not having to go to Hawaii to hang 10. I can just stand here and smile. I'm afraid they're going to charge me more for my telephone. That's not going to happen with Mint Mobile. No, it's not going to happen whether it is the phone calls you answer or make or the text messages that are not graphic and lewd that you send or receive. Mint Mobile will be there. And like you said, for three months, a yes. fine, fine, nice price to try it out and get in the It door. doesn't matter. If, folks, if you've got a big Johnson, step right up. It doesn't matter. They're not going to charge you a penny more. When you step up, to the to the urinal in the men's bathroom. What? And you and you tell the guy next to you, you say, "Boy, this water is cold." And he says, "Yeah, and it's deep too." They're not going to charge you any more money, folks, because you can say bye-bye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, unexpected overages. See right there, the unexpected overage. You take a look at it. I didn't expect it to be that big. None of this is in the copy. All the plans come with unlimited talk and text. You can talk unlimitedly. You and and somebody will <laughs> be forced to listen to you no matter no, how no, long no. you've grown on. No, there's no guarantee that someone will answer the phone if you make a phone call. There is no guarantee of that. Well, they've no, they've got somebody on the Mint Mobile staff. If you have unlimited talk, you can talk to them and they have to listen until you're done. That is not true. No one should expect that, ladies and gentlemen. If you try this great plan from Mint Mobile, our new friends at Mint Mobile, there will be no one waiting for your phone call after the uh, initial deal you make, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> see, you don't know what you're talking about, Brian. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. You just you get this adapter. It's a large box-like thing that you stick on the back of your phone. What? And it adapts your phone to Mint Mobile. And you can bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. All your existing contacts. So everybody you know that you've ever been in contact with that's currently alive, you need to bring them along to testify no. that you're okay to get this service. The digital contacts. And bring your own phone. You got to have your own phone. They're not going to give you a goddamn phone, for fuck's sake. The digital contacts that would be in your own phone, as you put it, for God's sake. Is that like the people in the walls? No, it's the contacts. Let me find Jim's phone number. Let me look under J or well, C. In, in, in it what could be con under J. It could be under C. In what context are you talking about these contacts? Anyway, you folks, you can ditch the overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's limited time deal and get the premium wireless service. You're not, you're not going to have to plug anything in anywhere, apparently, for just $15 a month when you sign up for the three months. And right now, to get it, you just got to go to Mint Mobile, once again, like you're saving a mint, mintmobile.com slash jce mintmobile.com slash jce and you can cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month of course you can still leave your penis the same exact size as it is now 
Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. Not on your penis, on the phone plan. See Mint Mobile for details. Mintmobile.com slash JCE. 15 bucks a month. If you had to stand down at the corner pay phone and put in a quarter at a time, why, let's see, uh, four calls would be a dollar. You get, you, if you make more than 60 phone calls a month, you're saving money. All right. Well, we would like to welcome Mint Mobile to the show. Thank you for, uh, thank you for stopping by. I for coming aboard. Back. We look forward to many more, uh, talking twos about Mint Mobile. <laughs> <Talking> <laughs> I have a feeling Hazel's going to get a talking to when they hear oh, this show. That reminds me of my favorite line from when we went to that show in Louisville when Frank Morell was uh, trying to get the loser has to kiss the winner's foot <laughs> stipulation. Of he goes, I'm not happy with this foot and kiss. <laughs> All righty, then. It's your show. All right. It is my show. I thought it was your show. From the moment we started you this. keep having that mistaken apprehension. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's... Uh, Hold on, I'm going to do this. This is a big announcement. Which one of these? I guess it would be this. No. Nope. Oh. That's not it. I don't know which ones you use. Let me go to the other one. This, and it doesn't stop. Then it just keeps going. Oh, for heaven's sake. Now your poor workman blames his tools. Tap Tom, Tilly Tool. What the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Hold on, hold on. This is listed as twaddle. Tap Tom, Tilly Tool. <laughs> Fiddle faddle. <laughs> All right. Fumble sticks and bumber shoots. All right. Let's put this down, but we are now going to move yeah, on. Yeah, put it down, Brad. Whatever you've been picking up, put it down. Yeah, you don't have to make everything about the penis here today, but speaking I, of... I, no, I, there was no <laughs> allusion to, to coxmanship in that at all. I said, whatever you've been picking up, put it down. It could have been the illicit substances you've been imbibing in over the holidays. Well, speaking of the cock of the walk, Jim, nah. no one will ever accuse Tony Khan of being modest when it comes to his wrestling IQ and certainly his methods of seeking out information or crowd approval or whatever it may be. So before we even get to the AEW Worlds and Media Scrum, and there's a lot there to talk about, I have some audio here Jace Nakarado pulled. This is from the media call before the event, a few days before the event, Tony answering a question about his booking strategy for 2024. Let's go to this. Feel free to tell me to stop at any point. I'm, I'm, I probably will fairly quickly. It's a great question. I mean, we have a great group of people right now in my office. Uh, just as an example, uh, yesterday you had a great group with, uh, Brian Danielson, Mike Mansuri, uh, Will Washington, Jimmy Jacobs, Sanjay Dutt, Sarah Stock, uh, and Dean Malenko, and uh, several others uh, that were in my office throughout the day at various points. And Brian had his, his match, and people were in and out. Uh, I think everybody had great points, and there were a number of other people. Uh, but I did come in with a lot of it, and I think we've been on uh, an incredible run of shows. And this is a great, uh, this wasn't quite the setup I was looking for, so I'll see if I still get it. Uh, but i very excited to talk about the science of the booking. And I think in particular, uh, <laughs> it recently. You, the science of the, the booking. The science of the booking. Oh, my God. He listed a, a variety of people there who have th their own individual talents and I'm not saying anything bad about many or most of them, possibly all of them. I can't remember the whole goddamn list, but you can't have, you can't just find, you know, 15 people at a gym that all know how to work out in some various way and say, okay, let's all work together and write a fucking mystery novel. It, it, it out of all the people he just named, I have a feeling Sanjay Dutt might be the most reasonable. You know, as a matter of fact, probably, and one of the more experienced. Yeah, for real. Well, let's go back to Tony. Let's go back to Tony. We've had some of our best shows we've ever done. And this year, if you look at 2023, and, you know, just to use as uh, samples, you know, you can look at uh, fan feedback from different shows. One site that measures fan feedback is Cage Match. 
Look at the top 100 shows this year and look at how many of them are from AEW. And if you throw uh, <sighs> this version of ROH in there, too, you get some <sighs> some more. But uh, it's pretty incredible. And the top 100 shows that have over 50 votes, top 100 shows even more so that have over 100 votes. Over 100? And look at how many of them happened in 2023 from AEW or uh, even a couple more from ROH. And uh, that speaks pretty highly, I thought. But... Uh, Let's stop it there for a moment. <sighs> Cage match. We've joked about it, but here he is citing it as one of the places he goes to for validation. Well, you know how you can get the fan feedback. How many people bought a fucking ticket? What were the ratings this week? How many pay-per-views did we sell? That's the fan feedback. What he's looking for is fan compliments. And that's two different things. And he, he, he said, well, such and such had over 100 votes. Motherfucker, you've got a national television program with supposedly supposed to have over a million viewers, but it doesn't. But you're trying to sell tickets in buildings that hold tens of thousands of people. And you're trying to sell hundreds of thousands of pay-per-views, but you're looking for feedback from 50 to 100 people on cagematch.fucking.com and how they rate the matches. And that it determined, no. A collection of the ratings that other fans made. What do, who gives a shit? Pointed, did, did Siskel and Ebert rate fucking whatever blockbuster movie four thumbs up or four or five snaps up or whatever. It didn't have any correlation to how much money the movie made. You, and you can't again, take a subset. That's why he's doing this. Cause he's deluded himself into thinking that all the fans think like he did when he was in his basement doing this on the internet. And, and the ones that read Cage Match because he never had normal fucking friends. They just went to the goddamn wrestling matches. And that's, it's, it, say it's, it's just so minute. He's looking for, for compliments from fans rather than feedback because he gets the feedback in terms of the sales and the viewership. And the feedback from fans that he gets that he doesn't like, he says is bad faith. But let's go back to the, Science of the booking. Uh, much more so, I would talk TV ratings. And I'm really excited about the lift and collision ratings we've seen as the competition has continued to increase. We've seen historically that nothing takes a toll on wrestling ratings more so than the most powerful media empire in the world that is the National Football League. Uh, the NFL, <laughs> I, I speak from experience and from within the beast, that it is the most powerful and most efficient and best run media operation in the world and uh, don't point out how good other people do their <laughs> shit when you he fucking have to suck spend it. that much time putting the nfl over does he well in recent weeks has taken the top dozen spots or more on cable on saturday just the nfl and uh yet the collision ratings have continued to increase and I do think there is a science behind this methodology, and I do think <laughs> they've been what? probably the strongest set of shows we've ever done consecutively. And No, those were the first few shows you did with Punk and FTR. Those were the strongest shows you did consecutively. Well, he's talking about getting the numbers back up to four and 500,000. They started at 800. I, uh, so I, I think there's a great team, but also I personally have never felt more invigorated and on top of the booking. There's a great group oh! of people oh! on Saturdays and Wednesdays, and that was a good sample of people uh, that were there. And I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting uh, a couple people. And then there's people that weren't there that, you know, might be there on a Saturday. Um, but there was a lot of people throughout the day uh, that would come in and, and contribute an idea. Um, and uh, certainly. And then sit in the back of the room and make sure that nothing bad happened to that idea between showtime. I know, and that sounds like the biggest haphazard mess I've ever heard of. People just coming in and pitching ideas the day of the fucking show. How did the booking committee work? Did the booking committee work just like that? Good God, no. Whether it was the booking committee in WCW or Vince's creative team or whatever. No, this stuff... You didn't just have the guys coming in day of show giving random ideas. It was written 
well in advance in those days. I know Vince has the habit of tearing stuff up or had the habit. Vince McMahon didn't tear stuff up that day for shit the the talent wanted to do. It was for shit he wanted to do. He overruled his own writers. But it, it, but no, you don't just have guys wandered in and out and great minds pitching ideas. Good, then I'll have one of the writing teams sit down with you, Mr. Talent, next week, and you can give him all your ideas, and we'll put them in a pipeline. That's No, it doesn't work that way. They may think it does because they're not used to doing this. You know, this is still a relatively new thing, the idea of bookers doing shoot interviews or talking about what they're doing. How many of them just come out and say, you know, I think I'm doing a great job. I think I'm booking the best I ever have. It, well, it's, it, it is a relatively new thing, but I don't know that anybody ever said that in public before, and most time you wouldn't say it in private unless it was dusty and it was true. Uh, I, I felt com coming in really prepared in recent weeks. You know, something I've really enjoyed has been the Connell Classic. And <laughs> again, you didn't give me the perfect setup to talk about this stuff. Uh, so I, uh, I might come back to it, but, uh, I've been conducting some pretty experimental booking and <laughs> I, really enjoyed it. I gotta stop it. I can't take this anymore. So far he has just said some just crazy things. Experimental booking. That's now what he's doing. The science of it. And I can break down the science of it going into world's end and why I think there's a lot to learn from it. And, uh, I think uh, I might as well now that I've popped the can off that I'll just keep talking. So uh, <laughs> I think it's really interesting because uh, when you do an experiment, there's an experimental group and a control group. And for me, the control was everything we've been doing. And I took basically the things I've been doing and tried to keep them consistent. And uh, then began doing the experiment that was a continental classic. And uh, the nature of it is a very sports-based presentation, and it, <sighs> it has some changes from... Uh, wait, 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 wait. The, the sports-based presentation is why Moxley's match spent half the time out in the fucking cheap seats, right? That's where they contest most sporting events, in the fucking stands. Go ahead, I'm sorry. For example, which in this case I would say the scoring system of three points for a win versus two makes it uh, a very different incentive to go for the wins. And also <laughs> I think the biggest difference possibly is nobody allowed at ringside and no outside interference. And that's probably a misconception from people who don't actually watch the G1 uh, because uh, there has been outside interference. And I think that was something we did to, to make it different. And wait, what did he just say? I, I don't, apparently they have interference in the G1, but they don't in his version of the G1 or whatever that we've already established that then in that case, they've just killed any run in ever in any other of their matches because they've established they can just forbid it and you can't do it. So they're allowing any run ins that happen from this point forward. I believe we are about five minutes into the question about the booking strategy for 2024. Dad, I, I don't know what the fuck he's saying. He's talking about his experimental booking and, of course, the science of the booking. <sighs> he was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. A little bit more of this before we get to the brilliant performance that was the world's end media scrum. More from Tony Khan. Then, when I look at the tournament itself and executing it, it's the most fun I've ever had working on something. I love working on the Continental Classic, and I think I'm, it's been so tremendous and such a highlight of the holidays. For me, it really put a smile on my face on Christmas. Wait, let me ask back. a question here. How do you work on the – it's a fucking tournament. That's the easiest thing to book in wrestling because <laughs> you just goddamn write the fucking names down and decide who's going to win. But who did the finishes? Because all the finishes sucked. That was that should have been some work that he did. Who the the idea of the talent that was picked that was his fault. Good God, how did he have fun working on this shit? It was the greatest thing I've ever done. Eh. So tremendous and such a highlight of the holidays for me. It really put a smile on my face on Christmas. 
going back and watching some of it with my family and I think uh, <laughs> being able to watch the very best of AEW and show them what we're doing. On Christmas, Stop he it. made his on oh. Christmas he made his family sit down and watch some of these tournament matches. All right, what does Tony want to do now? Guys, I got to show you the best of my Continental Classic tournament. <laughs> you think does it's- he have a girlfriend? <laughs> I believe he does. I've heard that, or at least in the past he has. I'm assuming he still does. I mean, why would she leave a Well, I mean, what guy family like is he discussing? Was he there with Shad? Like, here's how I'm spending your money, Dad? Or who was the family that he was... He doesn't have children. Did they present highlight reels of all their work at Christmas time to the other members of the family? <laughs> yeah, Shad's like, hey, here's my new bumper. <laughs> Fooled you, it's the what? same old bumper. No, watch the crash test dummy here on this one. We pull it, pull it in at 50 miles an hour, and boom. Well, it's let's uh, finish this up. Right. It's been a highlight. Please, let's finish it. I believe the exact term was so tremendous and a highlight of the holidays to go back and watch with my family. Let's go back to Tony and his booking, the science of his booking, the science of booking in general. I don't know what the hell is happening. And... For the Continental Classic final this weekend, I think Eddie Kingston and John Moxley, there's so much story between the two men. And I thought the face-to-face segment at the end of the Brian Danielson-Eddie Kingston match, which many people felt was the culmination of the entire tournament so far, the best match yet, it was tremendous. So when you do an experiment, you have an experimental group and a control group. If the control is what we've been doing and and the things that have been on AEW and what we're doing, the experiment was – increasing uh, the allocation of this very meat and potatoes, sports-based, (laughs) old-school pro wrestling at its finest, in my opinion, Continental Classic. And the experiment, I think, has been very He thinks that's old-school sports-based wrestling. He thinks he sounds smart here and it has yielded really interesting results. And one thing I would point to in particular is that ratings increase on Collision because Collision probably leaned into being a bit more sports-based presentation to begin with. And now with the additional Continental Classic content, I think what we've been able to do and what I focused on with the booking of Collision that I think has probably been the best set of shows we've ever had and has really yielded positive uh tangible results on paper that I can show now with the ratings increases in the recent weeks, despite the competition getting much harder because there is unlike other. Again, he was asked a question and now he's just again, going into a big defense. I'm, I'm going to cut everything. my throat. If, if, if this isn't All over right. soon, we're going to end uh, this in a second. One last Could we thing. just cut him off right here. Well, one last thing, Jace recommended we hear what he had to say about Riho. Let me go oh, to the uh, timestamp here. Here's uh, Tony Khan on Riho. Fuck you, Jace. Once again, Tony Khan on Riho. Jace, a very nice man. She really, when you look back uh, at AEW now and what I'm talking about, you know, somebody who has had some of the best matches and certainly to get the best pro wrestling uh, week to week, I think somebody that can go out there and from the very first Dynamite, not only have great matches, but we've also seen somebody that delivers ratings is Rio. Who's he talking about so now? I think this Rio? is a fascinating matchup, in particular with, you know, of course, by design, Rio got taken out by Ruby, Soraya, and Tony and has come back for revenge, and she's gotten revenge on Ruby and Soraya. And I joke to all the women, I think this really reminds me of uh, Kill Bill because <laughs> it's like they all put this woman down and she's come back for revenge, and this group... They don't even like each other, the individual people anymore. <laughs> like, you know, Tony's not even friends with them anymore. And they're fighting with each other. And, uh, and like, yet um, they all have that in common that, you know, Rio is coming for all of them. Uh, he, and, wait, he, he uh, says think, Rio has great matches. And it's like and he's talking ratings. about a different person. And who, what is he seeing? Who is telling him this? Is he... Is nobody capable, even the the stars, the veterans, not able to give him an honest opinion? No, Tony. She's an amateur indie girl from Japan. She's never going to get over. It just looks embarrassing. You've been sold a bill of goods. Move on. Can nobody be honest with him? 
Well, is he going to hear that from Brian Danielson or Jimmy Jacobs or Michael Mansuri <sighs> or Sanjay Dutt or who else was in that room? Sarah Stock? <sighs> the booking minds that make up the uh, science of the AEW booking. But let's uh, cut this one there, Jim. Let's now go to the AEW World's End Media Scrum. I'm assuming beforehand, because I'm going to be playing you audio, you've seen some visuals. Yes. Of... And I, I will I will say for the benefit of those of you who have not seen it, go to Google and just look up Tony Khan Media Scrum World's End. It was on Twitter. There's video. There's freeze frames. There's still pictures. Some way or another, it's this... I don't know what to call him. This poor child, Tony Khan, who's in over his head and melting in front of our very eyes, somehow managed to be wearing the most ridiculous outfit that I've ever seen when he was asked about the sexual harassment allegations against Chris Jericho. He was where people said he looked like the guy, the fucking Humpty Dance guy. He was wearing a Humpty fur, Hump. Humpty Hump. He was wearing Digital a fur hat yeah. and sunglasses. Was he a Cossack? Somebody said he looked like Phil Spector in court. It, it, I thought he looked like Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics because he had the big glasses on too. So he just had the big furry hat. Yes, but but before he went before he went gray. Um, but what in the world? He looked ridiculous and people, even people that like him were on Twitter going, when you got asked these questions, you couldn't take that ridiculous get up off and look like a, an executive, a company owner, a promoter, anything. It, this is, he's, he has no self-awareness. That's part of the problem. And, and, and also he's got way too much to do and he ain't get enough sleep. And I think the inevitable that we've been talking about for a while is ever closer. Well, he says he's reinvigorated and he says that he's doing the best shows he's ever done or booking the best shows he's ever done, or they're on the best run of all time. Not exactly sure what he's saying, but let's go to some media scrum audio. I may go back afterwards and play you some of the Tony Storm stuff so you could hear that show. Well, I I may be listening from... Far, far away by that point. But when Tony Storm was out there, she gave him the hat. He put the sunglasses on. For the remainder of her portion of the scrum, that was his getup. The next person was Julia Hart. He remained in this outfit. She didn't say, like, what are you doing or anything. <laughs> Probably that would have been the biggest breaking kayfabe moment ever. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> but it was during the Julia Hart portion of the scrum where the first question came in about the Chris Jericho series of events or whatever's happening, whatever we want to call it. And it was from Kevin McElvaney at Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Let's go to this. Uh, Kevin McElvaney, Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Julia, congratulations. Great match tonight. Thank you. Uh, I know a lot of people were happy to see three women's matches tonight, including the Zero Hour. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. This is actually a question for Tony. Um, there's a lot of conversation, especially the last couple of days, about the issue of safety and harassment, specifically involving women wrestlers. Um, you know, without getting too much into the details, or some people may not want their names mentioned, um, <laughs> but there have been a lot of wait, conversations. Wait, wait, wait. Stop, and there are, there's real concern. Stop, stop. A journalist is asking the boss of the company question without getting into any details. And I know some people who are guilty as all get out might not want you to mention their name, but can you just... Give me a non-answer. Isn't that the way that was set up already? I think it's more because of the potential... You, you don't want to say a victim's name if they don't want it out there versus the idea of mentioning Chris Jericho Well, but you don't have to come at... Can you shed any light on the allegations that are currently uh, floating around involving any members of your roster? I give Kevin credit for asking the question. I think he did a pretty good job. But part of the problem with these scrums, and you'll hit the Wrestling Observer guy, sounded like he's about to wet his pants. Oh, well, that's probably because he's only 18 months old. I mean, when did he hear it? But again, he asked the question, and then he has to almost give the beginning of a defense. Kevin here asked the question, but you don't want to just come out and say, did you pay off Kylie Ray and give her an NDA to leave because of something Chris Jericho? Because that's what everyone was talking about. But let's go well, back to Well, what was Tony's answer here, then? Concern from wrestlers, from uh, fans, from media alike, you know, about the safety of wrestlers behind the scenes. So, like, what has been done specifically to combat, 
to prevent issues like sexual harassment in the AEW locker room, both you know in the past and going forward, because this is something that should always be looked at. I think it's very important. It's a great question, Kevin, and I think it applies to everybody in the whole company, women and men, and it's something we're very serious about, and we've had a policy in place, and certainly I think any time there's anything like that, we would uh, make sure we do everything we can to prevent it. AEW has the best safety record, I believe, of any pro wrestling company in the world. I believe we have the most safe environment. I believe we have the best safety record of any pro wrestling company, and I would hold the record of AEW on safety against any wrestling company in the world. And I think we, AEW is the safest place for pro wrestling. And if any of our wrestlers ever have a concern, they always have an Wait, open but press line. Press pause. Press pause. Since he made that statement eight times in a row, they're the safest wrestling promotion. How? Again, okay, let's take let's take the in ring out of it because it ain't ballet. Shit can happen. People can get hurt. And they have been regularly. They're this they've got a disabled list and they have had since they've started longer than any other company I could think of. We've seen brain damage and surgeries and ligaments and et cetera, et cetera. Let's take that out of it. Are we talking about backstage fights where no one, no one ever gets beat up or hit with a chair or bitten or goozled or face locked? Nothing like that has happened. Or are we talking about NDAs, which apparently, as we mentioned, Tony is in love with them NDAs. He doesn't want a lot of people to talk about his companies. I've never seen so many NDAs. The, out of Vince didn't have those many that many NDAs. He was in business for 40 years. As we know, has already been signed by Tony Khan and his various rogue employees. So at what part of that is the safest company in the goddamn world? Well, you're forgetting a big one, too. And let me also bring up the idea of having executives have sex with talent is another thing that should be talked about. But how about the fact that Tony went on his own show a few months ago and said he was scared for his he life? Was in fear of his life at a wrestling show. At his show. At, at his, his show. show the the safest place on earth. He said, I've been going to wrestling since I was a kid and I never before have been in fear for my life until he went to his own fucking show. The safest place on earth, AEW. The most magical. Well, the AEW safety record he's uh, defending. Let's go back to this. To talk to me, and I, you know, I believe anybody would sit here and tell you they always can talk to me anytime they are concerned about anything. Well, certainly, if there was anything uh, that you know came to light to me, I would take it to the disciplinary committee, and uh, <laughs> you know, that's how we've been doing it. And I think we, our disciplinary committee, has been doing a great job. And everybody knows they have an open line to me. Pause again. Pause again. The girl comes to him. Says, Tony, so and so tried to pull my clothes off and and have his way with me in the locker room. Oh shit! I better go talk to the disciplinary committee. What? No, you better go find the fucking guys. Hey, what the fuck are you doing? You fucking moron. I'm sorry. I'm getting testy with this. No, no, let's go back to this. And again, this is just the first time that the Chris Jericho question came up. Me or anybody on that committee. Right. Well, there was the end of that uh, question. <laughs> right there, the answer to it. Jim. The disciplinary committee. The disciplinary with, committee, which we were told. With brass knuckles. Is Brian Danielson. AEW's in-house attorney, Chris Peck, and an outside attorney who I have not been told that it isn't a con family attorney that just doesn't work directly for AEW. We don't know. That is where Tony Khan would go if someone said something happened. But here's the thing. That committee didn't exist in 2018 or 19 when this whole thing happened to begin with. Allegedly. That is correct. And also, Tony did not say... That's preposterous. None of this is true. <laughs> Leave Chris alone. This is so unfair. Nothing. Nothing to help his talent here. So take that, I guess, however you want. You know, Mama Cornette used to say when somebody would, would uh, protest too much, right? Me thinks thou doth protest too much. In this case, me thinks Tony ain't protesting at all. Well, let's go to the next question to Tony. Later on, when he's by himself, after he took off the big hat... And his hair was just a complete mess. It almost looked like he had a black eye. People say because he had a big curl of black hair around his eye. 
This whole thing was a mess. He'd been looking at Veronica Lake. That's Tony Storm's next program. Well, let's go to the next question about Chris Jericho. This is uh, a little less than an hour after that previous question. Hey, Tony Fostrom from USA Today Sports Media Group. Um, a lot of chatter today on social media regarding Chris Jericho. Is Chris Jericho or was Chris Jericho at any time under any internal investigation for sexual misconduct, any other type of misconduct over the course of his uh, tenure in AEW? Just... I can't, I can't speak to internet and unsourced rumors. I think I spoke earlier to Kevin and mentioned the policy we have in place and the disciplinary process. We've always followed that. And I believe AEW is the safest wrestling company in the world. And we have the best track record for safety. And I would hold it up to anybody and anytime anybody. What does that mean? I'll hold it up it, to anyone. But what does it mean, the best track record for safety? We're not saying that the, the, the young lady turned him down so he beat her about the head and face. <laughs> safety has nothing to do with it. It was, the question was, has Chris Jericho ever been talked to about any of this or not? And if it was negative, the answer, then it seems like Tony could say a lot of this internet rumoring i'm not going to comment on but no chris jericho has never been disciplined or talked to or complained about you could say that fairly easily well he didn't let's go back to his answer has any kind of complaint they have an open door again to, to say it to me or to uh, anyone in the office and we would uh, look into it anytime so i again just kevin earlier asked about that policy and i think i you know gave a pretty they're going to look into it. The people who did the investigation on the all-out brawl and didn't <laughs> interview Lucy. They're going to well, be the people to look that, into it. Besides that, that's the story that's out there, that she went to Tony Khan and he fucking looked into it. And that's the way, result was that she got uh, her release and signed an NDA. That's the story. So he's confirming the first part of the story, that if it was anything happened like that, he'd look into it robust answer on that and it would apply here too and that was his answer the second time asked about these chris jericho rumors he's asked a third time let me go to this timestamp here this guy is the guy i mentioned here earlier jimmy sounded like he was afraid he was going to be kicked out of the room or he was just a little worried let's go to possibly this urinating on himself at the time Corey Lee with the Wrestling Observer. Uh, I just want to get a couple questions about the uh, gate and attendance. You did mention it was a sellout. Do you have an official attendance, an official gate uh, for the sh for the uh, the event? Well, it was a, the gate was uh, I, I don't have the exact number on the gate, but it was a it was a big gate. Uh, it was a sellout. <laughs> and that, I, it was huge. It was just just under ten thousand, close to ten. Just just around close. I don't have the figure. It was a big gate. It was a big, big. one. <laughs> Just plain large. Close to 10,000. I think over just around 10,000, close okay. within your shot. Over 9,500 or closer to 10,000. Yeah. And then the second question I have um, again, there's uh, bringing this up again, but it's just again, with there's a lot of stuff going on the internet right now. And it's there are a lot of questions about a lot of you know different people and there are there are questions obviously chris jericho was brought up earlier in in the uh, thing again from uh, from as a general manager standpoint in this in this in this situation can you confirm or deny that there's been an investigation with him or has there ever been any accusations or anything like that in regards to 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 chris's behavior and like i said these are these are all basically internet and again <laughs> there are people in this who are have an agenda per se <laughs> in you know but again these questions do need to be asked and obviously like i said as you know respectfully as i want to be in this situation it's just to what the fuck kind of question is that <sighs> how do you even describe that it's like i'm apologizing for having to ask this question that you refuse to answer and say, Are you now or have you ever been a member of the sexual harassment policy? Kind of just bring it up and just and just ask as, as best as we can, you know, because, again, there also was another um, situation. Former talent of AW did post something that has been perceived as a confirmation of these of these allegations. So well, I can't speak to that. I would just say what I had mentioned to Kevin earlier that, yeah. you know, we have a disciplinary policy here. We have a disciplinary committee that if 
things are referred to and that I, everybody in AEW, anybody who's ever wrestled in AEW has an open line to talk to me or this group and uh, always has. And uh, that's how we've always acted. And that's why I believe AEW has the safest environment and AEW is the safest place in pro wrestling. And it's why AEW has definitely the best safety record in wrestling. And I believe we maintain that. Thank you. <sighs> well, there's the end of uh Hey, you know what? Here's the thing. Tony Khan should not be the spokesperson for his company, not only because they need a respected veteran wrestler or somebody like a Nick Aldis, Adam Pierce, somebody that can lay the law down, make matches as a television personality figure, but also that's where you need a Vince McMahon or a Dana White or a Bill Watts, or somebody, if the boss is going to be doing public speaking, then he's got to be able to bullshit his way out of shit with a, and sound like he means something positive rather than just meandering and, you know, fucking just throwing out words until he's done and people are confused. <sighs> well, Jim, before we move on from the Jericho stuff, did Tony do anything here to help the situation? No. He sounds mealy-mouthed. And it, 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 those same people that are in that room would then think the first thing I thought. Well, there was no disciplinary committee four or five years ago when this was supposed to take place. And the story was that she did go to you. And that's the, the root of the story. And he could have easily, if it was true, and he and he would not be bitten in the ass by it later, he could have said, no, there's no NDA signed by anyone over Chris Jericho or no, Chris Jericho's never been disciplined or investigated or complained about. If that was true, one would think that he would said that. Chris Jericho usually, or sometimes appears at these scrums. Obviously he was not there for this one, but they better figure out how they're going to take care of this and trying to get Tony to memorize phrases or things that he would like <laughs> to say is not going to help anyone. <sighs> the wrestling news is Brian Solomon was at the media scrum. Here's a question from him. Of course, you can hear the wrestling news each and every day for free. Get your wrestling news directly from thewrestlingnews.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Look for Arcadia Vanguard's The Wrestling News. Here's Brian Solomon. Brian Solomon, The Wrestling News. I uh, had a question that it was a follow-up, actually, to something that you talked about during the media call earlier this week relating to the booking duties in the company. You mentioned that recently you've been getting some help, some guidance from other people like Brian Danielson, Sanjay Dutt, getting kind of... Uh, I, I want to know if, if going forward you see the booking as being more of like a committee-type situation or a group. And if you ever see yourself at any point stepping back from it entirely? It's a great question. I mean, it's the same process it's always been. There's been different people in the room throughout the prop. But I think I've always come in with a, an outline of ideas and I'll talk through and talk ideas with the people in the room. And it's some people that weren't here at the beginning, like Brian Danielson's a great example that wasn't here at the beginning of AEW, but, uh, you know, would have fit in the whole time. And as a mind, I would have gladly uh, discussed wrestling ideas with at any time. So, uh, Really, for the last several years, I think it's been a pretty consistent process. It's just the people that I'm, you know, talking to. QT would have been somebody that, you know, if he was still here every week, would be in the room with us. Uh, and I'll come in with an outline of ideas week to week and talk through things. We have a great group of people. So I, I think it's been really strong. And certainly right now, the company this week, you'd say, is on one of the hottest runs in terms of business we've been on. So to come in with uh, the shows really looking across the board, really strong business pay-per-view TV and a sellout crowd tonight, feeling really good about what we're doing. So I think going into 2024, things have been on a really good run. You know? Again, the question, <laughs> what will the booking team be in the future? And can you ever foresee a day that you would step away from it completely? You know, the Continental Classic in particular was something I felt really strongly about and wanted to put together what I felt like was the best sports-based product to give AEW fans and wrestling fans all over the world something to really look forward to through the holiday season. And I think the Continental Classic worked. And when you look at the ratings of the shows and the way things have delivered, I think it was really an added element on top of everything we've been doing that really put us over the top now to have this run where you across the board, the TV ratings for Collision, for Dynamite, 
the pay-per-view buy rate for tonight, dynamite the sellout crowd everything says we're pointing in a good direction having a- aren't the dynamite ratings atrocious right now <sighs> i'm just again is he gonna answer this question i don't think so we'll give it another 30 seconds let's see if he gets to the answer within 30 seconds a great champion like samoa joe when you've been having all these great hard-hitting matches on tv every week and setting the tone you know, he was not somebody that was in the Continental Classic. Obviously, he's been chasing the world title. But now we have a very interesting scene. You have those dozen competitors that we've been highlighting week to week. Uh, you have certainly Samoa Joe now coming into focus as the world champion. Eddie Kingston coming out uh, with the Continental Crown. I think we have a really strong set of champions there. And, of course, being up here with Tony Storm and Julia Hart, I think both of them have been running really hot. It was great to have, I thought, three strong matches across the women's division tonight, and we're only getting started there. I think things have been really heating up there. We had injuries at one point. You know, it's great to get Thunder at Rosa one point, back. And what it was the great fuck to see does her. this have to do with the booking committee, and will he ever step back? Again, the question, <laughs> tell us about the booking committee going forward, and can you foresee yourself stepping back? Here are the ways he's going to help the women. San Antonio, for, like I said, for a show that did a great rating and performed very well. But also, uh, you know, we've been missing Thunder Rosa, a former world champion, missing Dr. Britt Baker, missing Jamie Hayter. And I think it's so much credit. Because of injuries, Mr. Safety. Right? Isn't, aren't they all injured? Yes, yes, everybody's hurt. All right, well, we've had enough of this question. Let me get one or two more. And can, can, I, say, can I say one thing real quick? If one of three things is happening. Either Tony's coming in with more than an outline. He's laying this thing out the way that we're, we see what the TV show looks like. So either he's doing most of everything or those people coming into the room are telling him what he wants to hear and agreeing with a lot of it for the sake of it. Or all those people that he mentioned are very fucking smart either. I don't know which one applies because I'm not in the room, but one of those three applies. Go ahead. Or all of the above. Jim, the question I played you earlier from, I believe it was USA Today, Phil Strum, asking about Chris Jericho. Strum at the scrum? Strum was at the scrum and he asked about any sexual misconduct or any other misconduct during his tenure in AEW. One of the issues with these scrums is who's getting in there and who's asking questions. I like to think Brian Solomon asked a thoughtful question. He got like a 30-minute answer, so I think that may be... Well, I know he got a 30-minute monologue. He didn't get an answer. Kevin McElvaney from Pro Wrestling Illustrated, he asked a question. The guy from The Observer, we could joke about how nervous he sounded and trying to almost set up the question for an answer. He at least asked a question. Here's the follow-up question. Right after Phil Strum from, the, from USA Today asked about Chris Jericho, and Tony Khan didn't answer it. Here was the next question. Hey, Tony. Oh, hey. You hey. Hold his hand up. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got the microphone, though. Hey. Hey, Tony. Big hello. Uh, Rich Batman Podcast. Um, you, AW, have been responsible for tremendous moments in professional wrestling for the past five years, right? Now, apart from the business and the numbers, personally, I want to know, how does that 14-year-old Tony Khan feel on the inside like right now so good oh. so good <laughs> now again let me stop it we can get to this ridiculous question and answer here this is the follow-up that someone in that room thought was a good time to ask after the chris <laughs> jericho question and i guarantee you of all the long answers tony Khan has given i bet you he can go on at length on this one he was smiling from the moment the question started coming in he looks so happy to be thinking about or even answering this question and not talking about Chris Jericho and any misconduct in AEW. Uh, it's pretty great. It's a great question. It's a great way to end the year and the sellout crowd and the numbers. I mean, it's, you know, it feels really good. It's really important for the locker room to see that what we're doing is working. And like for all the women. Well, stop. He's not saying you're, you're doing too many things. He's not saying great. These are preemptive dingings. I'm just, I'm just trying to build up some credit. W, I think everybody could rally around and see, like, when Collision did that number, and that was a great show, and Collision's been on a great run of shows, and then for that crew to come together in San Antonio and post that number over the holidays, beat the NBA, finish in the top 10, like, up against all the football, after the week before, going up against NFL, when every 
metric in wrestling history. We have decades of history that says when wrestling goes up against the NFL, that the wrestling rating will go down. And this time the wrestling rating went up and it spoke to the quality of the show and how excited people were about those matches, the continental classic, what the women are doing and everyone across the show, the tag team division, just some great things. And there've been a great group of people throughout the year. Also, a great group of champions. See, I told I you I'd that, need credit. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, for me, uh, week to week have just been absolutely delivering. And, you know, we have uh, some champions that, you know, we're not up here in the scrum. I think that have done a great job champions. You know, he could have uh, even done a better job of answering about his own 14 year old fucking self sitting in the basement, pussy list, jacking off to well, fucking e feds. Let's see if he mentions uh, if he was in the basement. Mentions not having pussy? Like Ricky Starks, Big Bill have been excellent. Christian Cage is somebody who's maintained a high standard. Uh, and then I believe, you know, in addition to the great champions, uh, some people that have held championships, you know, MJF, uh, what a huge part of AEW MJF has been. Uh, what a huge part of AEW FTR are week to week. And there's so many great examples of this. So, like, when we posted the collision rating... That Why weren't FTR on the pay-per-view then? They're a big part of everything week to week. I don't know. I'm doing a little house cleaning over here. Let me know when he's done. All right. Hold that on. That so good. And oh, wow. I didn't know I can go double speed on this. Hold on. Oh, well, you can go double speed? Good. It may sound better that way. Then to follow that up and see the dynamite rating and see Biggest since Grand Slam, the New Year's Smash was truly a smash hit, and get the accolades from the network and know what that means for the whole crew, the wrestlers and the staff and everybody who works here and everybody can rally around that for the future, all the women and men in the company, the wrestlers. When are you going to start the double And that's the part I never imagined. Because like when you're like writing dynamites when you're like 12, 13 years old in the back of the classroom. Hold on. He's in the back of the classroom. I think this is where we stop. Let's go here to the back of the classroom where he's writing dynamite. Never imagined. Because like when you're like writing dynamites when you're like 12, 13 years old in the back of the classroom and this is your like lifelong dream, the part you don't account for good and bad and the part nobody really accounts for good and bad when they're like thinking about it, but the part that's the most different from like imagining what it would be like to do it <laughs> versus actually doing it, it's the real people, good and bad. It's not easy sometimes. Some Stop. Oh my the thing God. that no one anticipates when they're fantasy booking is that things may not go the way you want when you deal with human beings. With real actual people. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let him. Let's see where he's going. Maybe he's going somewhere. He's in the back of the class. He needs to get, get there pretty quick. Sometimes it's the easiest thing in the world. You have like Tony Storm come up and like, you know, uh, one of the greatest people of all time. And like, you know, you and, you know, there's moments like that. And Tony Storm gives you your hat and sunglasses. OK, that's pretty easy. That's fun. Right. That's a good that's a fun day at the office. There's days that always aren't the most fun day at the office. But it what I love about it is the people the fans because i i'm a wrestling fan and like i said the last time i was up here with you i know that doing it 365 days a year it's like hard to be a wrestling fan it is it's hard to maintain that 365 days a year and one of the things i was really proud of no, with the continental isn't. classic is that i felt like there were people right, i'm not going to listen to him defend the continental classic yeah anymore. yeah I, I can't do it anymore. one one last question this one i'm not going to play too much of this but timeless tony storm came out and she had a question about her future competition. Let's go to this. Hi, Kate from Fightful, and my New Year's resolution is to watch for the shoe. Um, As you should. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Congratulations on retaining your championship today. Um, we've seen a lot of really great competitors in AEW, and the free agency market is heating up with some notable names from a lot of different promotions that are available. Is there any challengers? either in AEW that you have lined up next or anybody you would like to see from the free agent market come in and challenge. <sighs> okay. Here we go. Tony, Anthony, I don't care how much you're going to yell at me for this after, but yes, there is quite the free agent out there. Isn't there? There's money written all over it. Wendy Richter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> well, there's her answer, Jim, about the okay. competition that Tony Storm would like to face. Uh, you know, and, well, you got to feel bad for the talent. The, the Mark owner of the company has them sitting there at 2 o'clock in the morning talking to fake journalists after they've had a 12-hour day trying to do a pay-per-view. So I probably would say some very off-brand things myself. 
Well, that was what we're going to play from the Tony Khan Media Scrum, and that was the end of this show, and this is my show, and I say we're not even going to do credits. We're going to end on Tony Khan because everything's just great. What do you feel about that? All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hit the wrong note. There we go. We'll be back on the Jim Cornette Experience before you know it. But until then, go through the archives, YouTube, and of course, the drive-thru will be back next week. For Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!